I'll be honest, you know, myself and most of the people on Discord watching that uh, that that show for that Duffy hosted, we're just to let you know, we're feeling that way. Yeah, I've no, been listening to a lot of streams too. What were you saying, Lise? Sorry, the, the big mic was just like doing it, the app stripping out. No, nah, and I feel that fundamental. And like, listen, I got a lot of that slack. Also, I said this in this room and I remember I shared it with y'all gang. I was like, damn, the most humbling thing just happened to me, gang. The conspiracy theorist became a conspiracy. I was a NASA op. I was a right. mini cat. I was Jewish. I was, I was like, yo, I'm Latina. I'm just a regular person with a corporate America job. I, I don't have, I don't monetize off of this. I don't, I don't grift off of this. None of it. I'm just a regular day-to-day -day person that's just like everybody else just trying to find the truth. And the thing is, it's like she was because she won she was like front and center and stuff like that but the gang was there the whole time like when she when we saw that she won and all of those gut reaction those knee-jerk reactions people were having we were there in real time to see all those things when people were leaving comments on those videos that were getting posted we were reading all of those comments like we were there the whole time so you say right. that like we we saw it happen in real time too, which was actually funny from our perspective too, because it's like I'm oh, sure it was here for two years, like you know, like so yeah. yeah. But I mean, and also from y'all's perspective, we were like, okay, like they just don't know, you know, so that kind of thing. Yeah, we. But I if mean, Lace was, I all. gave I gave grace honestly because at the same time it's a it's kind of a check for us free thinkers, like dang. What else? Uh -huh. Who else are we calling an agent out here? <laughs> Who's just really real just person, a regular right? person? Yeah. Well, when you when you realize that everything you've been told is a lie, uh, that can lead to some excess exactly. paranoia, and and uh, it's well, tough I, to keep that I in balance. Like I, you know, I understand you guys thought, but yeah, she's real. Ooh. Yeah, uh, yeah. And at least you came to skeptical. find out. Yeah, you know, skepticism is definitely healthy. For sure. To a degree. Sure. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Keep it in check, of course. All right, Liliana, thanks. Come back. We'll Later, Lily. And, and Madam Lace, Ambassador. If you were acting. <laughs> Go ahead, Lou. Go ahead, Lou. Wait, wait, guys, I also think Alan's in the house. Alan, what's up? Is that you? Yo, what's up? Yes, sir. Or ma'am. <laughs> yes. Uh, <ayo. laughs> welcome, welcome. Yo, yo, yo. Big space out. How's it going, man? Going good. How are you? Good, brother. Good to see you over here, man. Yeah, I got really lucky last night and was able to get an Android emulator to let me log into this app and also TikTok. So now I can conveniently uh, do this on the computer instead of on the phone, which I was dreading doing. Clubhouse, Clubhouse is an Android exclusive? No, but the way that I wanted to use it would you know i'd have to because i'm on linux so i don't have the the windows app or anything uh, okay what do I, what i mean do you have a phone you just don't want to use it yeah but like using a phone is full ds so i'm not trying to do that ah, gotcha yeah. yeah this app is definitely uh when they de de developers they do it was iphone first so yeah they when even when they do iphone i mean uh updates it's all yeah, iphone first joy later I, I respect someone respecting their privacy. It's important. Yeah, absolutely. You got the emulator going. That's what's up. Welcome, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Dude, I heard you guys tear it up over here. Shane's been telling me stories. Sacred's been telling me stories. You guys pop into Flat Earth Fridays every now and then. I've been wanting to come through and check it out. A bunch of new friends. Isn't that a great thing? Okay, seriously, how do I do the emojis? I'm on a phone. I don't see a button for it. So you hold down your profile picture and then it'll pop up um, oh. different emojis. There we go. There you yeah, go. So you got so it. You'll look to the bottom. Yeah. So anybody from Discord, just hold down your PTR and then look down and you see a bunch of emojis that you can use. But then that on the right means you can add a picture, which will ch permanently change your PTR until you change it again. And then the left side is the so you can see at the very bottom, it says visual, which are emojis and GIFs. But if you click to the right, you can also do a ping if you're agreeing with somebody that or you can go yeah, yeah. Eh, for when a Glober come in, comes in here and says something ridiculous or add any kind of sounds <laughs> that you want to do. And yeah, that's 
much how it works. Thank you. Gotta you. Be, you gotta like press and hold, long press on on uh, off mute to get the sounds to play. Man. Oh, yeah, you can so you can soundboard PTR. someone. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah we yeah, go yeah. crazy in here. You, you just know. gotta go off mute and then long press your uh, profile picture and switch over to the sounds and yeah. But um, yeah, just so you know, PTR uh, it just means pull to refresh. We're just talking about your profile picture because you know it's it's not an asynchronistic app. You gotta pull to refresh. Yes. So if you change your PTR, your if you change your main photo, which we're calling a PTR, in the middle of a conversation, you would have to pull the entire screen down until you'll see the screen refresh, and then you'll get people's ah. new main photos. So PTR, so, got, got you, got you. So like PTR, and you'll see people have changed their photos. If you don't, it'll appear to you as if the photo never changed, but then... You know, just archaic yeah, stuff. Updates. Yeah, and I had to say that just because when I first got on this app, people were talking about PTR, PTR. What the? F- what is that, yo? And then what is you it? find out it just means pull to refresh. Okay. All right. Yeah, dude. Each, uh, by the uh, way, we have one app. of our resident Globers on stage. His name is Coffee. He is by far the chillest Glober we have. So he always gets the green bean in this room. Yeah, so he's chill. Cold, we nice. inducted him. Crazy. Cold. I'll have to put that to the test. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Go ahead and test for sure. So was that Young Coffee from Flat Earth Fridays? Yeah, bro. What's going on, Alan? Oh, what's good? Chilling. Just woke oh, up a little bit ago. Yeah. OG is, oh OG's not present. He's usually here. And Jamal, he was in the room with y'all with y'all last night too. He's not here either. Linnell, he's taking a week off. So it's it's a few uh, heavy hitters. I'm gonna keep it buck who stepped away. But yeah. Did did Alan G just show up? Yo, what's up, Lily? Uh huh. Oh, hey, um, I know I do have to go. <laughs> I just had a hard time. I, I had a hard time leaving. Uh, but can you guys hear me OK? Yep. You sound great. Oh, yeah. Like extremely, you. extremely well. Can you hear me OK? Extremely well. Oh, OK. Yep. Thank you so much. I feel, oh, good. Um, I feel like I've given G a really good introduction, the one that he deserves. He's one of our five teachers in our community. He's absolutely brilliant. He has this amazing rare combination of a very sharp mind, very witty, extremely knowledgeable and educated in physics. He can debate really well. He can stand on his, think on his feet. He is extremely funny, humorous. He has us laughing all the time, but he's also, he's very patient, but he also takes no BS. And he's one of my teachers, the five teachers that we have in our community. I just felt like you guys should know that he's a real treasure. Uh, These five teachers, they are like, um, they're literally like the future Einsteins of the flat earth, you know, world, which is the real earth. So just wanted to let you guys know, please treat him with a ton of respect. He's not just another flat earther. (laughs) That's all. (laughs) What's your first person? Lily, I appreciate the praise, but I'm literally retarded and I'm wrong all the time. So please take everything she said with a grain of salt. I just read a lot of PDFs and then oh. argue with people online. So, oh, Alan, gotcha. She was talking about you. Gotcha. Y- yeah, and the other yeah, people. Yeah, Alan, you're in, you're in good company. I can honestly say, <laughs> I, won't, I won't run down the list and the attributes, but yeah, you're in. We're all in good company. I see. But hey, Alan, Alan, he, uh, Alan's really humble, but. Trust me, he's brilliant. Hey, Alan, the relativity of simultaneity, <laughs> like the, uh, the I can science that and McToon, that response that you did, man. Oh, Jesus, dude. Yeah, that was crazy. I don't know crazy. if anyone else has seen that. Fuck, man, that is just so blatant. <clears throat> dude, I, I couldn't believe he did that, man. And I gave him, you know, a full week basically to – understand my argument and then when i was watching the video because i didn't even really watch it the first pass through because i just like i saw what his beginning presentation was and it was the midpoint argument so i skipped to, towards where he was getting to the to the balance beam and i didn't even catch what he did when he uh when he cut it out so that reaction that i had was like you know me noticing it in real time where he cut it out i was like oh my god you're actually sick in the head dude why, why would you do that unless you were a coward you couldn't let yeah. anyone hear the yeah. actual argument because it's absurd. 
Relativity is retarded. I've just dropped the link in the chat if anyone wants to watch it later. But yeah, you'll see some hardcore lying and gaslighting. It's just, I couldn't believe it. Dude, as a teacher, I'm looking to see if the student understands. Like, bro, bro, you cut out my understanding to act like I didn't understand it. You're psychotic. Anyway, I'm not sure if anyone knows what we're talking about here, but definitely check it out. It's, uh, I don't think I've come across anything quite like that. Not, I mean, McToon's stuff is something else, but yeah, that was just unbelievably baseless. Like, the, like you said, they just cut out all of your response and your understanding of the matter. That was wild. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they played the editing link. games. I'm definitely gonna watch that. I'm definitely gonna watch it. Yeah, they straight cut out the main point of my argument and why I changed the argument from the train to a balance beam. Which, when when you watch it, you'll it'll make sense what I'm talking about. But it was to remove uh, ambiguity of the situation where you, where they could claim that uh, that it's about the time it takes for the signal to travel to the middle, you know, and all that. And it's like that's not the issue. The issue is. There has to be different physical outcomes because the sequence of events, if they're valid in both frames, will lead to different outcomes. Like that's the whole point of relativity of simultaneity. It's not. It's not to say that it's. Re it's not to say that. Um, it so th that the effect would be like an apparent effect, right? It has to be a physical effect because why else would you? Why else would you make it a principle? If you if it's an apparent effect, it says nothing new about physics, and there's no reason to even even mention it or like make it a, a principle, right? It's a principle because it's supported by the other two postulates and it's a consequence of those postulates that there's going to be different physical outcomes depending on the reference frame because the sequence of events is valid for that frame. And that's really all there is to it. And they're, they're, they, uh, you know, obviously that's, that's contradictory to reality. So what relativists will do is they'll come up with a way to, give symmetry to both simultaneous or to the simultaneous event in both frames, which you can't do. You can, it only, it has to be in one and not the other, which means the other one has to have a different physical outcome. Yeah. Like going back to that video, was it Shane that did the initial video with the train? Uh, yeah, he did make one. Yep. Yeah. Okay. It, like, because I'm so, it's hard to grasp where you guys are at. I mean, that's why I come in here too, because it's, I'm, I too am a baby flat earther. I've been around for like two years or something. But <laughs> um, yeah, just listening to you guys, it's great, but it can be overwhelming. And I, that is a lot simpler than what my head makes it out to be, you know, like I'm still kind of fishing around for something more complicated, but it is very simple. Yeah, it, these guys got to make a starter kit for you. I think that'd yeah. be, I think that'd be a good idea. A little one hour, like one hundred and one introduction class. Little intro to relativity theory. I was actually it, planning on these, doing that. These are some of the words that are kind of hyper specific that you might not have heard before, but you know are perfectly understandable with a simple explanation, but might throw you off, you know, because of how knew they are to your ears you know stuff like that and these are the main principles at play that people take different opposite sides on and you know that'd be awesome it would be great really helpful i mean for me it was flat earth dave and witsit that's where i started like two years ago and it was crazy man like just sitting there and looking up all these words while witsit was speaking just took me months to get my head around some of just the basic terminology. I feel that way all the time, man. I feel, I feel it. That's why I named myself fundamental because I got real sick and tired of uh, feeling like I'm constantly thrown into the deep end of things. As, and I was just like, wait, hold on. Let me just, let me just establish. Cause I, I went through this process of just like building uh, like in, information upon already established information as far as like my opinion goes and it was fork in the road of course sometimes where now you know two branches are coming off the same trunk but uh i went through a long period of just like okay well, like let's let's build this up from the from the bottom 
to see how far I can get without making like uh, assumptions or whatever. And uh, a, a you know a sort of a tool like that being provided by someone can take take you far and give you a solid foundation. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd definitely pay for that too. You know, I'm sure a lot of people would. It was kind of like, you know, the big, the Rick Beato pack. I don't know if you know of Rick Beato. But he's the music he, guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. He does like a basic music pack, you know. Um, but like I've given that to a lot of my students. They find that really useful. But yeah, something like that would be awesome, Al. Your students? You're a music teacher? On it. Oh, man, I work with people with disabilities and mental health. And like, I do a couple of different things, man. But like jack of all trades, master of none. Absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. I teach music. I, I can play everything badly. Let's just put it that way. That's the best. <laughs> yeah, we got a resident uh, musician. You, you know what they say, uh, Lou? They said that great players make bad teachers and bad players make great, great uh, teachers. Have you heard that? Hmm. I have heard that. Yeah, uh -huh. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> yeah, well, so, well there's, there's exceptions, I guess. Well, hey, thanks, guys. I'm going to drop back to listening, and I really appreciate it, run. And, yeah, hey, Lisbeth, what I, was, what I was trying to say before, like, if you were acting, man, like, I watched that live because, you know, my friends made me, they were like, you've got to enter in the final experiment, you know. And I watched that live, and but your genuinity actually is what brought me to this group. And, you know, like that can't be made up. And it was just, there's, if you were an actor or a plant man, you fucking win. You're like you outdo all of the greatest performances in history. I mean, it, like if anyone goes back and they watch that, you know, where, you know, Lisa's talking actor. a little. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. Like that's just amazing acting skills, mind blowing. But, um, yeah, I just wanted to say that. And that's like a true testament to this group. I think like Lisbeth, just your genuinity and everyone, like I am so thankful for everybody in here and welcoming me. And uh, yeah, thanks guys. Really, really grateful. Hey. Yeah, but you've been nice a, you. you're, you're a good person too, Lou. Uh, love your energy as well. It's pretty cool. Thanks guys. Cheers. Yeah, Have a great day, everyone. Thanks. Cheers, mate. Catch you later. Yeah, after after hearing you speak yesterday, Elizabeth, um, I'm really glad that you got selected to go because I was when I initially saw the announcement, you know, that uh, the golden ticket winner, or whatever happened, I watched like two seconds of the video and I was like, okay, don't care. Like this, I was, I was like, this, I was like, I only care about Whitson and Jaron, you know, because like, like I just assumed you weren't gonna like know anything about anything, and you were just breaking everything down. You're like, yo, I got cameras, solar alpha filters, I got a guy from NASA helping me. I've been studying the sun. I'm on it. I was really impressed with uh, with your approach to it, and I'm glad that you're going to be joining the trip, man. Someone, someone told me it's not happening because the donator was a hoax. Did I hear wrong? All right, just to do the story again for like the 10th, 20th time, but just so that we're all- I'm sorry. No, oh my gosh, I didn't mean it like that, sorry. I'm Latina, sometimes I just say shit and it sounds like an attitude, I promise. It's just like my natural fiery inside of me. But anyways, so what happened was, is right, it was a goal, a wealthy benefactor, right? So obviously the day that the live went on and I'm in tears and I came here with gang, we even have it on the replays because y'all can always listen to replays. That was September, Wednesday, September 18th. Like we were all genuinely excited because I didn't know if I was going to win. And, um, my story, you know, my story was true. Just like Will said that he picked me because I have a friend that works at NASA and listen to what you were saying earlier, fundamental. I understand why that would make truth seekers be like, what? You We've never heard of her. She's got a NASA friend, but yeah, but I don't know him personally in real life. We, I know him through this space and people here have known him longer again, through this space, through clubhouse. He's obviously a, a Glover, but he's an optical engineer that works at gotcha. NASA Goddard center. Right. So he was the one because of John, PhD physicist John that was in here earlier. He's the one that was making the claim about the the sun cannot change more, blah, 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 angular size. So I just said, you know what? I don't care. I have a camera. I can get a solar filter. I'll do it. I don't have a dog in this fight. I can't manipulate images. Let me just what I just have to point aim and to keep the same focal length. So I said, I'll take the pictures. So that's how this collaboration came. And Bert was nice enough to extend, you know, his um, expertise and says, Liz, I can show you how to use your camera properly. I can show you how to properly, you know, um, uh, what's it called? Extract the data, et cetera, et cetera. So essentially 
um, he was the one that pushed me. He's the one. Like, we were joking for months, uh, me, him, and Kelsey. Uh -huh. Kelsey's on stage about, oh, wouldn't it be funny if you ended up going to Antarctica? And I think Jamal, I think y'all remember, Jamal was saying, um, yo, Liz has been playing around with going to Antarctica for a while. I, I, it would be funny if she actually did it. So when the golden ticket opportunity came, Bert immediately was like, Liz, you have to enter. So of course I entered, I gave him my why, you know, I don't monetize. I don't, I'm not famous, you know, like I really just want to go. I would love to have an objective right. point of view, et cetera, et cetera. So when it got down to the finalists and obviously I was picked, y'all saw my genuine reaction. I was, I was over the moon about it. And <laughs> then a day and a half later, I, you know, the video came out that, oh, a flat earther actually scammed me and, you know, they, they, they aren't actually the real wealthy benefactor. Well, that okay. so-called flat earther came into our room that Thursday. So the day after mm. the golden ticket announcement, before I knew that it was a scam, he posed as a glober in this room. His name is armpit slash new moon. And he, it was actually a part of Jaron's VIP space for the last several months. And you know that he also did debate um, MC tune about a year ago or something as a flat earther. So I don't know if this dude's a flat earther or a troll, but he's a troll for sure because Jaron provided all of the receipts like no Liz, this guy, for sure, poses as a flat earther. He's been a flat earther, but he did tell me that he trolled your room as a globe earther. And, you know, he did, he is the one that scammed you. So, of course, I told Will Duffy this information. Okay. He kind of just wanted to ignore it. Like, he kind of just wants to keep the narrative of, like, no, but it was a flat earther that scammed you because, you know, he did battle MC Tune, et cetera, et cetera. But then, obviously, a week later, it was like, oh, this guy named John Bolton actually paid for your ticket. I don't know who John Bolton is, but that's how I, I ended up now officially going. Oh, oh, wonderful. I didn't know it uh, resolved that way. Fan, fan fucking fantastic. Wow. Uh, John Bolton fucking coming through. That's... Well, thanks for clearing that all up, man. That's that's good news. It's bad news and good news, but yeah. Absolutely. What Armpit did was that the GoFundMe money actually got is now, you know, he, uh, Will Duffy did, um, he gave me the money. Obviously, I had to pay for my flight from Punta Arenas down, you know, from Philadelphia to Punta Arenas and whatever. Now I can right. upgrade equipment. Now my evacuation insurance is covered under that, et cetera, et cetera, because there's no way I would have had the money. So what Armpit did in the end is he actually helped me out, but things turned out for the better. And I did just want to quickly intersect here because OG's in the house and he is actually the creator of this space. Yeah, salute OG, man. Welcome. It's an honor to meet you, sir. Or ma'am. OG. Nah, OG, OG Meatball is a sir, yeah. So I you know, I'm not gonna talk him up too much, but yeah, he's he's a, similar to um, Alan's intro. He's a humble dude. He's been on flat he's been on Clubhouse since the inception, right? And he's been definitely carrying the uh, the tours for Flat Earth and other conspiracies or whatever. He's a humble dude, he's real. King, King of Rashid. Yeah. He's King of Rashid. What up, what up? Yeah, I was listening uh, for a little while. My bad, my bad. I don't know if I got to read about something. But I, I was listening for a little oh, while. Know. I just came from a little after school. Uh, they had a little Hispanic festival at my daughter's school. I uh, just went up there for a little while. But while I was listening to you guys talk to John, bro, he's talking about seeing curvature from uh, 30,000 feet and a riot in the chat and all that. And then I had to leave out for a while. But uh, I was definitely booty time. clapping for uh, John the whole time. This dude. Oh, my God, bro. But, yeah, I, I heard the story. I listened to QE. Uh, Quantum Eraser, listen to his live with uh, our pit. Yeah, we even, uh, OG, we got into um, anti -relativist, relativist, right? And um, yeah, that, I know that's for a fact your bag, you and Jamal. No, yeah. It can't, uh, can't teach relativity without uh, lying, right? I think there's like a professor that said a quote like that or something. Can't teach relativity Absolutely. without deceiving the without deceiving the student. There you go. There it is. And then I actually Same came, as the atomic model. Yep. I actually came across a paper recently that was published in like I don't remember the year, but it was in like uh, the most co or like recent years. But anyway, the premise of it was that the students that graduate, you know, in in major in, in relativity, like they do the math, but they don't understand the principle of relativity of simultaneity. And they want to do things that hold on to the concept of absolute simultaneity. And, you know, they, they the whole paper was about coming up with like exercises to teach the student that it's, if you have the same physical outcome, then you're establishing absolute 
simultaneity, which means absolute time and space, which is antithetical to the theory. And it was just really fascinating to see that like these people, they'll go through the math of it, but not understand like the core philosophy and principle of it and what it actually means for reality. If you're a relativist, they're just like, well, I did the math, so it must be right. And just ignore the the outcome. And it's like, well, you did it wrong, but technically you calculated it right, but you're misapplying uh, the end result. So that was really It's like the concept really of a functional alcoholic. No such thing. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Yep. <laughs> yep. It's funny, like I'm an alcoholic and in Alcoholics Anonymous we say the what's the Einstein quote? It's repeating insanity is repeating the same thing and expecting a different result. Right. <laughs> I thought it's funny that we yeah, quote Einstein. How did Elizabeth how did Elizabeth go from the top of my screen to the bottom? It, is this like uh, in order of who joined first? Oh, just refresh. I had to swipe out because sometimes the app glitches, but like if you just, you know, pull down on, you know, like in the room, <laughs> it like refreshes it to like, yeah, it's supposed it to go in order to when people joined the room. Okay. Yeah. You're back at the top where you belong. I refresh the page. <laughs> you're back at the top where you belong. Period. I got a lot of learning to do about this app. But it seems it seems pretty cool. Yeah, you can do like six different things with this app, honestly. <laughs> like once you get them down, that's pretty much what happens. Mm -hmm. I can't believe I can't believe you got uh, your resident Glover here just enjoying the ambiance and listening in. Coffee man, you must be chill if you haven't just like spoken up in a fit of rage yet. Nah, a lot, a lot of these conversations I went through with a lot of these people. So, you know, I'm able to sit here and, and, you know, enjoy the vibe of everybody without, you know, feeling, you know, too offended about anything anyone says. Let's face it, man. You love Flat Earth. I do. I never said I didn't. Uh, I love this conversation. It's, <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's, it's a dope conversation. Everybody I loves love Flat Earth. You're lying. You're lying if you say you don't. Not you. Just anyone. Every everyone loves flat Earth. It just fucking reopens those eyes of the child that observe the world. It's so powerful. It's so fun. And what would our Globy residents do without us? There's literally a house on this app called Life and Real Science, and their full dedication. The owner of that space. His full dedication is to have a 5,000 part series where all of his titles every day since like, I don't know, how how long has it been, guys? Like over six months? It's like, nope, still not Flat Earth. Um, Blah, 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 blah. Like they're literally a dedicated anti-Flat Earth gang room. Because they love it. Nice, dude. We got ops over here. <laughs> it's great. Are they live oh, right yeah. now? Yeah, most likely. Remember when we found out that one of our resident they clovers are... worked for BlackRock? Remember when we found that out? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I actually went over to Life and Real Science and I told them to come over if they wanted to chat with all of us, but he didn't. He's in his Ooh, room with his two man. friends. Oh, you know Ten's not coming over here. He says that we're mean to him. We should he all go He literally doesn't it. come over here anymore. No, but he'll go in Solomon's temple. He was in there on some funny shit last week. He he was hilarious. Somebody was just like, oh, your mother probably gets fucked or something. You know, some troll that came in the morning. And, he goes, and, and then Ten was like, Ten didn't even skip a beat. I'm not going to do his accent because I can't do it like y'all do it. But like, he's just like, yes. And she probably liked it because women love sex. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> hey, Coffee, can, can I ask you a casual uh series of questions yeah hit me if you want to gauge him in the back and forth i don't mind because i like uh i don't like i'm not prepared to be posting links and so i wouldn't expect i don't engage in conversations like that unless someone just wants to be like hey i can provide a link but i'm not expecting you to because uh, i i just don't get i just don't take it that seriously ever you know what i mean but uh just on honor system that we both know what we're talking about 
to a degree. You know what I mean? So uh, before I before I was a flat earther, I was like a esoteric. Uh, I'm sorry. Before I was a flat earther, I was like an esoteric globe lover. And that might sound strange to you, but when you like pay close attention to like the numbers NASA provides when it comes to specifically like the, the, like the blueprint for lack of better words of the solar system, you get a lot of these reoccurring numbers and like the speeds or distances and proportions and ratios and stuff. And it, it all started out like I was, you know, how the whole Anunnaki phase of the internet, like probably hit a lot of us hard. We we're like expecting Nimbaru to come, you know, out of the clouds and the Anunnaki to like jump planets or something like that. You remember, you remember when Zachariah Sitchin propaganda hit us all hard? Hell yeah, I was reading those books. Yeah, well, there was a there was a channel called uh, Sacred Geometry Decoded, who was inspired to make videos because of a documentary he saw called Secrets in Plain Sight. And that also was a part of my origin story into these realms of discussion. But Sacred Geometry Coded, SGD, an Australian guy named Alan, he basically just took that documentary and all the things it focuses on and just ran with it and has made thousands of videos over like the past 10 years on, you know, basically esoteric uh, heliocentrism where, you know, all the numerology and gematria and, over analyst over anal, analysisms or whatever of, of that subject like are uh, you know just explored and i watched all of his videos for like five years straight and uh so he taught me a lot and i fully bought it and i and i was just thinking to myself wow how how are the astrophysicists not mentioning mentioning as alan would put it all these uh the symphony of coincidences numerically in the blueprint of the solar system. Do, have you ever heard anything like that? How like certain numbers and ratios just like repeat over and over again, which happen to be like the same ratios and numbers that you find in like ancient uh, uh, architecture and rituals and stuff like that. And as well as like Freemason, like modern architecture and their stuff too. Right. Gives a new meaning to grand architecture. Sure. Uh, yeah, I got I got two theories behind that. Right, my idea behind it is that one, we only have a limited number of digit variants, one through well zero through nine. So, so co new, the, a coincidence the, because there's only nine single digit numbers, right? Yeah, one, one, that one, and two, how our brains work. Our brains love to distinguish patterns out of nothing. Okay. We do uh -huh. that all the uh, all the time. So you know those things, uh, two things coupled together would have us uh, running down some extravagant theories. Uh, I think there's some leeway behind uh, sacred geometry, but I don't think it's enough evidence there to uh, fully back it. Okay, I I think that the, you know the numbers provided to us uh, are are just so blatantly like insulting to our intelligence that like the 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 like one coincidence okay two well that's special but that can occur but when it's like 17 it's like come on give me a break yo i always thought that was like what was so dope about what shane did right like in the whole optical uh, phenomena right about how we kind of like reverse engineered the globe kind of like set all of the uh numerology shit on the table right and it's like oh well why did you choose 666 it's like that's all they can focus on it just completely ignore the fact that it's in there and how like that three six and that number itself just repeats itself so many times and everything like involving space or the globe in general so uh, i definitely think that there's like that's not a coincidence it's my opinion that uh, the majority of like standardized units of measurement, so like to say the inch or the foot or the second or the meter or the mile, uh, I, I, I believe because I was uh, because I did learn a lot from uh, Al Australian Alan SGD's Sacred Jeremy's his channel. I like I said I, I I loved his videos 
And the only thing I disagree with him on now is just what is real. But he does, I do under, I, I did learn a lot about the solar system because he used NASA's proportions and numbers like that. So like I learned the, the numbers that, you know, are pushed on us to accept uh, as like, you know, the mainstream idea of uh, cosmology. And so I, I got a great education on what I'm uh, told to believe. But then I also got his breakdown of all of these uh, numerical, you know, synchronicities, which are just so overwhelming and consistent. And so when Flat Earth got introduced to me, like four years, me deep into that research, I, w I just thought to myself, oh, shit, what's more likely that all of these things are true and the solar system actually was the solar system actually does have all of these like a uh, symphony of coincidence going on, or this is just another like a uh, Freemasonic construct, not, not a physical building made out of brick and mortar, but an imaginary building made of planets and rotations and orbits, but still using the, their trademark numbers they worship. And it just hit me all of a sudden like, Oh, they left their fingerprints all over this. They they created this. I mean, maybe you haven't maybe you haven't looked into it uh, obsessively like I did, right? Um, because I understand the whole system is, is pretty intuitive uh, to a degree. Once once you can get over a few assumptions that haven't been proven, but you know give them gravity, give them big bang, you know, give, give them a few leeways and, and the rest, you know, can fall into place from there. Uh, but then in the way that it's described when you overanalyze, you know, the, the, the like, let's say the blueprint of the solar system, it's like, uh, like they let, they left their fingerprints all over it, dude. Do, do, would you like, uh, like one example? Yeah, hit me. So, um, it goes much deeper than this, but just as a checkpoint, you know, the like obviously the the sun and the moon appear the same size in the sky, right? That's all. That's already enough to be like, hmm, am I in a simulation or something? Because there's not there's not a single other planet in our solar system that has a moon that is the same uh, apparent size as the apparent sun, right? Earth, Earth is specifically unique in, in that phenomena. That it's even possible, right? That it's even possible because the distances the other planets are, because the, the inner ones are small, so they couldn't have a big enough moon to block out the sun. And then the other ones are far enough that they also couldn't have a big enough moon. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, they, their moons would be too big because the sun would appear too small for them. So like the, the match of the sun and the, or for a planet's moon and the sun that we all share, it's, it's only possible for earth to ever have achieved that sort of uh, coincidence. But, uh, but so they're the same size and that's already weird enough. Right. But then, you, you know, the whole, uh, you know, the whole like numerical coincidence revolving around the number 108 when it comes to the earth, moon, sun relationship. No, I never heard of it. So I know there's like perigee and apogee and, and whatever the sun equivalent is because of like elliptical orbits. But when we're dealing with what NASA calls like the average distance between the earth and the moon or the earth and the sun, it's, within a 99.99% correct to just summarize it as you can fit 108 suns between the earth and the sun. And then you can also fit on average, uh, you know, because of the uh, eccentricity of their orbits, it changes. But the average is you can fit 108 moons between the moon and the earth. And then for a third part, you can fit 108 Earths internally from side to side of the moon, or I'm sorry, the sun's diameter. And that is, uh, that's hilarious. 
that is honestly hilarious and uh and so easy to remember and if anything even if you don't think that's like uh suspicious or whatever you can still take that information away as an easy like memorization technique and that if you were ever challenged to like build a scale model of the earth moon and sun system off of memory you could do it perfectly just draw a sun of any size and then just draw a hundred and eight circles of that same size coming off of it that's where the earth will be located how how big should the earth be well just draw a line from side to side of the original circle and divide it to into 108 parts that's how big the earth should be and and then uh you know how how far should the moon be well just put 108 circles of the same size away from the earth and that's where the moon will be and its size it's i mean it, it goes so much deeper than that especially with the number 273 but i'm not trying to rant on too long but i could i'm happy to as, as well it's just ridiculous dude that, like i could go on for about two hours on this stuff no i hear you it's, it's, it's definitely interesting but it's just at least for me not enough to uh say that you know it's how can i say it it's uh designed uh do you know about squaring the circle uh yeah do you know that if you place the moon on top of like if you touch their surfaces and you drew a diagram of uh of putting a point at the center point of the earth and the center point of the moon where they're just sitting on top of each other like a snowman and you make a circle from the center of the moon around the earth i, I may not be describing this well but that would form a circle and you place a square around the earth that is uh another sort of 99.9999 achievement uh, percentage achievement of drawing a circle and a square with equal uh, area inside of them, which is like an age old sort of esoteric uh, challenge to mathematicians. Uh, it, it's super deep and I'm not going to try to explain the sort of uh, the riddle of it all, but the fact that the proportions NASA provides of the earth and the moon are in an answer to that eternal riddle to like 99.99% is, I think that's just a big old tell. Like that's just like them laughing in your face if you believe it. I mean, if you don't know the soul square and the circle ancient <laughs> riddle that goes back to like Pythagoras or something like that, then that's not gonna connect, I get it. But uh, I mean, we have time. We, we've just met each other, but I'm sure we'll know each other for a long time now. But, you know, I'm full of this stuff. And uh, to me, it's I just realized, oh, it's a joke. The whole solar system. It's like a mathematical, like, book of joke references. And it's, and it's so, it compiles so many times so hard in such profound ways that, once you know all these jokes that are you know it's it's like it's like a couple of like mexican guys speaking spanish and talking shit about you and you don't know what they're talking about because you don't speak spanish and it's and it's like oh but i i'm the guy who they're talking behind the back of with white skin but oh i actually learned how to speak spanish fluently so i understand they're joking behind my back because i'm bilingual and it's and it's because you don't speak spanish that you don't know that the people right behind you in line are like making fun of your haircut. And like NASA is laughing at all of us, dude. And, and once you become bilingual, you can understand the, the, well, you have to speak, you have to speak Freemason math, basically. That's the, that's the second language. And once you become fluent in it, you're like, Oh, they were joking. They were laughing at me. In fact, Sorry, that might have been overwhelming. Nah, that, that's a fact, bro. And that, that's what I've been trying to point out to them when they come in here and they try to make the statement that, you know, somehow 
the math is validated by the observation and that suffices as proof, right? And it's like, I always try to point them to kinematics and they just disregard it, right? It's like, well, if we can, you know, explain this kinematically, then what does dynamics have to do with any of it, right? It's not, you can't prove causality of any of this. You just have an equation or, a, you know, a mathematical way to explain what you're seeing. But that doesn't mean that it proves anything in reality, right? And there's like tons of physicists and astronomers that have said that. And like, I'll read quote after quote, bro, and it just doesn't connect. I mean, they're just like, well, we work with these equations every day. We, uh, you know, I, we, we drill and we need gravity. We need little g, you know, it's like, bro, what does that prove the existence of the force of gravity? Of course not, right? It's just a way to explain something through math. Math is just a language. It's not a science whatsoever. It doesn't prove causality, but it just doesn't connect, bro. Well, I, I, think, I think it's usually an impossible task. Even if you're correct, it doesn't matter um, in the sense of being able to convince someone you're correct. Like just, just because you may know what you're talking about and you're correct and you can explain it well, that doesn't mean that you have the ability to convince someone you're correct because communication is just, it, it can't force someone to understand. And, uh, and then there's also the ability of the communicator to be able to, you know, communicate what they know and that's a that's a whole another layer of obstacle there but uh you know we can all try our best i guess it, it's it's yeah it's just it's just crazy though it's just the world we live in even if you're right that doesn't mean you'll be able to convince someone you're right i see your perspective that's why i tend to think like like i i think that the sport is important, right? Like the going back and forth. I I think there's a lot of value in that, but um, I tend to think that if you were gonna become a flat earther, it would have happened already, because there's there's so much to work for the idea that the globe model that has been given to us can be falsified, based on using the same science that they give us. So the fact that that doesn't work should just be setting off so many question marks in your head. But yeah, like I'm just thinking of my own experience when I came around, it didn't take me long. Like nobody had to argue me down and take, you know, put me in a harness and be like, can you like, you know, because I think the truth is, is that most people down in their depths of their soul are flat earthers, but they're bought off into a fantastical <laughs> imaginary land the second they start thinking about science when you wake up every day when you go to sleep at night you know when you fly when you land um nothing about the earth is spinning a thousand miles an hour um it is just clearly objectively stationary and arguably flat for so many reasons and that's just been proven so many times and so when i heard the argument wasn't even an argument but when i heard the points of the flat earth gang i'm like oh oh that makes sense. Okay. And by the way, I wasn't a flat earther. I'm just like, objectively, what you're saying is making sense. And I say this to people when they come in here. I'm like, it's not about you leaving here a flat earther today. But if you can at least understand that these um, that these uh, observations made from super far distances that should be miles and miles under curvature, if you can at least admit to me that that's objectively happening, then I can see that you have at least a respectable foot in the door or some type of rational understanding but you know like i said yeah. the sport is fun but people who became flat earthers were able to rationalize that in not much time so yeah and i'm pretty sure the person who you argued with the most on the topic of is the earth a globe or is the earth flat i'm pretty sure the person you argue with the most over that topic was yourself Can I ask you guys a question? Uh, this question to the room, real quick. Um, do you guys think there's a correlation between somebody's background and, and STEM education and how quick they adopt the flat Earth beliefs? In general, absolutely. Oh, I would like to say that um, I think someone's level of, I guess you could say, 
<laughs> um, you know, school taught education or higher education. I don't think that it's just hard for them to become flat earthers. I, I find that it's hard for them to wrap their mind around a lot of basic concepts that people you know, otherwise in the world seem to fully grasp. And it's, you know, only the people who have paid a million dollars for some bogus education will say, oh, the rest of the world is just stupid. And it's like, mm, I don't know, you know, so like when it comes around rationalizing around why they started giving out TVs for you to get the jab and you try to rationalize with these people time and time again, they just go right back to the money they spent on that education and they just hold on to it near and dear. And they like, I don't know, it's it's like this obsession they have with maybe they just feel like they want to use the money well spent. And I guess it's like, OK, but. Meanwhile, it's like you're out here vulnerable to lies. You're out here vulnerable to jab. They they announce a jab. You you up at six o'clock in the morning with your coffee, banging down the door trying to get a jab. And yeah, I mean, it's hard for these people to to grasp, you know, just basic rationality. I find that happens time and time. Yo, back to you, Chris. Um, what what, what were your thoughts on the question that you put out there? I was just trying to take in all that shade she, she was dropping because I sleep with my degrees every night. I sleep in the bed with her, you know what I'm saying? So I was I know just trying to, I was trying to absorb that shit, you know what I'm saying? No, I'm joking. Um, I was just curious what you guys thought. I wanted to get some feedback from, from the group. I think there's definitely a correlation between um, how willing someone is to adopt, you know, flat earth beliefs and um, the lack of traditional scientific yeah, yeah, yeah. One, one second, Chris. Yeah, one second. Yeah, if I may, real quick. I want to hold on. I asked Chris because I knew that's where he was going. Like, Chris, it's it's some of us with like you know, STEM is relatively new, and some of us wouldn't fall in that category per se. But you know, we understand science by itself, tech. You know, uh, there were some engineers in here. And I don't know, flat earthers, right? And math. You know, yeah, it's. Some of us that went up the ladder in math, right? I was just saying, like, I'm, you know, I, it's, it's, there's no correlation that you were trying to make because, like, I have a background in avionics and then web dev, right? So that's that takes a type of clearly, you know, level a level of thinking, right? Logic, um, and yeah, I've applied that logic to this reality, flat Earth. The truth is, the real question, the real thing you should be asking is. If we really live on a globe, why why is Flat Earth Gang on, even on Clubhouse? Why is Ether Cosmology on Discord after all of these years? It should have been shut STEM down education. instantly. Because we lack STEM education. To do. Like I said, right? it sounds like an a underhanded and roundabout way of saying that people who believe in the Flat Earth have a, a, are likely not enriched in STEM, which is fuckery, right? Which is absolute fuckery. So, you know. You don't jabs, but them shits is weak, bro, because we have mad fucking adept people who are career experts and specialists in fields that are very specific to the topic, who are very passionate, ardent flat earthers. So, uh, that's bullshit. Yeah, that's bullshit. Yeah, that's bullshit. Yeah, is a thing of a lot. Hey, hey, I'm just going to this. Let me just land with this. I want two more sentences. It literally is first, primarily a thing of logic, critical thinking and reasoning right that's primary like that's that's the skill set you absolutely need to navigate these waters stem will help but really a, a person's confidence in their logic and reasoning is really what's going to succeed their way through this because we have people who are really adept at stem and that's and they're like uh, shisha was mentioning because they spent money and all of the uh fanfare and everything that came with that education they have a, a romance with the shit they've learned and uh uh Oh, Chris is on the phone, but they, you know, they just, they're not willing to part with it. That could actually be more of a, a, a hang up than anything versus, and then you have some people who are really good at STEM who are flat earthers, and you have some people who aren't good at STEM who get this thing completely because they're, they, you know, they're logical. Uh, so it's not a STEM thing. Uh, this, a lot of people push STEM like a fucking cult religion sometimes. Oh, shit, it's <laughs> I'm STEM, 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 STEM. All right, bro. <laughs> Right, and, you know, a key word in all in STEM, like in those professions, is the word logic, right? And coding, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, in this in this conversation that we've had here, there's a lot of illogical things on the globe side that still haven't been answered for. 
Facts. Logic Space undergirds Space. the S, the T, the E, and the M. Logic is undergirding all of it. It's controlling the and, whole brain from the stem that's connected to it. And, and real quick, I, I was going to say, like, it's funny. Like, she see, I'm surprised that you didn't mention the fact that, that, you know, that, that you're college educated. We got Val. Val's college educated. Uh, Lee's Beth is college educated. They all have... They all I mean, have I'm, degrees. I'm college educated. I mean, well, hold on. Yeah, I'm college educated. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, so, I'm, I'm a dropout. Yeah, yeah, somewhat. So it's not, yeah, it's not yeah. A, I'm a dropout, but it's not a mess. You know, I, 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 I'm a, I was a gifted student. <laughs> you know, I, but, I had honors classes my whole educational career. So, so think, bro, you know, at this point, bro, it, it, it's really irrelevant, right? Like we've brung enough qualified people, right? Nobel laureates. Uh, people who won the Nobel Prize, like these people are astrophysicists and they disagree with the principles that heliocentrism is built upon, right? And they just completely outright disregard it. I've never gotten any sort of legit response to any of the quotes I've read or anything that any of these people have ever said, bro. So that that's why I'm saying that like, everything Jamal said is true. It really doesn't matter, bro. Like there was a, um, there's a particle physicist, right? He wrote a few books. Uh, one's called The Higgs Fake, Alexander Anzica. I know you probably, People probably heard me bring him up before, but he says, how do you convince somebody that they've spent 30 years of their lives studying something that is completely useless and irrelevant? You can't. Right. So that's really at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to, bro. And he's a particle physicist himself who said, you know, the entirety of particle physics is a futile science that has nothing to do with reality. It's a high tech sport for funding and money and control and nothing more, nothing less. So it's like, at the end of the day, bro, it really doesn't matter about someone's education because they're not willing to hear any of these people out anyway because they don't agree with the consensus. That's just, just literally brain, it's mind control at this point, bro. All right, Yo, so find way and wait, Chris, I was, I was, on, yo, I was quick, on for a minute. What was that book called? Again, I'm about to go, I'm about to go grab that. Uh, the Higgs Fake, uh, Alexander Unziker. Thank you, sir. And there are also people who do. Yeah, he's there a bunch of good people, books. Sorry, there are also people who do studies on the fact that the higher your education, the less critical thinking skills you have. And I and I, I think that people think we just say that to make them upset, but it's not true. Paul Hurd did a um a study on these people who are super highly educated and have some of the most expensive education but they lack critical thinking skills. And the introduction of it is, I'm going to read it. The question at, um, issued in this paper is, what is the current state of critical thinking in higher education? Sadly, studies of higher education demonstrate three disturbing but hardly novel facts. Most college faculty at all levels lack substantive a substantial concept of critical thinking. Most college faculty don't realize they lack critical thinking, believe they su sufficiently understand it, and assume they're already teaching students critical thinking through teaching them the curriculum, which is not true. And that's just some random study I came up with just a second ago. I did a short search on Paul Hurd. These studies are everywhere, and they say the same thing, and they come to the same consensus. There is some connection between expensive higher education and a lack of critical thinking skills. So, CC, did, you, oh, so did, you, did you find what you did you find what you're looking for? I mean, when you were looking to confirm your bias, you found it, right? I mean, that's how it works typically. No, I mean, this is the other. Well, well, but the studies are out there. The I mean, can, I, can, I, can I respond? Like Chris, get in there. He been. I mean, good lord, bro. I said, all right, I, I give up, dog. Nah, nah, Chris. Let me get this piece in, bro. You got it, Chris. Run it up, Chris. We can wait, bro. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not as. I'm not as good as y'all. I forget my train of thought. That's why I tried to jump in. Like the reason I asked the question to begin with was because I forget who was saying what, but the conversation was around people's open-mindedness to accepting flat earth. So I was curious about what you guys thought about the correlations between having a bias, growing up in science, having a degree in science, learning science, and your eventual uh, reluctance or acceptance of the flat earth theories. I think there's absolutely a correlation between people who do not have advanced degrees in science. Now you guys, when I talk about degrees and education and logic, I did not mention any of that shit. I'm talking about people, this is something measurable, people with science degrees, engineering, physics, et cetera, chemistry, et cetera, people with scientific degrees and their belief in flat earth. I, I guarantee you, I've not done the Googles, but I guarantee you there's a correlation between flat people who believe in flat earth and people who do not have those types of degrees. And also there's a correlation between flat earth, the flat earth community, and also, and we had this debate last week, and also a, a negative view toward traditional education. I hear it all the time. So we can't be honest, we can't have a debate today and be dishonest about it because when I'm on mute and I listen, we there's a, there's a there's a tendency to discount traditional formal higher education. 
And that so is Chris, the trend amongst what others. Oh, what, you talking bullshit? What about people? On, bro. Nah, bro, that's yeah, the fact. Chris, the other day, Chris, because Lanell said you was one of them, and I was like, nah, I couldn't be. But you sounded more and more like one of them every day. You're coming up with craftier and craftier ways to throw underhanded jabs and talk some bullshit, bro. That's like saying, bro, that people who spend more years in church tend to be devout Christians. Well, yeah, more than likely. You spend more time sitting in under the pulpit, you, you're more than likely going to believe this shit. But again, um, there's literally no correlation, man. This is an argument of logic, reasoning. This is debate. This is like a hardcore debate. There's science. There's some, definitely some rigid hardcore science in it. But I mean, Jamal, um, there is a correlation. keep trying to make the correlation. There, there is, is no correlation. And, and why don't y'all agree with me when we start? I can't believe it's even a debate, honestly. It's not even an insult. Because if you take a poll in this room, I'm uh, oh, bro, come on. It's not, it's not, it's not an all insult. Nah, well, yeah, no, but if you took a poll in another room, I, I, I the flat earthers would have you way outclassed credentials wise. Like, Yo, I think I think more what's more weighty in this conversation, though, Chris, bro, is, is that what can actually be demonstrated as being, you know, valid by way of the scientific method. What is really science? And does does a majority uh, have some effect on the truth? Right. And I think that's the sentiment from the other side. Right. The other side is that, well, we have more people who believe than you. Whether or not, whether or not they, they can show us any, you know, proof or validity in any of these things, right? Scientifically, of course, we can mathematically, right? And so can our side. But it's just the fact that we had, let's say, we have twenty scientists, and eighteen of them are heliocentrists. Does that mean that they're correct? And that's we're saying the answer is no. Of course not, right? That's that's why we're bringing credential people from your side to tell our side of the story. And every time we do, we never get a response. And I think that right there says it all. And ironically, Chris is demonstrating exactly what I pointed out because of what you said, OG. For some reason, there's a diversion away from the actual dispositives to some other roundabout, sophistic way of talking around the argument, right? Like, what matters is what the fuck are we saying and what's the truth value of what we're saying, the empirical part of this. So trying to make so it's like, bro, you sound like the, the uh, almost said the Jewish media, pardon me, <laughs> no disrespect, but it's like, you sound like the media, bro. It's like, uh, you're looking for crafty ways to typecast people, put them in boxes, statistics your way out of this. And ironically, like she, she and all you were pointing out, that's the criminally underspoken about other side of the Dunning-Kruger effect, bro. The bro, I mean, to be honest you with you, dog, to be honest with you, you guys do that all the time. Do so what? I mean, and, and, oh, typecast people. Though. I'm, an, I'm, the, I'm one of the few globe birds in the room on a regular basis. The typecast and hampers on both sides on a regular basis, dog. I don't and know how I mean, we I just do. Made... How do we typecast? Oh, uh, come like, on, man. Um, I mean, most it, of the, the people the, in the world. The confirmation by, let's be honest, we're not being most honest the about people this people in conversation, our families bro. families and in our lives are globe birthers, and they run the gamut. There's no one type, right? Most people in the world believe what we were taught, and there's not one type of person who believes in the globe. Now, is there a certain typecast of a person who's extremely triggered by this conversation? And is also like transfixed and can't leave it alone and turn into trolls. Yeah, they usually fit a certain type of bill. But people who believe in the globe run the gamut, just like people who believe in flat Earth. But you guys are so bent on creating some sort of effigy to continue to in straw man to continue to poke at. Like OG said, the only thing that matters is what can be demonstrated using the scientific method in this conversation, bro, or logic and reasoning. And it's so I find it so like when I read when I read what I researched you told me that was bias and what's so funny about that is time and time again in all these discussions you guys have the least flexibility i mean don't they don't your scientists say that one marker of intelligence is your ability to be able to be flexible are you going to tell me that the research i did proves a bias no what that means is there are a subset of people who are doing their own research if that's okay with you because apparently the only research that's ever respected is one that you paid a million dollars to do when science is in the hands of everybody anybody can do a study and come to a conclusion right that doesn't mean it has to be your truth but just because the information is there doesn't suddenly mean it's a bias what about that makes it a bias yeah, the so information just, is out there and people also yeah. seem to agree and come to the same conclusion that the higher your education is the lower your critical thinking skills are which is why people are doing these studies yeah. so no, what's wrong you. with that i heard you the other first time yeah the thing about it is what i the point i was making is not that the study was wrong or that the, what you read was wrong the point i'm making is this happens a lot that we only look into things that we want to prove in terms of the positions that we hold so do do a full, do full research research both sides to get a good understanding if all we ever do is look up things that prove our points the decisions we make up front then we won't ever get to the true truth 
the bottom line truth. Let me ask you a very so, straightforward question, right? Back to the topic, right? Has anyone ever demonstrated for you using the scientific method this refractive phenomena that they appeal to when we see too far? That are not, things are that, okay. So what the fuck are we talking about? Aren't we on the logical done uh fucking Occam's razor side of this debate? The reasonable side of this debate. We see things and we're like realists, like empirical observational realists. You see something, we see some you see it, I see it, yep, it's there. Okay. What the fuck is this other dogmatic culty shit that no, it can't be. It's gotta be if you see it, it, it because we know it's a ball, if we're all right, now we can walk back math like come on, that's crazy shit, bro. Now I do think there is a correlation between people who you know, are super academicians and a lack of critical thinking, as the paper she she brought up seems to point out, bro. Everybody knows this, bro. You, you so you don't can just get, accept that correlation. No. Yeah, the correlation not pointed out, dog. I, I think we both know that it, it exists. I don't even know why. You know, again, that wasn't meant to be a hot button question, because again, what some people is in the room already what agree with what I said. Because the base, the basis it? of what I said was the conversation was around how easily some people accept these theories and how my some question people is don't. how do we value so my question was my question was um, do you guys think there's a correlation a between people with backgrounds and people who don't have it oh, we, I, I, I'm not said, Chris, that's why that's study. why I asked the question bro that's why I asked the question see what but y'all did you thought. have a study or something to I've not looked so it up I'm, pointing I'm, it out cool I'm not, I'm not, I'm not looking at it becomes who the fuck is like what are we going to go off of a survey like what's the like what's the parameters of that survey how the fuck do we even know who believes what in this heart of their heart of hearts right uh, as far as people who hold science degrees, this is just completely abstract shit you're trying to string together. Nah, and it's stuff together. that can be looked up, bro. It's something that's measurable. Looked up? Yeah. I mean, you look it, it up. It's measurable. Okay. It's okay. measurable. So here's what your task is. No, I have not. I have not. I have not. That's why it's an open question. This wasn't, really it wasn't a question for debate, on, but I see this, hold again, on, it's a hot button hey, topic, dog. I was trying to finish talking. I'll let you go, bro. Just Here's what you're tasked with doing now. Actually finding something to back up what the fuck you're saying, and then let's find out. Is there any credibility to whatever you go find? Because I guarantee you, there's no fucking way of even casting a net wide enough to make any sense of the correlation you're trying to appeal to here, bro. There's no such fucking correlation that anyone has the data to make, bro. It's just another slight, underhanded, roundabout way of saying you niggas are stupid and don't know science because if you did, you wouldn't be susceptible to flattery. Yeah, bro, that's how you took it, bro. That's all. Appreciate that. I'm not There's doing no homework. I asked you guys the question. Nah, no, it is, bro. It most definitely is. Well, well, how many degrees, degrees do you have, though? Degrees are not a measurement of IQ. The degrees are not measurement Chris of IQ. Chris never gets mad. I don't know what's happening right now. <laughs> I think that's why nah, the app is glitching because Chris we're not, is mad. <laughs> yeah, let, let's flow with it. Nah, I'm just heat he gonna bring heat, dog. You know what I'm saying? So again, it was an open question to the group to get feedback because that's what we do in this room, right? We ask questions, we have conversations. Well, we heard and you. You guys kind of stepped and went off. We heard you. Nah, no, nah, I asked the question and shut the fuck up. Then somebody asked me what I thought and I fucking told back you guys. Up, you know what I'm saying? So I told you, and I'm not going back to research on it, bro. It was an open question to the team, to the group, bro. But you keep yeah, asserting you, that you and I know, you we agree, all know there's a correlation. You keep saying right. we all know there's a correlation. You know there's a correlation. What the fuck? No, I've correlation? not done the research. I would assume there is. I would assume there is. So I would, we always make assumptions, bro. We everybody here makes assumptions. All right, well, you repeat yourself, bro. And you ain't got nothing to back it up. Nah, but Chris, wouldn't you agree that it doesn't matter your level of education when it comes to the facts of what we're talking about? Man, the ba the basis of the, 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 the point of the conversation I was piggybacking on was about people's acceptance or reluctance to accept flat earth and i asked the question about people's background do you think people's background affects the reluctance to accept flat earth open question right that, so that was it that's a, a general question but it's so funny that you're posing this oh, I think, position I think that it, it was I just an open question it but was. i mean i think we no but we gave you our response and somehow we got an emotional reaction which uh, i'm surprised why have an I emotional the, reaction to the answer bit. to an I open the, general no, 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 question i asked the question and shut the fuck up, like I just said. Then I was asked what I thought. I wasn't gonna offer it up. I was asked. Then I said what I thought. Then you guys went off. Yo, Chris, but I asked I the say, question. I asked the question in response to the conversation that was going on. Right. So you asked, is there a correlation between people who have backgrounds with STEM? And I mean, so we got to this point. You you've admitted that. That's right. And listen, listen. Right. To what I would say, I would say real quick. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait a minute. Hold on. My point. Hold on. I would say, I would say my. Say like, on, real quick, we, Jamal. Jamal. Real quick. Let me just say this. I would say my background is having lived through 9-11, learning about JFK assassination, COINTELPRO, uh, the Patriot Act, all of these other true conspiracies. That's my background to flat earth, to, to accepting flat earth, right? Real logic, real things in this real world. 
So again, the, the the problem with the way he framed it is not it, it's something that you could never really get fucking data on because he's talking about people's susceptibility to being open to it, right? Like there's no way to put a fucking metric on that. You could right? measure all kind of things. There's a correlation between people who major in STEM and their tendency to slide toward liberal cons- uh, political views and conservative views. There's all sorts of correlations between okay, so people's that's background. No, 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 that's not. I'm saying that's this said, because brother, man, you cut me off. Bro, it was it was a it question. question. What you said. You said their openness to it, right? You didn't say their tendency to believe in it, right? You said their openness to it. So there's no way to put a metric on that. There's no way to put a correlation or any study or anything to back that up. It was a, it was a. That's that was the fucked up part of the question that made it seem like there's a bit of a little of, a little bit of spite in there, right? I honestly don't recall exactly what I said, and I'm, I'm not I'm saying not I didn't say that. I, I'm, I'm not saying it wasn't what I said. I'm saying I don't recall what I said. So that piece added to spice. That that spice wasn't intentional. It was just an open question. Because again, what I'm thinking about, and this is measurable. This is very measurable. You could look at people's, you look at a number of factors and their tendency to have certain political views or believe in certain religions. There's correlate. There's all sorts of correlations that exist. And this question is very similar to that. Sounds like a lot of backpedaling, and you started hyper specific. So yeah. Hey, bro, I'm not backpedaling shit, bro. I have no reason. <laughs> we already we already in the fight. Why the fuck would I backpedal? Well, I'm just giving you my opinion, right? That's oh, what we're I, doing. I to share I appreciate, I appreciate, views, I thought, I appreciate right? your feedback. Appreciate nah, the Chris, feedback. Don't need hey, the Chris, backpedal, I just bro. want to remind you that nah, you, you, are, you are the homie, right? You are the homie. So you're not. It's not a fight, man. It's not no, a no, I'm cool. No, hey, it's gonna be. Hey, that's like what family does. We fight, but yeah, I don't want to do this. Turn up, but yeah, just, yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. That's all good. The cast I'm backpedaling. I'm holding. I, I, I said what I said, and I still think there's a correlation. You know what I'm saying? So I mean, well, we just you no, tasked with actually backing it up because you just yeah. Nah, there's no task. You feel me? But yeah, I think there's a correlation. Well, I mean, if you want to just move out from just yapping to actually saying something, you ain't really said shit yet. But Shane, I, I was you, that's what's yesterday, up. man. Um, John and them, some of our experts over here had a room talking about your model, and uh, it was very fucking disingenuous. It was just bad. I was really <laughs> to in there and kind of shut it down. It was so bad. Oh yeah, my reaction to that is different than most people, I guess. They're like sh- shocked and horrified. I'm always super amused because we held like many open open nights, open live streams. We invited the community, like everyone came and asked questions. We went through it and then they waited like two months and then dude, like Lobers, they like pretended none of that happened and went right back to the same right. stuff they were repeating. So it's kind of weird and, and disingenuous how they do that, but I'm sure that it was just that. Just a coincidence. Yeah, it's hard to pretend that uh, the Azimuthal Dome is some magical concept that Flat Earthers seem to carry around with it. And then I got him to admit that that is real. That is what you see. That is how you see. But he wants to call it magical and then says, uh, try to pretend that Newtonian math is undergirding what you see in, like, the kinematics that you see in the model. And it's like, there's no, no, no this thing isn't crunching Newtonian gravitational. That's not what's happening here, man. On this little no shame, model. I mean, am I am I like am I mistaken? Like, is there actually Newtonian like left? I don't think there's fucking Newtonian uh, math being crunched to make any of that work. I think it was just Zero. kinematics, and then they just yeah. I don't know why they tried to run that. That they like hyper obsessed about the uh, the twenty four hour sun being on the model. Uh, what else, bro? The bendy light. That's another one that they like to talk about. Like they haven't addressed this t- this there shit a hundred times. Sorry, I just randomly switched to the desktop app in the middle of my sentence. Didn't know it would sign me in elsewhere. I think I figured it out. That we're good. You guys are rocking with my desktop. Did you hear the Newtonian part? Mm, is it because it uses necessarily? There's no Newtonian mechanics whatsoever. Even Bizlet himself, when we argued with him specifically just referenced the JPL model and then said he used their conclusions loosely in the constant. So that's the base model, right? So anything from that is not going to be anything that's using the JPL or dependent on the heliocentric observations. It's just a simulation. And what he used from that is the constants, which is what? G? G, the main constant, the gravitational constant? Where, where does that come from? <laughs> Little g, right? The basic the basic uh, height and time function to get Dramatic. acceleration. So like it's, it's all based on that, which means I wouldn't want to change any of that, right? The, the, that that model is great, right? I, why why would I want to change the part that I like? So the emulation part, the the physics part works fine. All it does is does a coordinate system transform from literally like geodesic to personal or to alt as to like uh, equatorial or off the celestial equator, right? So just like you can convert lat long to right ascension declination, all this is doing is converting the actual celestial sphere to the local the the local alt as grid, which is what you can see in like Stellarium, 
and then moving that around with the local observer. That is all the code is doing, which is why it's so like sweet and elegant. It's also uh, exactly what uh, Stellarium does. If you look at that code, it's a similar process, right? It's written in a different language, but if you look at the functions and the parameters and what it returns, functions identically. So obviously that's the way to convert stars. That's what it's based on. And conveniently, if you think about it, that's how they got the model in the first place. They took a m bunch of local observations of people looking at the stars, combined that to map out the celestial sphere, which then they mapped the the, so the uh, geographic graticule to, right? So that that the long lap based on the stars directly. So that's the whole map, man, right? Therefore, Earth globe. <laughs> right. Sky well, curves so Earth that. globe. Kepler took uh, Newton took Kepler's, you know, borrowed Kepler's. Uh, kinematics in the first place yeah we love we love talking about that dude the space audits in here he loves talking about that too kinematics are my favorite yo i don't want to sidetrack y'all this is like i really want to understand that as well but so yesterday i peeped the conversation between sacred and i think it was nathan oakley and sacred was talking about interferometry and measuring uh you know a, a curved path and nathan was just like completely against it i think i remember bob nodell talking about uh interferometer at altitude right that 15 degree uh hour shift and he was saying that it changed that altitude and like nathan was just like railing sacred you know completely trying to disregard everything he was saying so i what what was that all about can anybody break that down if, if they're able to absolutely so uh starting back with the history of interferometry before we get to bob and his gyroscope situation um We'll go back to Michelson Morley in 1887, where they took the initial measurements trying to measure the velocity of Earth through the ether, which would confirm the heliocentric model. It would confirm the Newtonian dynamics that they had swapped in for uh, with Kepler's laws. So you know how they say we can derive Kepler from Newton, we can derive uh, Newton from Kepler, and vice versa. So in order to substantiate that causal mechanism, right, because Kepler's laws are kinematics and Newton's laws are dynamics, right? We're applying the, the, the force of gravity to produce this, this velocity, right? So this, this experiment, uh, Michelson-Morley was, was testing the Newtonian dynamic aspect of the, of their model, right? So it was supposed to give a French shift reading that would correspond to 30 kilometers a second. And the, although this experiment was done in the 1800s, they had the math down to derive a proportional fringe with respect to velocity in the first order. They had like they had it down pat because the same equation that they used is the same equation that they use now for ring laser gyros, and it's actually equivalent to the Sagnac equation. So they they nailed the like their interpretation of how they could use light to make a measurement of velocity. They nailed it. Now they got a measurement that was six kilom that corresponded to what would be six to eight kilometers a second, and they had an air tolerance of two kilometers a second. So they were, they were well outside of experimental air, right. Uh, in, in terms of the sensitivity and stuff, but they didn't have enough to confirm the heliocentric dynamics aspect of it. Right. So they completely invalidated the new, the algebraic switch that you could do to interject a quote unquote force to explain, uh, the movement of the bodies. So they went ahead and rounded that down to zero and then relativity theory was put forward about 13 years later to uh to explain how you know oh well you know what actually light is like any is is unlike any other wave and it's actually constant irrespective of of the motion of the observer so they went so then they went forward with that and then they used link contraction and time dilation to say hey well actually you know we're in because we're in this moving frame at this velocity we're actually experiencing link contraction and time dilation as a function of the square of our velocity over c squared meaning like there's a really really small amount of compression in the apparatus so the distance that it's that light has to travel is changed in it. So when you, you can't actually make a measurement to determine your velocity. So th that's how they like zeroed that out and then like kept the story alive that, that they could explain the motion of the objects in the sky with dynamics. So that was like part one. All right, here's the part. Now, yeah. oh, you're good. So when they get, um, now Mickelson was like, Hey, we should, we should do more experiments uh, throughout the course of the year to see if we can get better measurements because you know, it, it should be way faster, right? Like at the very least, but we don't really know. So they never ended up continuing those, but that's when Dayton Miller came through uh, between 1905 and uh, 1925. He did like 20 years of, of measurements and part of his work on the last five years he was doing the measurements at altitude 
And what he found was that the velocity increases. So instead of measuring six to eight kilometers a second, 200 feet above sea level, he's, a, he's now at 1,800 feet above sea level and he's measuring, uh, what was it, uh, like, what was it 10 to 12 kilometers a second? And he was like, okay, so there's a vertical velocity gradient. And then, you know, people were just, oh, they basically they just ignored his measurements and then stopped, stopped talking to him about it. And then, then after he died, uh, his lab assist, his former lab assistant, uh, you know, basically did a hit piece on him and said that his, his data was just airs with, uh, due to temperature differentials and all this stuff. But Miller was an expert on all that. And he had multiple interferometers that he was using and he was, you know, he knew all about temperature and how it would affect the, the readings and stuff. So that wasn't, that wasn't the issue. What the issue was is, is he was measuring the same periodicity in the measurements that correspond to the position of the stars and the sun throughout the day and year. And it was like the same repeating uh, periodicity that he kept finding. And then when he went to altitude, the periodicity was still there and the, and, but the magnitude of the measurements was increased. So, you know, a greater velocity. So anyway, they just straight up ignored your boy and uh, you know, no real comment on it. And then in 2000, what was it? 2002 to 2004 ish. There was a guy named Yuri Galev who did interferometer readings at altitude and he used radio interferometry instead of optical uh, wave bands. So like instead of using a laser or light, he was using radio waves. So he confirmed it with millimeter or uh, millimetric r r wave uh, links. So like really, really precise measurements confirmed the same periodicity and the vertical velocity gradient that Miller got. And then, um, you know, insert the flat earth situation, right? Where we uh, were testing, you know, where Bob, was going to use a, a gyroscope to test, uh, you know, earth rotation versus, uh, ether or whatever in his, it, when they did their measurements, you know, they, the device gave out a reading of 15 degrees per hour. And then they took it to altitude and said that they got over 15 degrees per hour, meaning that, you know, like the same kind of thing that, that Miller got. Now, the thing with that is, is in the current mainstream paradigm of physics, the measurement is supposed to be taken with respect to the center of the rotating ball. So it's like an absolute frame for this 15 degrees per hour. So if you take in the current paradigm, if light works how they say it does, if you take that interferometer to altitude, it can't give 16, 17, 18 degrees per hour. It has to be 15 degrees per hour because it's made with respect to that absolute fixed point that they're, that they're using for their reference. So, um, but the issue with, with Bob's, situation was is that he didn't release the data for like a hella long time and then when he did it was like partially corrupted and there was a bunch of issues with it now we ended up getting the full data uh and and uh, our boy man of stone did an analysis of it i'll post a video of his of his analysis on it but basically wait god day and miller's data no, no, I got. God, I, I, I wish. <laughs> I wish. No, and no they, one can get Dayton Miller's data. <laughs> yeah, he got Bob's data though, and Stone. Um, you know, he's a beast at that stuff. He specializes in quality assurance for for flat Earth. So he went through, parsed it all out, and what he found was the measurements were even outside of what Bob said, because Bob said it was like a three degree shift. I think if I if I, if I can remember correctly. But it ended up being like 17 to 18 degrees per hour, but it was due to temperature fluctuations and the device. And also the way that they had it configured to take the readings, it was down to like the 0 0.000000000000 degree or whatever. So it was just like way too much uh, noise essentially, right? To extrapolate anything useful out of it. But then it's like, okay, so how does this device read in the raw data, 18 degrees per hour, but it outputs 15 degrees per hour. Well, an inertial navigation device is, it works off of GPS and a Kalman filter and different references that it will use when you, when you boot it up, you input your lat long coordinates and everything on it and it calibrates. So it knows what it's supposed to enter and what it what, or it knows what, where it's at and what it's supposed to output at that relevant spot. So you're not going to turn on an INS and then, start falsifying the globe with it or anything like that, because it's going to output exactly what it has to. And then when you get into the raw data, it's mostly just noise and the, uh, the, the temperature of the, of the device is causing fluctuations. So it's not really the proper device that you would want to use to, to substantiate uh, a variance of the speed of light at altitude because uh, of the, of the way that it's built in the corrections that, that come into it, that come into play. So we don't, 
we don't use uh, Bob's data at all. And then also, now, although his gyro was a three-axis gyro, meaning it doesn't really matter if it's, un if it's aligned to true north or not, because it'll just measure everything and then just take the differential to get the correct uh to get the correct measurement, but um, they were supposed to be aligning it to the north, and <laughs> the guy that was in charge of doing that was uh, he used the decal sticker on it to establish, you know, the uh, <laughs> the orientation of it, and the decal sticker was uh, had no, <laughs> it wasn't related to the position of uh, of how it should be aligned to be uh, aligned with true north, so they were like completely off on that. And yeah, the, the data there was just not really usable and doesn't prove anything either way. So we don't, you know, we don't use Bob stuff, but yeah, they, the media, you know, obviously took that and told everyone, oh, you know, flat earther confirms, you know, ball rotate and all these things. And it's like, well, let's assume that, that that's true. Right. Uh, if can a 15 degree per hour measurement tell you if the earth is rotating or if the sky is translating motion down to you through some, you know, ether mechanic, right? Which is our, Ooh, which, is our which, which is our, per, which is our position and measurements fall under kinematics. They do not tell you causal mechanisms. Now the public doesn't really know much about any of that. And it doesn't, you, you know, so when they hear, you know, earth ball rotate me measurement, they're like, oh yeah, I mean, obviously. Right. But when you break it down and you're honest about it, all measurements are kinematics. They could be like, if they really wanted to, they could have swooped up Dayton Miller's measurements and just said, oh, you know what? For some, for X, Y, Z reason, the ether is just moving slower on the surface of the earth. But, uh, you know, they, they could do that, but then they would lose power of the constancy of C to use it as a yardstick for, uh, for astronomy. And you really need that yardstick because, but if you, but if you give up the constancy here on the surface, they're going to they lose they lose the sky basically because then you could say anything anybody any any old <laughs> swinging dick could come in it messes up their vacuum math right yep yeah not to mention the length of a meter would change so you know they can't have that you got to keep that seat constant or whatever yep but yeah that's the extended right, so that was, that was, extended that history on it breakdown yeah like, I, I definitely understand so what is nathan opie's beef and with you know i don't know if y'all caught that on on qe channel the other day but yeah. You know, he was pretty much so, saying, can you prove it? He kept yeah. screaming at sick. Yeah. So here's my interpretation of what's going on with that crew. When that happened, you know, with Bob and Jaron with the behind the curve and the flat earther proves ball rotate and stuff, it, it was extremely easy to just hand wave dismiss it as an argument and say, oh, that's a man-made device. It did, it, you know, it, it's programmed to do, but like, you know, just make an excuse and not acknowledge how the technology works or dive into it. Cause that's actually what Bob ended up oh. doing. Go, go yeah, ahead. But plus they were all about stationary and no motion. They had said it, they chanted it. It's part of their like routine. It was part of the same things you learn when you go to the server. It was very ingrained in the culture. So naturally they were resistant to say that they had measured motion. I think it's also part of it to be honest. Well, yeah. So anyway, you could use, you could just apply the same rhetoric to saying that, you know, it's unscientific, you blah, 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 man-made device. Cause that's the big thing that they say that it was a, that it's a man-made device. That's what they used to say. Yes. And it's like, and it's just, an, it's just an easy way to pacify everyone and maintain your position to just hand wave, dismiss it and not acknowledge what was measured. Cause it's, cause it's scary, okay. right? Cause it's like, oh my God, they're measuring ball rotate. Like, you know, how do, what well, do we, yeah, they, what do we do here? So they just, they didn't have an explanation of, for the motion. Yeah. yeah like, I just, was, like epistemologically, what the fuck? Like, was it, I guess it had to be relativity, but what just made them just stop talking about ether drift as a concept or any of the, like the, the Maki and stuff. Why did that just, so, I don't know, was in the, and so two part question, answer that. And then you could also, I had a question earlier. That's why I want to pause when you mentioned about like the uh, contraction the apparatus contracted could it were, is the claim that it's just the apparatus contracting or is like all of the space all, all of the whole everything that's in the direction of motion is contracted so you oh, your so. your family your the kid down the street riding his right. bike okay. everyone is contracted <laughs> by saying. I'm saying the table yeah. the, the space between you and the table the organs your twin paradox by. self and you're the yep. one over there yep and right. then the okay. second part uh, what was the first part of the question uh, about the 
fuck. What was the first part of my question? The my oh, just like what oh yeah, married, yeah. the whole Maki and principle. Yeah, why did they Maki. stop with the ether? Right. So yeah, because I remember reading the Einstein letter to Planck where he kind of said the exact thing. He was pretty much saying that it, you would just need a different explanation, but you would, you could you could definitely work in an enclosed heavy shell of matter with a rotate with a stationary Earth. Yep. So the the reason they had to abandon it is because. If it's an actual mechanism that can be used that all motion is relative to it, then you could know absolutely how fast you're moving, et cetera. And that would make the measurements that they made with Nicholson Morley absolute first order measurements that falsify Newtonian dynamics. So they have to remove the concept of the ether as a physical mechanism and also a mathematical, a, a valid mathematical reference frame for all motion to be relative to so that they could, uh, you know, use absolute measurements. So the, okay, yeah. so fast forward to today. What are they saying about Ru Yan Wang and this absolute velocity uh, linearized segment? What was the response? The mainstream reply so, or response? So most most mainstream lads uh, that we deal with, like on Twitter and Discord and stuff, will deny the measurements. Right now, when you get into the academic explanations, some of the papers that have been put have been put forward uh, take a really weird route. Right, so. In 2014, I think it was, there was a guy named Tartiglia and others who put together a paper trying to explain it. And they start off the paper by saying, the classical derivation for the Sagnac effect is perfectly explained by using uh, C plus or minus V with respect to clockwise and counterclockwise orientation of the device, meaning the speed of light is measured faster going with the rotation and slower going against it. As so it's you know getting a boost in the velocity that's directly proportional to that rotation rate. And then they go on to say, now here's how we're going to answer it in the relativistic style, boys. So what they do is they set up a cylindrical coordinate system and they invoke a center point in that cylindrical coordinate system. They overlay it on top of the rotating apparatus. So now they have this stationary observer in the center of it and they're watching the, obser they're watching the other observer at the rim of the device rotating around and they say, that guy is in a non-inertial frame, so the constancy of the speed of light doesn't apply to him, and will will allow a a uh, a timing difference. Uh, or no, no, I'm sorry. Well, what do they do? They uh, they change the distance but keep the time so that that they can um, so they establish absolute time. And, and so, what's the rationale for reaching for a cylinder? I don't get it. Oh, it's is it uh, just convenient? But no, no. Well. It's two part. It's for it's for symmetry, and then they need that fictitious frame to establish an absolute reference frame for the distance to be relative or uh, to be measured against, so that they could have the distance change of the apparatus, and uh, so that the speed. Because here's the thing, right? If the speed of light is constant, and you're in a ro you're in a rotating circuit, and you split a light beam, and it's going clockwise and counterclockwise, and it recombines at the other side. If the speed of light is the same then relativity theory predicts no fringe shift pattern because it's going to complete the circuit at the same time regardless. So you have to right. you you have to use absolute space to preserve either space or time to uh to account for that differential in the in the timing. So that's that's the purpose of it. And Einstein specifically says in his 1905 paper at the in the first two pages he says that we don't need to use uh the luminiferous ether and we don't need and we won't assign uh imaginary vectors where electromagnetic propagation once took place. And what he's saying there is like, we won't do something like, I don't know, set up a cylindrical coordinate system, put a fictitious observer at the center and, and use absolute space to, uh, to, to measure the distance against. <laughs> so like they, they can only answer it by explicitly violating the principles of relativity theory. Right, right, right. And then wow. Yeah, because because that theory, if you try to do, if you try to derive the Sagnac effect under the principles of relativity theory, where the speed is constant and you don't, you can't assign imaginary vectors, you predict zero fringe, right? I mean, that's I can show the the math on that, and I have some other citations where other people were, uh, realized that same contradiction. So you, they can only answer it in the first order with this fictitious frame and assigning the vectors and then denying the validity of the frame. But Einstein, in that same 1905 paper says that a rotating frame in in, that's moving uniformly, uh, his equations apply there. So it definitely still applies. Now, when they get into Ru Yang Wang, what they do uh, is they, the, what Tartiglia and the boys did is they invoke a midpoint of the apparatus and they, they do the exact same thing and that's it. And then they throw a gamma factor at the end of their derivation 
which is too small, right? So ch check this out. Relativity is a second order theory. Link contraction and time dilation are a function of the square of the velocity uh, squared over c squared. So what that means is that even if it even if it did predict a fringe, which it which it doesn't, it would predict a very 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 tiny fringe in proportion to the actual motion. So it wouldn't predict it in the first order, meaning directly proportional to the velocity. So it it doesn't even it doesn't even predict well it doesn't predict a fringe, but even if it did, it would be much much smaller than what is measured. All right, so two things. Uh, again, real quick, sorry to hog. Just simple ones. Questions, not so. I shouldn't take a long answer. Uh, the because I I realize there is kind of a tendency in the mainstream telling of all of it to pretend there is no shift and kind of just write it off as no result negative. There was no shift when you hear people talk about it. What was the like the initial explanation for the whatever two kilometers per hour, whatever it was shift that. Uh, well, they were orbiting the sun very slowly or whatever. <laughs> yeah, Mickel yeah, Mickelson said that the velocity measured was uh was much slower than expected. And Dayton it was Miller the only scientific conclusion you could have, right? Being a reasonable person. So I mean yeah. <laughs> trying and, to yeah. And Dayton Miller said the same thing, but he was more honest about it. He was like in one of his papers, he says that the that the ether is coming from the uh, galactic something or whatever, like the galactic center or whatever, and it's coming at you know seven hundred kilometers a second or whatever. But on Earth, you know, I, I don't have a reason or an explanation as to why it's measured um, at ten kilometers at 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 this altitude and and whatnot, like wh where this where the where the extra velocity is going. I can't explain that, but these are my measurements. So he was at least yeah, honest about it, but there's there's no explanation. No one's ever attempted to explain the readings as is because it completely falsifies the sky for them. Yeah, and when you talk about those specific people, like Quantum Eraser, right, his whole existence is based in a misunderstanding of an experiment. And like the funny thing about him denying ether is that his whole like thing, his whole favorite like quantum mechanics has all like different terms to replace the thing that they took out. So like without the ether, they had to make up fake things. So remember they're trying to replace like instantaneous action at a distance without a, a energetic background connecting things. So you have like quantum fluid, quantum flow, quantum condensation, strong net condensation, quantum vacuum, zero point energy, quantum vacuum energy, virtual particles, virtual photons, and then Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, right? So all of this is what you have to invent as conventions when you remove the energetic etheric background. Yep. And then when, when you mathematically describe it as the uh, literal what rate of uh, induction and resistance of just the general vacuum, that's how they get the measure of the speed of light. The impedance. And then they try yeah, to... Yeah, so yeah, quick question, um, Shane or Alan. What was it that Dr. Bennett had submitted to Wiki about the Sagnag effect that he wanted to, like, uh, he wanted to make a change to it or something like that, and he sent several emails and didn't respond to him? What, what was that about again? I can't remember specifically, but it was probably, you know, pointing out that the Sagnag effect is not a relativistic effect because what they what they say and what they have to say is that the Sagnag effect is a relativistic effect um, because otherwise it would falsify their theory, but there's no actual relativistic derivation of it. Um, I'd have to go back and listen to what he was trying to get published specifically. I remember uh, see, reading that. I don't know if the patents actually were gotten, but that they were they were immediately when I was reading Wayne that they were immediately talking about like patents for new uh, like accelerometers or whatever like uh, um, yep. not accelerometer, but like a fucking odometer, whatever the fucking speed accelerometer. Yep. Yeah, dude, they, they even said in the Tartaglia paper, it was really funny because after they did their midpoint derivation threw in a gamma factor at the end that completely cancels out and doesn't answer anything in the first order and requires a cylindrical coordinate system transformation to invoke a fictitious frame that violates the principles of relativity to assign imaginary vectors in space for electromagnetic processes. <laughs> after they did that, they concluded that it would be really, that it's really cool what Wang measured and it's going to be awesome to have new linear interferometers for to measure wow. acceleration. And it's like, it's like, bruh. Mickelson Morley, anyone? But the reason that they don't, the reason they don't make that connection, though, is because they they take it for granted. You know, they, like people have forgotten, right? Like the importance of it. And it's like, bro, if you're making measurements against absolute space, where's our orbital velocity at, Brody? <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, the whole thing. The, <laughs> the most important thing that you need to have for the heliocentric model to be true. And they fudged it all along. They pretended that it wasn't there. They had the measurement. Now they pretended it's a null result. And then that we've measured it all the time. Then they finally concluded, actually, we can never measure it, but we believe it. Yeah. 
And that's then, actually the current state. So, so in the debate that Shane and I had with Mord Wand and Peter, Mord brought up a paper citing uh, an explanation for the Sagnac effect, and we went we went and read that on a reading night a couple of weeks after. And what they did there was atrocious too, right? So they said they, they did the standard oh response. They did the standard response that, oh well, because it's a rotating frame, it doesn't fall under the dominion of special relativity. One must use the general theory. So they broke out the metric tensor for space time curvature, and then they took differentials of the of each coordinate x, y, z, t, which basically what you're what they're doing there is so special. The special theory of relativity is flat space time, right? Now what they did with this what they're doing here with the uh, with the general theory and, and using the curved space time metric, but then taking differentials of it for the, the coordinate sections, they're they're making an infinitesimally flat space time as well. So like, there's no real distinction between flat yes. space time and the and the uh, the differentials or the the derivative. Sorry, the, the derivatives that they took of the space time metric to to make it also flat. And then they're like, okay, now here's what we're gonna do, boys. After we've got this other flat metric. Uh, flat coordinate system. We're gonna also invoke a cylindrical coordinate <laughs> system to to use it within this space. And it's like, oh Jesus Christ, you're doing it again, boys. And then <laughs> and, then, and and then they go on to conclude that the timing difference in the light beam is due to none other than the principle of relativity of simultaneity, boys. So it's just, that's preposterous, dude. It's so crazy. Okay, it's not. So it's not even. Yeah, it's, I, I, I watched that. Um, <laughs> I've been piece by piece breaking. I watching like it was like. A few, I don't know if it's space or this or change channel as they are relativity, relative simultaneity, whatever the relativity, relativity of simultaneity. That's um right. And um, to me, it's uh, so I'm wondering like uh, okay, so let me let me uh, I'll come back. Let me reframe the question because I lost it a little bit in there, but it had to do with uh this whole relativity of simultaneity and how they justify it. But I'll be right. But I'm just trying to format the question. Well, so to just sum up the ether thing, right? I think what's it developed an argument specifically against the QE position and it's super sound. It was actually like the first thing I'd ever seen Witsit argue. It was right when I found Witsit. It was the first stream I ever watched was here's the ether. And I was like, huh. And like the way it was presented. <coughs> sorry. Was like, oh, you have this two frameworks, atomism, and then there's something that you've never heard of that is a different explanation for all the visual phenomena. And you're like, oh, I didn't know that I didn't have to believe in virtual photons that pop into existence. But the way that he explained it real simply, and it was specifically against the QE position, because they always argue no gas pressure without containment, right? And then they're like, well, is there a firmament? No, we can't prove it. But how do you know it's there? Well, we need containment, right? That's as far as they go. So they have an indirect proof based on that. Right. And so, and so what he says is like, oh, well, if you can't wave, right? If you have a wave in a medium or, or, or whatever, and you can't have a wave without a medium, then like, what is the wave waving? Nah, crap, I fucked Man, it up. Alan, help I've me out. <laughs> I've crashed so many PhD physicists that have come in here just by asking that simple question, like what's waving, you know, what's waving? And they freak out and they just smell down. Yeah. No, you pretty, pretty much nailed it. Night, like two in the morning, he's like, huh, I went to chat GPT, I found you. He's like, he's been looking for me for a year. I went to <laughs> <laughs> you, got, you gotta love those ones, dude. Yeah, it was fucking hilarious. Uh, but all right, the question I was asking was, uh, fuck, did I just lose it again? Uh, oh, okay, uh, fuck, I lost it again. I'll pop back up. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, Shane, you, you pretty much nailed it. It was basically all the arguments that you use for the firmament to establish gas pressure, right? If you just don't say the word firmament and say ether, well, yep. sa same exact <laughs> logic, right? You prove it through, through logic, right? We have measurements yeah, and we exactly. have logical yeah. deduction of those measurements because people will say like well, what's the iv dv in the experiment well the iv d is the time of day that the measurement is taken with respect to the orientation of the device being in the uh, north south and east west directions right so if you're looking for fluctuations of the speed of light throughout the day with respect to um, a specific orientation well, you would test that by rotating the apparatus throughout the day and taking those measurements. And that's exactly what they did. So like failure to acknowledge that as the IV and stuff is like how they has, how that crew like obfuscates and muddies the water with the situation. Okay. I finally remember the question before I lose it again. So the question was, uh, has there ever been like a formal, like a, like a camp, or cadre of like people who have formally opposed this on a real academic front, like oppose this whole mathematical sweeping under the rug of like this sagnac 
you know, all this ether drag business. Dude, there's tons of papers that we read that we like to read all the time. This is like, I, I did a whole timeline of experiments, like papers, people writing it up from Mickelson Morley up through like the 2014 of people continuing in exactly their line, testing, measuring, writing papers, conceptualizing. They called it different things, right? In the modern time, they called it some weird things, but all of them referencing, oh, well, we go one way, we go faster, one way, we go slower. <laughs> Literally had to reference that the whole time and had to work it into the different frameworks. So it's it's definitely a, a, like an, a known phenomenon, probably not in the mainstream, but kind of in the mainstream, right, at the same time. Okay, so that right there, just the preferred propagation, like direction of light or whatever. We have so much fucking light technology propagating. Like, what's the official explanation? Why is there... Do so, they acknowledge? Is there an acknowledgement of the preferred? Yeah, race? they're, they're shagnag. <laughs> so, so the way they try to wrap it up is they say that you know because the Earth ball is rotating, that essentially the light is uh, that the Earth is like rotating out from underneath the light. So that that's how they that's how that's how they explain it. Because keep in mind, it's only in the east west directions. There's no north south variance, and if the and if the uh, if if ball rotate was the causal mechanism, i.e., the Earth is rotating out from underneath the light to create the, the wobble, should get it right to, to create the phase difference. There has to also be a north south variance, although it would be smaller because you know it's uh, not moving as as the far. Wobble. But you, it has to be there in the north south arms of the interferometer, and it's never been done. Even GPS doesn't correct for north south uh, uh, variation. It's only east to west. So strong evidence for it being sidereal rotation. 100%. Yeah, well, and then yeah the, str strong evidence. With the solar stuff too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, strong evidence for it being the causal mechanism isn't the Earth rotating. Right. So it has to be some other thing because otherwise there would well, be a north south Alan? variance. <laughs> So, what if what if you argued that the Earth spun her faster when it was uh, closer to the sun? And slower when it was away from the sun, and that way it would align with that serial measurement that Dayton Miller noticed. What do you what do you think about my, my little birth model? No, disgusting. <laughs> oh, no, it's actually crafty as shit. You just need a nice little tidy yeah. equation to make a yeah. relationship between proximity dude. of the gravitational source and dude. And <laughs> I, I bring it up because you know dogs are gods, Alan. You know that terrible. No, oh, yeah. And you know, demon strides and that server. So one day I went in there and I brought the whole ether thing and I explained it to him and I was so triumphant. And in one fell swoop, all of them all at once decided that this was no big deal and that the earth could rotate like this differently. And that it was like, I was like, dude, that has to do with the the solar side. They were like literally like solar minimum and maximum. They were like, yeah, well, what if the earth just spun faster? <laughs> I laughed so hard that I left. I was like, what the hell, dude? What do I do against that? Oh, dude, An another thing I wanted to touch on real quick is that there's two different styles of interferometers, right? There's the Mickelson style where light travels at a right angle to itself. And then there's the closed loop circuit that they use. Now, a big part of the deception was saying that the Mickelson style interferometer, the, the one where light travels at a right angle to itself. So it just makes an L shape, essentially. So if you can think about it, like the if you hold up your middle finger and your thumb out, or not middle finger, your index finger, uh, the, your index finger would be pointing north and then east west would be your, uh, your thumb. And then the closed loop would just be like a circle or a square or whatever. Right. So they say that the Mickelson interferometer, uh, is, is supposed to measure linear motion, but, but you can't do it because of relativity theory, right? Cause relativity is true, but the closed loop circuit is a magical device and it detects rotation, right? So, so they allow for the phase difference on a closed loop circuit, but when the but when they have the uh, the one that's at a single right angle, they're like that one's for linear, and this is like a big part of of, of separating those two to like in maintaining the lie. But what Wang showed with his with his measurements is that it doesn't matter the configuration of the of the light signal. So it can be at a single right angle to itself or it could be in a closed loop, doesn't matter. It still detects translational motion, meaning, you know, a straight line directly proportional as it should. So what so what that means is uh all the measurements, so Mickelson, Miller, Hector Manera, Yuri Galev, all the boys that measured that periodicity all have first order measurements with an actual velocity component that would be associated in the same respect as if you had an aircraft, uh, you know, with an interfront with an INS system on it and it was doing a quote unquote, uh, rotation, 
you know, where they're allowed to have variation in the speed of light, they're all directly equivalent. And, uh, it doesn't matter if it's at a right angle or not, or if it's in a closed loop, they're all the same. Love it. All right. How do you guys feel about pivoting back to a little bit of, uh, Shane's model? You, you up for a little hot seat, Shane, with a John Mallon crowd? I'm resident PhD, uh, physicist, one of them. Are you asking me if I would take pleasure in talking like that? Probably not, but yeah, let's do it. It'll be a little noisy, but I got about 10 minutes before I got to start playing. I mean, we can save the day. It ain't about nothing. We, we can let John and We ain't got to, you know, disrupt. No, John had a whole room. It's not a disrupt. John had a whole room. Now he's here. Even if he has 10 minutes, let's get a quick little microwave. Uh, yeah, send it. Like, what, what was it. Send it, John. Shoot. That's what I'm saying. Oh. Oh, is it my topic? Yeah, just kind of if you can. Now uh, we got Shane here. You had a room. Oh, is Shane here? Oh, oh, what I didn't even mean? know you was here. Yeah, yeah. So what were like your oh, main good. bullet points? So Shane, was, or whatever day that was. Shane, have these guys? I, I assume these guys have brought to your attention the fact that in your quote model unquote the sun does circle around your head in Antarctica in December, right? You know that. That that I do, yeah. Yeah. And of course that's that is what happens, so your model is right. Well, that's where the observational data that drives the model says happens for sure. What it comes from is time and date dot com data, right? And actually there's a whole disparity with twilight times in the whole north and southern time. So what happens is there's a, there's a disparity in the amount of data they have south of the equator, specifically at the latitudes that you're measuring way down south. So what they do is invert the northern data by and large to replace that and just replicate it to make sure it's nice and symmetrical. And there's been observations taken from people who actually go and measure and take the, the, the elevation and, and the azimuth and they put it in their chart and they look at the latitude and they take all the different cities and they, they measure there's a longer time for twilight in the south, right? And then, then there is in the north, respective of where the sun is. So that's not a symmetry problem. And that's why the data does that. But I trust timeanddate.com data otherwise than that. And there's really no other data to tell you what the sun is doing at that latitude. So that's what the model does, for, for sure. But I wouldn't yeah. trust anything past of a 60 south latitude. Yeah, well, it sounds like we're on the same page. I think time and date. Sun calc, all those things give the right data because they're based on the heliocentric model, and that gives the right the right results. Well, it gives inverted northern data, right? Is that, you just agreed to that pretty openly. That's cool, then. Well, it's not exactly inverted. I mean, if you look at if you look at uh, time and date, you'll see that it's not exactly inverted, but it's pretty close to inverted. The only real difference is that, of course, um, when it's summer down there, the sun is closer. So, uh, you know, it's, the earth is spinning a little, it takes a little bit with less or more time in the summer. That's what the uh, analema is all about, is the fact that in, when we get closer to the sun, we, we move around it faster. It takes us, the earth has to spin more to make one solar day than it does in our summer when the earth is further away from the sun. Yeah, I'm content to let you believe in it. I'm going to tend to let you believe in all of that in whatever context yeah. you want to apply. Did you have other questions about the model? No. Well, let's see. Um, no. I mean, other than it's interesting to me, of course, that, that you didn't erase Walter's uh, commentary that points out that the light has to bend in ways that can't be explained. And you offer no explanation, I assume, for the bendy light. Of course I removed that. It's one of the first things I removed personally and then replaced with a whole bunch of well-worded text, which would uh, mimic the dynamic cause and responsibility for all the effects that I say the model was emulating. If you look closely, only the only evidence for dynamics in the original model was in the text description that Walter provided in the bottom. So, of course, I removed all of that and replaced it with the equivalent description in my cohesive model where all the components work neatly together. Did you read all of that or did, are you just like basing it on what somebody just said to you in the room? Uh, well, I should, uh, maybe what I should do is put a link to the thing that I read a couple of days ago, but I think you changed, I think the actual working of the model is exactly the same. It's just what you say about it. It's a hundred percent exactly the same with like minor tweaks. I made the azimuthal grid bigger, about half the screen to emulate 50% of the grid because you're only seeing half the sky. And that's what I argue, right? A radius of 39.59. So that's what I tried to emulate. 
and then we removed all the uh, bendy line UI interface, so you couldn't put it. That's literally all the changes. Oh no, the bendy lines. Are, we didn't. Well, no, I've, I I looked at your model just the other day. The bendy lines are definitely there. If you look at stars, if you look at the uh, any of the scripts, any of those scripts that you can run at the top, they all the intro scripts definitely all have the bendy light. Yep, you're absolutely right, and I left all that there. Walter did a nice job with the intro scripts, and he made it so custom that when you change any of that, the whole interface moves, and you have duplicate objects all over the screen. So I didn't want to fuck with that, and I left it all exactly the same, 100% true. Okay. To be clear, the bendy light was interjected by Walter to make it appear as if it doesn't work on a flat earth. Those lines don't correspond to anything in reality. Anything in reality. Can well, you no, said it only one time, John. Can do you understand that? Because I've said this several times, and it seems like you just no, no. Oh, I understand it. That, I mean, the point is, you can't get light from the sun at midnight in Antarctica when the sun is on the other side of the flat Earth. You can't get it to come in from the south except by having that light travel over your head and then bend nearly 180 degrees to come back into your eyes from the south, and that's what it does. Well, no, all it does is form a cardioid, right? Which is a nice parabolic mathematical expression of light reflecting that way. And it's essentially all you would need for that is the firmament, right? So that's what we argue. But what yeah, the model the shows the is exactly accurate, with, with except with the position of the sun on the personal azimuth of the grid. It does show it directly south, which I don't agree with, but didn't change, right? But this position of the sun at the other end of Earth, absolutely I agree with. And then the way you would see daylight at that time, also absolutely agree with, so... Well, the problem with the idea that it's some reflection off the firmament or anything else is that what happens with the sun and what Elizabeth will see is that the sun remains a half a degree circle as it moves around your head at a constant rate, never being distorted as it would be off of a curved surface, never somehow seeing a reflection, never seeing two suns, never somehow, you know, squirting off into another place, which would happen if it were reflection. It's a physical sun moving around your head, remaining the same size all day and moving at a constant rate, 33 degrees above the horizon uh, in the at noon and 13 degrees above the horizon at midnight. Um, that's pretty hard to explain with reflections because like the consistent motion, the consistent size, the lack of any, any reflective or optical artifacts. Yeah, I didn't argue any of those things, so that's cool. Like, I haven't said the sun was a reflection. I'm not arguing the position that you would see the sun. Therefore, an explanation of why I would have to see the sun where it is is not something I would need, right? You following? If I'm saying that you're not seeing the sun where it is there, you're only seeing the daylight, no sunlight, right? No direct sunlight, just daylight. Why are you trying to invoke explanations for the sun for me to explain it? Oh, that's straw man John, if you didn't know. Oh, well, that explains it. By the way, John, please let me interject real quick. Did you get a chance to watch uh, the Battle of Beams things? Since you said you were going to be the first to refute it, uh, did you get a chance? Um, you know, so, oh, you know, I, I didn't, and I don't know if that's. Did you just put the? Did you send me the link, or did you just put it in the chat that time? No, nah, I just put it in the chat. I don't. I don't I even think, have you know your what, info. I, you know what, Jose? I apologize because I do think that I opened a browser window and intended to look at it but i don't know what's happened to that if you can put send me another another send the link again or put it in the chat i will i will make a note of it so i don't lose it well you guys you got the two guys right here you got alan and chilling so no worries yeah. they'll, they'll definitely hook you up for, for sure but real quick oh, you get a alan space on it is that alan yeah. yeah okay listen you guys it's a couple minutes to downbeat so i've got to go um, we'll be at, I'll, maybe I'll see you tomorrow. I don't know if we're going to set something up tomorrow on a recording. Break a leg. That'd be great. Break a leg. Hey, I was about to say. Hey, yeah. hey, hey, hey John, I'm going to have uh, Jose send you a link to the presentation so you can have all the numbers and figures with it as well. Great. Thanks. That's why I sent the first yeah, time. It was prepare. on Space Audit. It's on YouTube, right, uh, Alan? Yes. Yep. Give me one second. I have to get the link. Uh, <laughs> I'll be out for one. Yeah, yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> well, it'd be best to send it to Liz because I think Liz has um, his information. I don't even have his information. I just put it here in the in the chat last time because I don't have his info to send it to him. So oh, you're talking about John? Yeah, I have his telephone yeah. number and his email. So, yeah, you can send it to me. Gotcha. Will do. Give me one sec.
But like people so have had two hour spaces about my model and no one has raised the contention to any of the stuff that it emulates from a flat earth perspective, how it perfectly puts the sun and, and every azimuth and elevation for every observer all over the world for, for three years of real world data. No one's arguing that it does that perfectly emulates all the star days. The biggest the biggest refutation <laughs> was was the bendy light, huh? Well, damn. Yeah, and it was so distant, like, uh, to me, it was so disingenuous when I, he kept appeal, like, saying the uh, magical dome, magical flat earth dome or vision that you carry around with you as if, and I'm like, man, that's so disingenuous. Like, how, how was any of this data ever really ever laid down? It was from people standing on the ground looking up, and that's a real thing. You do have a hemisphere of vision when you look around and you're standing on Earth, so why pretend that this actual, like, uh, mapping out of how you empirically experience this is magical somehow. You know, it's nothing magical. It's just what it is. Dude, I couldn't. I couldn't describe any other way. I was thinking like I wouldn't know how better to describe it. a half bowl, a dome, a hemisphere. I have like this. This that's what it is. That's what it looks like. Of course, that's what you'd have to model it by. And that's how literally they get the globe. They first they made the celestial sphere. They mapped the stars. And then they took the globe. They made a one for one correlation of every spot on Earth through the coordinate system. And then they were like, behold, we live on globe Earth. Just I like love that. the, uh, One, two, the dictionary definition for horizon. I think it's Merriam-Webster, Webster dictionary. The second entry, I think, is some. It pretty much says it's the place where the sky appears to meet the ground, and it says it's the intersection of this of a of the celestial sphere with a plane tangent to an observer's foot. I love that fucking definition. It right there just real. It it says that the celestial sphere is what comes down and intersects with a plane yeah. so from under your foot all the way out to the horizon 360 degrees around you is to be treated or thought of as a plane and it's intersected by the celestial sphere coming down Dude, like isn't, it, isn't it interesting the way that they describe it without telling you that it's flat right so the, the other the <laughs> right. extreme way is like they go we have a sphere of infinite radius which means a geometric description of something that curved infinitely is flat also flat so you have another description of flat angles to two stars which they wrapped up in a spherical model to get you to think well no actually you're not invoking a sphere of infinite radius with a tangent right to your feet no matter where you are for each observer to a plane no it's a sphere and you're also on a sphere what what yeah but what's the tangent a tangent is on a circle it's like okay but it's a plane <laughs> from under your foot all the way to the horizon where so the they... sphere and everything that you see in the sky comes down to Everything is based off the planar observation, and they've guised it up so well to get people to say stupid stuff on the internet that's against that, right? Every single thing that you see is exactly that, and they've gotten you to adopt a perspective that is against all of your senses and argue it to us. And the, the, the whole thing is crazy. You gotta, you gotta admire the people, though. You know, it is fucking diabolical. They're just the confidence with which they argue this nonsense stuff, and I'm like, listen, I've looked into it, and I have zero confidence in it. You're so confident, it leads me to believe that you don't know anything about it. That's the only thing I can think of. Like, like the explanations that we're offering up are so much more intuitive, so much simpler, so much more like experiential and logical. Like we're not saying anything crazy. You guys are invoking crazy shit to just <laughs> dance around the very simple, straightforward explanation. Dude, like Wizard says all the time, we always talk to the PhDs and they concede on these like minute points instantly because they know better, right? They understand kinematics can go both ways. They understand observations, right? So they don't argue which are these big sticking points. So when, when, we, you know, when Wizard would bring up the PhD, they just agree and breeze by it immediately. And that was repeated two or That's three times by two did. or three different like credential people. And then we realized, oh, that was the norm. Not these ridiculous people on the internet proclaiming to know things about how distant the star is and how a star burns helium, hydrogen, and hydrogen fuel into the heaviest minerals. And then it explodes and turns into everything you know. And you're like, oh, yeah, well, that sounds super solid. John, who was just in here when I first hit him with the, uh, who was it, uh, Luca Popish, uh, the kinematic and uh, dynamic equivalence, whatever. Uh, he quickly looked through and said, huh, no. See, now it's things like this that lets me know that you're not, you're not stupid, Jamal. You're, you're, you're just dishonest. Because, and then, like, Yikes. before that, <laughs> right, I mean, that's you're not stupid, stupid. you're just a liar. Dude, that's worse. Yeah, liar. <laughs> I'd rather yeah, you call me stupid yeah. than a liar. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of right. condescending insult dude. compliment, dude. That guy is crazy. I wish I wish you could read the paragraph and just how, like, I'm, I'm not giving it the justice that it deserves with, the, like, what he said about But, uh, you know, and he abandoned, since then, he abandoned Foucault's pendulum, all this other stupid shit that, you know, just keeps pointing at these kinematic things and pretending that the Earth's rotation is the <laughs> that we call them. 
Yeah, well, I mean, if you think about it, what Alan said about kinematics and dynamics is absolutely true. And when you apply it to the model, right, what the model emulates, the actual movement, the little dome, the stars, what it emulates is all empirical, which means it's all kinematics. It means it doesn't really matter. It could go both ways. But what differs is the dynamics and the explanations and what the original one had was a bunch of bullshit about the heliocentric model. It can only need it. Like eclipses were impossible, right? Mass attracts, like just listed all the basic stuff that they, which they proved the globe. And it didn't actually do anything in the model. So the kinematic observation-based model could go either way. The only thing that would differ is the dynamics. And my model, to be honest, has way better dynamics. And the chronology matters. Which one actually, like, like historically was the, like de laid down or derived first? It was the kinematic. The way they tell it, and, the, and it's because they do so much of this, like, wrapping in on itself sort of a thing, uh, circular explanations for shit, they would have you believe, and they often try to convince people up here that it was understanding the dynamics that allowed them to derive and figure out the kinematics and like that. Nothing could be further from the real, actual history yep. of truth. That's why yep. this. That's why the story of the discovery of Neptune is so important for them because of that order of right. events that happened, where they had the kinematic derivations first, and then they had to. They, which means that they don't have any predictions, right, based on the dynamics. So they did this whole story about Neptune, but when you look into it, there were hundreds of predictions that were made by different people. And then where they actually quote unquote found the planet, it was like three degrees off from their gravitational prediction or whatever, where they said it is, which is huge for them when they're talking about things in the sky, it's not even close. And the way that they tell the story nowadays, I think they say it's like 1% or less than 1% off on the, on the gravitational prediction. And it's like, bruh, you guys are insane. And then, and then not only that, right. The, the observation is still completely compatible with Kepler's laws, which are just based off of empirical observation. And we have uh, our history. When you go back to like Galileo, he, he was like the first person to observe Neptune and stuff. But he, but they but they say, oh, he didn't know it was a, a planet. He thought it was just a star or whatever. And it's like, bro, these motherfuckers watch the sky their entire lives. And like he, there's no way he saw that and then didn't map it out as what it is. But we're told, you know, through this, the, the way that it has to be told to make it presentable as if they discovered it through Newtonian dynamics. And then when you go out and plot back the, uh, the timeline from when they say, oh, we, we, uh, based on the, this, uh, this perturbation of, of Uranus, uh, we could tell that there had to be some gravitational anomaly off in this sector. And it's like, well, when you map all that out with what they, with, uh, Neptune's actual movement, it wouldn't even have been near Uranus to cause that. So it's not even, it's right. just a, it's just a that, complete, it's just a complete fake story. Uh, and the Eddington, what they call experiments and shit. Uh, the, um, even it's devious as fuck. Even the way I, I learned recently, they uh got the constant speed of light in a vacuum as some circular shit that has to do with what the, the fucking eclipse on Saturn's moon or some shit like that. Yeah, they tried to verify it through uh, an observation of an eclipse of Ju one of the Jupiter's moons or something. I'm not super familiar with it, but they say that that derivation gives it's close to the vacuum speed, which comes from Maxwell's equations. Oh, so it's from a Maxwell location, and then they just kind of yeah, took it out of space. Oh. Yeah, they, yeah, they just applied. Well, that was before they had um, actual lab experiments of it, because a guy named Fazau did an experiment with a rotating cogwheel and sending a light light beam through through it, and then it would go. It would travel like I think it was like two miles, and then it would come back. And basically, if you know the rotation of the cogwheel. Um, it's going to create a pulse because it's like interrupting the light beam, you know? So you time the pulse rate over right. the distance and you can work out how fast it would have to be to create how many pulses you got over that time. And it was like very close to Maxwell's prediction. And then, and then from and that's that, before the whole spaceship, right? The, uh, that, the eclipse. I'm, I'm almost positive. That was after the eclipse, uh, the Jupiter eclipse thing. But, uh, but, uh, let's see the, the 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 speed or whatever like the estimation that they got out of that from like you know confirming Maxwell's equations in the lab turned out to be pretty accurate because that's what they use for interferometry all these predictions for velocity and stuff all of that does come from that so like they you know they nailed it so to speak yeah I mean a lot of it just sounds like a fucking miraculous this like movie like throwing a thread and just magically 
threading like a thousand needles and just like everything. <laughs> yeah. that, but this is just all, it all, it all just worked out. Yeah. yeah, yeah Jackie, every time Lingo, that their model they suck, run. they just put another band aid on the boat. Hey, look who it is. And they say this yeah, is the prediction of quick, my uh, mom. Alan, I've been jacking your your uh, lingo too, man. Your uh, dynamics and logic. <laughs> Direct results of Alan. I've been jacking nice. Alan. We've all we've adopted a dialect of just uh, the most like the stupidest terms we just say all the time, and then people like like say them back to us, like they heard us say them, and I'm like, no, fuck, no, 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 we we gotta stop, we gotta stop saying shit like that. Uh, Longies and laddies do the best. <laughs> Laddies and trivialize is like the most important thing to them. Like, <laughs> this guy will be reading the most formal paper. Like, yeah, so the uh, predicted yeah, auto converts to lads. <laughs> the uh, predicted laundry and laddie was. <laughs> I call it lad speak. No, so what else is going on? You, I heard you clubhouse lads were tearing it up, dude. <laughs> yeah, man. We kind of, kind of beat the app. <laughs> drop. Well, I mean, I was trying to like combine the the Flat Earth Friday group and you guys, and I heard you guys went over there, and I think the one time I fell asleep or whatever, I think you guys made an appearance, which sucks. I was, I wish I was there to do it, but I think it probably went fine. But uh, I saw a couple of people with cool Aether cosmology profile <laughs> pictures. Big ups. That's shout out to our boy right there, Corey, Corey Olis, aka Val. He is the um, master PTR creator, and we wanted to um, show our support and love for coming into our space. So, shout out to Ether Cosmology. That's so dope. You guys are awesome. Dude, y'all are chopping it up here. This is my first time to speak on Clubhouse ever. The whole crew is here. (laughs) The president. What's up? I just uh, just shot a text to Witsit, and I was like, bro, you got to hop in here. All the boys are partying. I've been pinging him in here because he actually added me here on Clubhouse because I guess he just had a profile from a while ago, but I don't know if he has his notifications on, but I figured if his boys are in here, he may want to slide yeah, yeah, yeah. through. You know, you guys know the secret <laughs> about Witsit? Like, if you want to attract him to stuff, he doesn't answer messages. You can't communicate with him. He's not going to answer the call himself. How do you do it, right? If you just go and you create a bunch of fun, like a magnet somewhere, the fun will attract you. He'll just show up. Right? It's happened to me like 12 times. I think it's not how I met him pretty much, right? If you just go do I fun it was stuff. smoke signals. <laughs> if you just go do fun shit, he'll just be attracted and show up. So I think we're having a good time here. There's a good, good chance he'll probably just show up. Or JT messaged him hey. 100 times. Either way, whatever. <laughs> hey, where, where's, my boy, uh, where's my boy Sacred? Uh, where's my boy yeah, send him yeah, a message to see if I can get him on. He typically does yeah, it. Yeah, I've been a four hour uh, clip today of Austin debating in um flat earth debate server. That's a QE server, but no one showed up. QE and Nathan didn't show up, just his like little minions repeating his talking points. Yeah, that's, that's really funny. Yo, I got to drop out and get the kids down, but I've been editing. It's going to be like an eight hour video of uh, QE and Nathan's. <laughs> it's QE's and Nathan's mainstream, but I screen recorded the whole thing. It was like 13 gigs and nine hours. So I've been <laughs> editing it. And, uh, and it has sacred, sacred popped in for the first time and had a back and forth with Nathan and like got a pretty good, pretty good sauce, pretty good build. Uh, y'all are going to love it, and I'll I'll share it around uh, hopefully tonight. But, yeah, I got to hop out, but much love, y'all. Yo, is that what started the whole thing, that Saker went in there? Or did it was Wits had already in there, and that's why Saker went in there? Well, no, so I saw was that. in there first. Yeah. And then Saker okay. joined and started just – he tried to steal that in their position, and they got really uncomfy. So they just kept <laughs> saying, like, admit you're stupid. Admit you're stupid. <laughs> that's oh, a solid argument. Stupid. It's a good position. Look who, uh, look who, look who just showed up. Wits it. Dude, no way. The What's smoke up? signal worked. I also did a rain dance. Well, I'm, uh, I got to drop out. You have fun. Uh, but yeah, yesterday I shot him a text and was like, hey, dude, they're being super gay in here. Did you know? He's like, no, I didn't even know this channel. You know, I wasn't in this channel. And he's like, I'm in there. He's like, I'm in there now. So when you watch the when you watch the video, you see him pop in as QE is like straw manning, ad homing and just like slandering him. The, like an old video of him, and then he's like, boom, and just starts speaking. It's hilarious. Dude, he, he doesn't have the same radar for fun as he does for gay, but he does have an uncanny ability to show up when people are talking shit about him. I don't know what you want to call that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll catch y'all soon. Later, JT. Also, I clipped the, uh, well, most of the thing today. 
it was uh as soon as you left they all got they all got super amped up they it seemed like they had a second wind <laughs> that yeah, happens all the time dude of course Dude, the, by the end of it, they were all like very um like sheepish and like yeah yeah maybe you're right like yeah maybe we have to you know admit that and then they, he left and they're like yeah so like what he thinks that something came from nothing <laughs> yeah 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 get him yeah <laughs> yeah like just like that right but that's all that's all Cliff I'll post it in the Aether Cosmology dude I'll. Show. I'll be honest, I have no interest in watching eight hours of that shit. I'm so, like, I respect JT so much for taking his 68 gigabyte file and down to his eight hour edit that he's going to produce for all the people who really do want to see that. Like, honestly, it's probably going to do a lot of good. You suffered a lot to go put through that, so I'm glad there's going to be a record of what the hell went down and what the actual opposition is, right? So you can maintain that retarded position, or you can be reasonable, I guess, or however you want to take that. Uh, I had to confirm it was uh, recorded before I even went in there. Nice, nice, yeah, of course. Well, this, was, was uh, this is the yeah. uh, next day. This is a four-hour uh, kind of mini-debate from today. Yeah, today. That's clutch that you pulled some of it because I didn't, I didn't. But it's funny because none of them can respond. It's, like, so funny. It's like you guys talk so reckless, and you just turn into Globers. I just say a point, and then they're like, immediately obfuscating away and interrupting. I mean, this is literally what all the Globers do. Is what, what? What? Something can come from nothing? Something from nothing? They all yeah. have a script, though. They all just follow... What's his name? Script. Yeah, that's why they're screwed. Because the script is dumb. I'm like, wow, we got, we got Flat Earthers invoking and reifying space now? Like, so you're just ballers. Oh, if it's something, what does it feel like? Does it tingle? Is it alcohol? Can I drink it? <laughs> does it have impedance? Oh, wait, yeah, it does. Dang. Okay, but no, it's still nothing, though. <laughs> Dude, the nothing, like, it's so funny because we have these way higher level conversations about Ether, but for them, I had to tailor this argument that's, like, super elementary. It's like... It was crazy to hear, uh, what's the guy, uh, is it Wein uh, Eric Weinstein? on Joe Rogan kind of hinting that, you know, it's kind of shitty that we said, okay, no ether, but then we kind of found euphemistic ways of kind of having to acknowledge it once again. So it's kind of going mainstream again, or at least sneaking its way into the right. mail. It's, 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 sneaking, it's sneaking back in there, but they have to maintain that it's not like some sort of absolute reference frame that you could use for velocity. That's how they have to sneak it in. That's what quantum Whoa. field theory is all about. Um, yeah, make, right. You can have quantum stuff, quantum foam, fluid, condensation, <laughs> vacuum, yeah, zero point energy, virtual photons, virtual photons, virtual particles, all that shit. Unless there was like a yeah. week where they were saying that ether is space time. That was funny. Right. <laughs> that ended quick. Yo, is there like a limit on how many people are, can be up here? No limit. <laughs> Not the door. No, that's the beautiful part about Clubhouse. That is pretty cool. Uh, how are Shane and Alan in here? It's not an Apple only thing anymore. Oh, there's a secret app we can get you on the PC. Hold on, I'll give us two oh, seconds. I, I popped I into care. it like I'm in not a retarded. minute. I have a <laughs> oh, Shane, Ray, because you're using an like iPhone. No, 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 you want to be on the computer, dude. Do I? The app. Oh, do you do that? Yes, do. yes, but uh, hey, what's it? Yeah. I did say that we were friends. Don't embarrass me, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm embarrassed that you have an iPhone. I thought you did have Of course it. I have an iPhone. I'm just All not right. on it. I immediately switched off it to my awesome, super-powered PC with three screens. What are you talking about? All right, fair enough. Dude. Massive. <laughs> the Apple Mac computer is still better, though. <laughs> did say, what, do you just go Glober on me? Turn right into a Glober. You start making fit, ridiculous fit, statements fit. not backed up by anything. Whatever, man. I have just... a trans Mac. <laughs> I have a it's Mac back to it. <laughs> just baseless <laughs> assertions. <laughs> Windows. What's this little red ticket here? Because you're so a red ticket means that you haven't joined the house yet. So all you would have to do is click the link up at the top and then join the house. And um, what's it? There is somebody that would like to introduce themselves to you that's currently on stage. <laughs> Liz knows me well. Hey, what's it? This is Burke. What's going on? Not much, man. Nice to meet you. I uh, heard, heard a lot about you, Liz. Liz. I, I'm, I'm Liz's uh, Glober NASA friend. Oh, interesting. Yes, yes. She she told me you guys have had some really nice conversations uh, planning for the Antarctic expedition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So you believe in like, like gay space stuff? <laughs> Every day. <laughs> in- interesting. Interesting. Yeah. It, it was it was funny uh, when uh, they were announcing the winner of the uh, golden ticket. I was like watching the video live while I was in a meeting designing a space telescope. I love the irony. You, yeah, cool. a telescope that goes up kind of high in the sky and then looks at the sky. Those are cool. Yeah, put put it on a rocket in time. It up there and it stays up. Cool. I mean, like I'm down with the detection of exoplanets, right? Based on the flickering light in the sky and a brief change in luminosity that you then speculate wildly about it actually is the detection of a planet which actually passed in front of its star at that exact second and then based on the dimensions of angular velocity plus you can get you know stellar parallax to get the distance based on the speed of light like that's that's a crazy leap of faith man well we're saying the 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 <laughs> velocity and mass ratio and then pretend you were right the whole time y'all got it I'm, I'm impressed nice nice hey bert i don't know i don't know someone just introduced me to you i don't know if i'm supposed to like give you the work or something or are we supposed to like skip off into the sunset and avoid the elephant in the room <laughs> i don't know how to... <laughs> hold hands and yeah why not right you know it'd be interesting yeah, to talk yeah. to bert about the uh axis of evil that's really because the last time <laughs> i tried to talk about the axis of evil <laughs> oh yeah bert had a... Bring it's funny. It's, well, no, I'll just go ahead and like it's funny because they've they've transitioned over the years to where now they pretend to be really confident about that conversation. When for like ten years they all just like ran away from it and pretended it didn't exist. Now they pretty unanimously because they now have like a decent amount of papers that all claim that the data was misinterpreted, and they have like some reasons as to why they think the data could be misinterpreted, um, and have like inaccurate and proper assumptions in the original interpretation. Now that that's kind of like evolved into the consensus they all have this illusory confidence about it but for like 10 years they all just put their head in the sand and ran away from it but this is what's much more it. interesting to me though and i've never got anyone to ever answer this no aerospace engineer you name it no one ever answers this which is weird but so whenever say we put a satellite up you know the satellite actually uses like geocentric physics it actually in the equations accounts for real inertial forces and in the relativistic heliocentric paradigm, there are not real inertial forces. And so why do the satellites have to account for real inertial forces if they're not really there? Because gravity is just the bending of space-time. Yeah, it's such an unfortunate death blow, you know, like... I'm sorry. not really sure you're phrasing the question correctly. I think I am. I'm pretty sure. I think there's a famous physicist that kind of, you know, made notion to that, uh, Steven Weinberg. Uh, so he says, if we to adopt a frame of reference like Tycho's in which the Earth is at rest, and the distant galaxies would seem to be executing circular turns once a year, and in general relativity, this enormous motion would create forces akin to gravitation, which would act on the sun, planets, and give them the motions of the Tychonic theory. So what's in motion? Is it the sky or the earth? What am I supposed to click on to make the ticket go away? So if you go up to the top of the house um, where it says Flat Earth Gang and literally just join the house and then the and then you'd have to. Oh, wait, wait, guys, isn't this the annoying part? He has to leave and come back. Yeah. Yeah. Just refresh the room, like leave out and come back in. It should be gone. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't know. This is Jimmy. I'm sorry if that was a rhetorical question. I just wanted to answer it because it was like a matzo ball hanging out there. Yo, Clubhouse is actually pretty lit. It's like way smoother UI. Yeah, yep. Simple. It's a lot of uh, simpler, yeah, simpler UI and way smoother, yes. Way and smoother. I used to be on here with uh, Los a lot. King Los. King, King Los? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, used to, I used to pop up. That's, that's the only reason I even have this app. I used to pop up. And it's, oh, it's like way smoother now. Yeah, King Los is pretty basic. So, you know. He knows about Flat Earth big time. You guys are pretty lit. This is base. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> anyway, me, me and him would just like casually flat the whole room and people would get so triggered. Yo, where did the NASA dude go? I think you just loosely referenced the formula, which would include the inertial forces required for things to remain in space or whatever, or in uh-huh. satellites. And he was like, I don't know what that is. Is that what happened? Uh, I said I phrased it wrong without any substance which is, specificity. Which, which was, seems like a nice way to cover up. I don't know exactly what you just said. I think. Well, well, if you're talking about uh, geocentric frames that works very well for low Earth satellites um, in Leo because 
you're right next to the Earth. But if you're doing something like um, going out to the L2 halo orbit, uh, like for James Webb, Oh, you're definitely using more than geocentric. You have to use the whole solar system because at that point you're balancing the gravity Wait, why, and why, the gravitational of the... forces of the sun and the earth. Right? Yeah, which part of the solar system is it exactly that you can't incorporate into a geocentric position? Well, if you, if you leave um, just orbiting earth. Yeah, yeah this is incorrect, so... Uh, even when I mean, if, you're in Le- if you're in Leo, I'll you teach don't you about that. what you think yeah. you're doing, I guess. So even when they send satellites out into deep space, quote unquote, right? They actually still use the geocentric coordinate system, and only occasionally do they then transform it over to the solar barycentric coordinate system. But it's actually still all originally done from a geocentric coordinate system. This is because there's not only a kinematic but also a dynamic equivalence. This is all actually obfuscation away from well, that- the primary point, which is that you have to account for real inertial forces. And there are not real inertial forces in a relativistic heliocentric framework. Specifically, those real inertial forces are centrifugal force, Coriolis force, and Euler forces. And they are treated as real inertial forces in the equations, (laughs) which cannot be the case if relativity is correct. It also accounts for a change in velocity relative to the center of the ECI once the ECEF is transformed over to the ECI, but there cannot be a change of velocity according to relativity either nor can there be a change in direction okay i get i get it that you got the script but i'm trying no, to no, no, that was on the top of the head and very accurate i was going to corroborate that i was following along until you interrupted no yeah, all, I mean, all i'm saying go, all i'm saying is this know. simple point if, if you're trying to dismiss satellite launches rocket launches um by wait, stating wait. equivalency wait. that's that's fine but rocket you know you can still watch a rocket launch like the one on saturday morning um, yeah, no, I've they, watched they, they tracked it. They Florida. tracked it the whole time. You know, you can see it go up, you can see it go back down, you can see how high it went. Um, no, I, I've literally watched them, tracked them, and recorded them in infrared and, and regular cameras. And I live in Florida. Sure, that's you fine. You see them go and, back down into the ocean. Yeah. Well, so what's you're the seeing point, it going. Though, right you said here. I'm trying to dismiss. <laughs> you said I'm trying to dismiss the rock. No, I'm absorbing them, taking them from you, no, telling well, them that well, you don't get to right, have and, them. And, and every time you mention them, them you're back making under... our position stronger. Well, yeah, you think so. That's that's fine. But, um, well, you interesting. may disagree, but what I'm saying disagree is that with is, specificity, man? I can, I, can, I can be very specific. Uh, the James Webb launch uh, was was a uh, or, L2 Hello Orbit insertion, and the launch from uh, leaving Earth's orbit had two correction burns, uh, which were very minor because the uh, uh, the Ariane 5 rocket did such a good job they didn't do, have to do much correction. But that uses, uh, you know, whether you call it equivalency or not, the point is it has to account for and it's calculated by using uh, the heliocentric gravity of the bodies in the solar system. Now, if you say, okay, well, it's, oh, it's yeah. maybe from a geocentric frame that they do it, it doesn't matter, you're right, because mathematically it's equivalent. You're but the fact is, they're still using, they're dynamic. actually still using gravity. Like if you look at how the L2 ha- um, halo orbit works, uh, you absolutely have to use the uh, Earth and Sun gravity to, okay, to gravity, make that work. Okay, gravity. We get it. Okay, you are conflating kinematics and dynamics. You think that my argument is mm, that not really. you literally are. You think that my argument is that there's a kinematic equivalence. Right. So what you're trying to say is, sure, we can use an ECF on the Earth or close to the Earth because there's a kinematic equivalence. And for convenience sake, we use that. But no, there's a kinematic and dynamic equivalence. So what gravity is it exactly that you're using? And please explain to me why it's exclusive to a heliocentric model. Uh, So everything that moves in the solar system is... uh mapped by a heliocentric gravity based model like the uh, comet uh, 2023-A3 that we we see in the evening here uh that didn't, that's in my PTR that was a photograph from last night it's it's position uh the uh, direction of its tail etc all matches up with the heliocentric model of uh the solar wind blowing uh you know ice and gas off gas off of the comet in that direction and that no, wasn't it, predicted it was by any a- ancients there's no like table that anyone looked up they spotted it they plotted it in 3d um, orbiting they calculated its trajectory um last year and said this is where it's going to be and voila there it is yeah yeah i'm not sure how you can explain that otherwise 
Oh, that was a, that was a red herring fallacy. Real fast. Can, can no, I turn off notif? Yeah, it is. Can I can I turn off notifications, man? Like, well, I don't want to see every time someone sends me a message or something. <laughs> it's like his name, dude. Is you can't have that. that. Wait, talk about real fast. Pause on the oh, yeah, that's... way I can efficiently ignore DMs, please. No, I, I think that's one of the cumbersome features. I don't okay. think there's a way. God, no, no, God, 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 and then from there, you can disable uh, personal notifications from the app. So when somebody sends you a DM, it won't pop up on the top part of your screen. Wait, wait where are app settings? Where is that? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I'm not an, iPhone, I'm not an iPhone user because I'm not gay. Oh, that's unfortunate. But it's so talking about internal. internal you know, like, everything uh, should pop up right there. Or you yeah, don't cool. just okay. move the screen down for the room oh, and shit. everything should be right there. Sorry, I just felt like we were at the set. border or something, dude. You know, like all these unwelcomed notifications just keep popping up on me. Okay, um, Bert, bro, here's the deal, my guy. All right. Yeah, bro. So I asked you what gravity, and then you started talking about comets and ice, space ice. Like, bro, what gravity specifically are you invoking, and why is that gravity that you are invoking exclusive? to a heliocentric model you then basically asserted that they bro. all bro bro chill that you then baselessly asserted that they quote all use heliocentric gravity I'm, I'm unfamiliar with heliocentric gravity maybe you can tell me what that is but what gravity are you using and why is it exclusive to heliocentrism okay that's a good question um so what i meant by the uh comets which are made of uh have a lot of ice and such when they get close to the sun uh, the solar wind blows that uh, gas off of it, and it's illuminated by the sunlight, and we see that as a comet tail. That has a very, very specific geometry um, of the orbit of the comet within the solar system. Uh, it's positioned to the sun and solar wind in which direction that tail is going to blow. And like I said, when this comet was discovered last year, they saw it, they tracked it for a little while, they plotted its orbit, last year and said, this is where it's going to be in the sky. This is the direction that the tail is going to be blowing. And it matches up with the 3D model of the uh, solar system. The gravity I'm referring to is simply gravity. Um, I, no I, just said, gravity. I just said I, I, heliocentric gravity. That's not a term that's I was making up. I was just saying gravity as it plays out within the heliocentric which solar gravity, system. Man? Which gravity, man? So I'm, I'm just referring to gravity. So That doesn't make um, any sense. Hold, hold on. Well, it, I mean, it does. But I mean, like when I said, you know, you, you didn't answer me about how they predicted the position, shape, and of the tail yeah, and, and right such last that. year. Last year, you, you just said that's a red herring. And I, so I assume that means you don't have an answer. No, it's, it, what it means is um, I could – trail you along with your red herring fallacy, thus giving you exactly what you want, which is an out from the fact that you don't know what you're talking about. But I'm not going to do that because there is, you can't just you can't just say just gravity. Okay, so let's just fast forward. The, uh, the, the gravity it's equation. Either Newtonian gravity or Einsteinian gravity. Which gravity uh, is it that you're talking about? So Newtonian is simply a refinement of, of – I'm sorry, Einstein's gravity is simply a refinement of Newtonian when the speeds get very high uh, for the correct. speed of a comet. You could use you could use uh, Newtonian and it would work. Uh, okay, you know, so like, so like, you know, the speed of Mercury, it was like, you know, Newtonian uh, gravity was like, why isn't that quite working? Then they applied Einstein's equations and like, oh, there it is. It, it matches. It doesn't match actually. So I first – Oh, it actually I, does. Okay. It doesn't though, so it was actually okay. Uh, but it does though. And you want to bet fifty grand? You want to? <laughs> I like how you jump right from the no more ten grand went to fifty now, dude. <laughs> fifty grand. Fifty thousand dollar pyramid. Step right yeah, up. So, well, no, that's because ten thousand dollar bets get paid to us, so that's why it's up to fifty now. Yeah, like, I actually <laughs> want to take your money. It's just the point that like, you guys say stuff with such illusory confidence. Objectively, the perihelion shift of Mercury does not work in relativity it's closer than newtonian gravity but it still doesn't work and there's actually been numerous different solutions proposed one of them is the kerr metric which assumes a massless path another one is that there must be another body outside of it affecting mercury and just an imaginary planet is used they use a massless path they use imaginary numbers in equations seven and eight in the kerr metric there's different variations of the kerr metric where they actually fluctuate the solar radiation of the sun they change the charge of the sun they say mm -hmm. change the size well, these are all the subjective facts that, that anyone so can google 
Google, anyone can Google this, and you are repeating Wikipedia talking points. Is this like the standard to work in NASA? Just just repeat Wikipedia talking uh, points. I really don't read Wikipedia either. <laughs> so um, so what do you think of the fact that uh, you know the heliocentric model and using you know uh, Einstein or Newtonian gravities? Uh, works so well in predicting uh, the positions every, of everything in this uh, okay, celestial sphere. Sure, 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 but you can see how this conversation has very quickly got away from the original point. For example, right there, you made a claim that wasn't true. You claimed that, oh, but the, because the speed of Mercury as if it was close to the speed of light or something. Because first you said, no, I no didn't you, say that. Sa you said that Einsteinian gravity was just a refinement of Newtonian gravity, and it's only utilized as basically different whenever it's closer to the speed I, of light. I said, when you said like, for fast, example, I whenever there's the, the speed, speed of, of Mercury. Light. For example, like whenever there's the speed of Mercury, which is, of course, nowhere close to the speed of light. But, of course, you contradicted which yourself. I did not you said say. it was just a refinement when it's not just a refinement because they have two mathematical outputs that are different. But it doesn't even matter because you were wrong because actually the Mercury. Uh, with it, with it, you misrepresented I what I said. I have to talk this fast because you keep interrupting but, me. The Mercury. No, you're right, but, you, but you're misstating what I said. I did not say Mercury goes Mercury. near the speed of light. Bert. I did not say that. I said, bro, for, one at a time. Things bro. that go slow, when you're applying uh, Einstein's equations, they look exactly like Newtonian equations. That's okay, what that's don't. what my Actually, point was. Please stop interrupting me. I can, when when things go light. slow, they do. I can speak at the speed of light. I'd prefer not to. So yeah, I mean you can. That's okay. I mean, I'm, look, I didn't really even come here to argue. Just saying, hey. I know that's why I'm trying to keep it cool and just say, look, I'm so unfortunately you're incorrect. So Mercury's perihelion shift was observed decades before Einstein even proposed his theory. It was actually one of the problems that were known about. You just presented it as though they look, oh, well, then they applied relativity, boom, it works. No, it was already observed. They tried to make it work. It didn't work. I gave you specific examples of the solutions proposed to try to make it work, and one of them is the Kerr metric. Instead of conceding and acknowledging that you were wrong, you changed the subject. You did the same thing whenever you brought up, quote, unquote, heliocentric gravity, and you said just gravity as if they were the same. Then you made the fallacious claim that they were the same and that they're only different at close to the speed of light. These are inaccurate because they're fundamentally different claims. For example, Newtonian gravity says no, you're that kind of twisting Newtonian, around what I say Newtonian in gravity. Case, Newtonian you gravity. You want to talk so fast. Newtonian gravity says gravity is a force. Einsteinian gravity says gravity is not a force. Einsteinian gravity says that there is no absolute uh, background or absolute space, where Newtonian dictates and necessitates absolute space. One says that there is a background medium. One says there's not. One accounts for a time variable. One does not. These are fundamentally antithetical to one another in many ways so it cannot okay, be okay so the statement that i made that for people. slow speeds that newtonian that einstein equations would match newtonian equations that that is true so i mean yes the the relative frames matter and that's the whole point of general relativity is that you are taking in relative frames into account i get all of that that doesn't really discredit the fact that these equations work really, 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 really well for predicting the observed locations of everything in the solar system and beyond. Okay, first of all, first of all, what happened was Kepler mapped out the solar system. And that's where we get Kepler's laws, which is a kinematic relationship based on radon periodicity of the planets. Empirical. Yeah, based on ellipses in 3D, yes. Radii and periodicity of the planets was mapped out kinematically in Kepler's laws. Then what happened was Newton took that he used that established relationship that had already been observed. So he didn't discover anything. It was just in the sky, and he mapped it out. Newton took that and said, okay, I have to reverse mm -hmm. engineer an equation that's going to coincide with the Kepler kinematic outline. That's all no that argument. Happened. To get okay. one of those, to get one of these Globers to be honest about the implications of that and, like, how that brings you back down, it should humble the, the position, but they just breeze past it like the chronology doesn't matter like yeah because no, I mean, the chronology what it means is that there's a lot you're, you're, you're like trying to talk earlier really it... about um the discovery of uranus uh you can read william and Catherine herschel's uh original writings on it and it wasn't at all like what was described an hour ago you mean the discovery of neptune see like i know your religion better it's weird and and neptune who discovered who discovered uranus was it how is it a validation of gravity hey yo I, I said who discovered of, Uranus. I, I don't know the name of the person who allegedly discovered Uranus. William and Catherine Herschel. Okay. Tell me how that's relevant to you supposedly verifying the exclusivity of gravity. Uh, the uh, description of, of how it played out in terms of uh, the, how it was you know, used to calculate this position and such earlier was uh, completely incorrect. You can read their original writings. 
So you didn't answer my question. So now I'm gonna now hey, I'm, now real, I'm real quick, I'm go real quick before you chop them up, because I started off on the Newton stuff. I'm gonna I'm gonna post a link to the uh, to the Royal Society archive. You can read all about the different predictions and mismatching. Anyway, continue with the chopping. Yeah, well, I'm gonna, I'm, I want to go back to what he's obfuscated away from, right? Because he, this, there's always this claim made that basically the fact that satellites exist and that we supposedly send them out into deep space. Obviously, I don't buy the story that you're sending anything out into quote unquote deep uh, yeah, space. Yeah, I, I photograph them all the time. You know, you don't photo vacuums. So, but anyway, what no, I, I photograph uh, lit up objects traveling at you know Mach 23 around the world every 90 minutes. Uh, okay, why is that exclusive to a spinning globe? Okay, how do they stay up otherwise? Okay, there you go. So you don't, it's, just, it's a fundamental issue with logic, right? You don't understand that for, for starters, falsifications in the Sure, I do. Placement, falsifications in the Yeah, because placement. to the orbital equations keep them up. That's, that's very easy. Oh, thank you for bringing up the orbital equations. Now we get to go back to the first point you obfuscated away from, which is what I was going to do anyway, which is that the actual equations utilize inertial forces. I'm now going to quote astronomer Peach, the astronomer Jared is. This is fun. I'm going to now quote the PhD astronomer Gerardus Bow. Quote, again, once more for the record, it has been shown at least six different ways this century alone that the equations and physics used by NASA to launch satellites are identical to the equations derived from a geocentric universe. Thus, if the space program is proof of anything, it proves geocentricity and disproves heliocentrism. The evidence for heliocentrism is even weaker than the evidence for evolution. And anyway, specifically what he's referencing is that your equations use real inertial forces, and those specifically are centrifugal Coriolis and Euler forces, which cannot be real mm -hmm. inertial forces according to relativity. Okay, now would you like quotes from 10,000 engineers who actually launch satellites and rockets? I couldn't care less about your appeal to consensus but, but you do appeal care about to the authority one because I didn't appeal to his authority. I appeal to the actual evidence that you've been avoiding since the beginning, which is that the equations use real inertial forces. That's, that's fine, but the point is that the gravity equation applied to Kepler's laws resulting in Newtonian and or Einstein uh, equations work perfectly in predicting everything in the sky. Okay, well, yeah, they work perfectly on a geocentric model. You can you can say that, but I can then say well, equivalency is also heliocentric because if you take into account the gravity of the bodies, then they are orbiting uh, each other's uh, centers of gravities, and every ephemeris that is used in every uh, solar or stellarium or any other program, including uh, uh, Shane's lifted uh, flat Earth model, um, they all use those same uh, ephemeris that are all based on gravity and uh, orbits. Uh, going back to Kepler's law and Newton's dynamics. I no, just explained how that all yeah. works on a geocentric model. So one of the papers that break down the math of this in the Newtonian framework is the Newtonian mocking analysis of the Neo-Tychonian model of planetary motions by Luca Popov, and that was published by the European Journal of Physics. There's also a relational mechanics by Andrea Cease, where he actually uses a Lorentz magnetic force. This goes back to the mocking principle where he came along in like the 1800s and said, look, all these people that believe in Newton, they overlooked a major portion, which is that Newton actually assumed that the sun was in the center of the entire universe. We now have developed telescopes that have seen much further than that. We know it's not true. That means that the combined mass and angular momentum of the rest of the universe would actually strongly overpower the gravitational effect of the sun, and that's actually me yielding the unverifiable and unfalsifiable size claim to give you the gravity of the sun, which you don't actually get in reality, and that if all this angular momentum of additional mass was taken into account, then actually you could have the center of mass be where the Earth is and the entire universe would move around it. He was then mocked and ridiculed until later Einstein had to concede that he was correct, wrote him a letter as an apology and said, not only is your mocking principle correct, I must concede it and integrate the principle into my theory of relativity for me to even put it forward. Now, acknowledging that Machian principle, you can show a dynamic equivalence with the geocentric model using Newtonian or Einsteinian physics. So that means nothing to do with gra nothing to do with grab. Okay, incorrect. No, -uh, you does keep it somehow there. correct? Hey, buddy, buddy. Let's I know you're trying. I know. You're, I know you're like, Quiet. oh man, this NASA guy is getting sliced up. I need to jump in. Shh. I haven't yeah, gotten money. Give him a minute to land. Then you can respond, Lucas. Just let him. Let him land, y'all. Think to this. He only ever did the analysis for Mars. There's no demonstration that it would ever work for the other planets. Um, the claim that 
it and works at all requires the invocation of forces that he invented for the purposes of special pleading that are invalidated by the fact that the very principles that he invoked violate the law of non-contradiction by requiring two different forms of relative and absolute motion that are incongruous with one another. And I posted a paper to that effect. Mort, how are you going to show up here after Flat Earth Friday with a four-hour conversation on this exact after thing everything. when you couldn't answer simple yes or no questions about it when it came down to the dynamics of it? And you know that if all you explain is Mars, it'll apply to everything else because it's just ratios of the other masses and stuff. So you you coming in here to say that is retarded and dishonest. And that's why nobody <laughs> likes you, bro. Anyway, continue. And you did well, that well, just to, say, you that to try so to save the will, other guy because you know the yes, other guy's not going to be able to analysis. Analysis. And the choice yes. of Mars, the choice of Mars is not arbitrary. The choice of Mars was chosen specifically because it, the actual orbit of Mars itself has nice properties. And the, the, the very fact that the discovery of Neptune... What are the nice properties? What are the nice properties? The <laughs> nice properties. What, 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 what are the nice they're, properties? They're kind and sweet. They're Even kind and sweet. No, 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 no. Stop, stop yeah. for a second. What, what are the nice properties? Well, well, for one thing, it's not in the strong gravitational field of the sun causing the perihelion precession of Mercury. What? Yes. Okay, buddy, the Mercury perihelion shift is a problem for any of the gravities. What this is showing is the Newtonian equivalence. So you don't seem to understand any of this. Do you want to 4X the bet? No, I'm not interested in making any of the bets. What I'm yeah. saying is that, <laughs> that – so, so is the claim now that there's a, a Newtonian solution for the orbit of Mercury or no? That is, pre that is predictive and uh, gives the correct results? Yeah, you can uh, use no, Paul, you can use Paul Gerber's equation if you really wanted to. Yeah, you can use a corrective solution after the fact, but the entire point was that there was a dynamic equivalence with there the, But now you're trying to hold us hold the geocentric model to a higher standard than the heliocentric model because you don't no, seem to no, know what the word I, I equivalence want, means. Want, uh, that's a you problem. But Bert was just getting sliced up and has no idea what he's talking about. But he actually no, works. He at wasn't. NASA. He wasn't. What he was saying is. <laughs> He's just not familiar with your brand of deception. That's that's the problem. So well, he also threw slander yeah, about the model, ways. right? But we started with the model. He missed that whole thing because you brought up the like, you were like, oh, it's based on heliocentric. Absolutely not, right? Even in the original model, only loosely referenced the JPL, which is the only heliocentric effect, right? Which they build, and that is only referenced loosely in the derivation of the constants, which we all know for the constants of G, is just based on the measurement of torsion, right? And then they infer it from a density. So. All of that is not definitely not specific to mm -hmm. either model. And yet case. still things fall so, to the ground. Well, and that's a different argument. I'm just addressing the, the ridiculous stuff that you said about yet the model and how it worked, right? things fall so. to the ground. So you made a specific claim about the ephemeris. He just destroyed it. And your response was, yet still things fall to the ground. No, because he fair. goes, well, there's only one ephemeris. This is JPL. No, there's not. There's, there, there's lots of refinements the to it. That's I actually worked with one of the guys who does the that's modeling of the moon and such. And... Uh, they, you know, the predictions, like people say, oh, well, all the eclipse equ the predictions, that's just based on the uh, solar cycles. And it's like, no, because until Halley actually used um, more, uh, do you want to educate your body? Should I? It, no, no one ever, no one ever knew exactly when and where an eclipse was happening. And then he did the one that went through London. He was what uh, four minutes off and twenty miles off or something, what is this and then the next one that came through, he was like you know a, a minute off, and and of course now you can predict the uh, eclipses down literally to the sub second anywhere on Earth using guess what, the heliocentric model. Red herring and that not a red herring. And so what's your what's your answer as to why the heliocentric model works for predicting eclipses wait, down wait, wait, which, everywhere which on Earth? Attribute, watch this. Which exclusive attribute of the heliocentric model specifically was used to refine that prediction? So this is too the, easy now. The, the, the exact shape of the moon, the exact shape of the Earth, the altitude. So on the lunar discs, he says. <laughs> So none of that's exclusive to heliocentrism. Yeah. Try again. Let him, let him finish, so Alice. When I say heliocentrism, what I'm referring to is masses orbiting each other. Okay? So using <laughs> equations for masses orbiting each other, spinning masses that have oblicity. Uh, did I say that right? They're oblate spheroids. Obliquity. Um, and that actually have terrain. The terrain of the moon has been mapped out. You can actually predict 
depending on where you are, exactly what the Bailey's beads will look like uh, as the uh, eclipse begins and ends. You can't do that. So what's, what's your explanation of how that works if not uh, orbiting masses of oblate spheroids with terrain? Okay, so first of all, nothing you said was exclusive to heliocentrism. So you don't seem to know what that question means. Okay, drop the heliocentric thing. What I'm referring to well, is orbiting bodies of masses. I don't know. But yeah, but that's not actually included of, of any of the, in any yeah, of the eclipse. Specific terrains. Yo, yo, settle down a sec, Bert. What were you saying, Shane? It's not and actually in, included in any of the eclipse data. So, right, so, the you know, all the use for the data for the quote predictions is actually right in front of me. Let's go through the columns. You can tell me which one. You, you tell me to stop which one is heliocentric exclusive. Ready? Stop. You ready? Oh, yeah. Stop. Okay, hold, hold on. Sun azimuth. Okay. So it, sun it has nothing, elevation. Hold on, hold on. There's more. Sun has, elevation. Has nothing, has well, hold on, hold on. Gamma. Hey, come on, bro. Path width. Okay. <laughs> well, come on, you ready? Which one of these is specific to a heliocentric right, so moment? Don't these are observations Yo, Bert, of the sun and the moon. Bert, stop talking. Hey. Bert, stop talking it's over him and terrain. listen to what he's. Bert. You're trying to have a conversation no, here I, with him. I, I, I get it. Stop I get it. talking over me now. Now you're hey, doing you're it to me. Stop. Hey, hold on, hold on, hold on. Everybody, everybody. This is Nomad. Yo, this is a great conversation. I can't lie. I like, it's a great back and forth. But um, I don't even need to say it because we're grown men. Uh, who is it on? Shane, Shane, finish your thoughts. Go ahead. Well, man, I think I made the point. Uh, this, this is basically all that you need to predict eclipses is observations of the sun and the moon with observed periodicity, solar, and there's a lunar periodicity. Just descriptively, it's about when the moon is at certain ecliptic and the points of its observed radii, right? It's based on this, the size of the solar and lunar disk. And then that pattern just repeats. But the data that I just went over is exactly what's That's in my, my super yeah. eclipse prediction sheet here, which is derived from all the data spun out with a little extra derived from the actual cycle with the 625 like soul a year but anyway what so, actually was was rela was was uh, going for was that all of these observations of the sun and the moon are simply are simply geocentric and that's all they are like time and date of the sun and the moon alti altitude elevation and azimuth that's it so which one of those is exclusive to your model so could you mean a whole line about eclipses I want to I want to say something. There was literally not, not, you know, oh, Omni, oh, Omni, Omni. <laughs> Wait a minute. Bert and him are talking, bro. Bert, response. Oh, well, shut up, Omni. Model. Yeah, we we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll just we'll, we definitely will keep it orderly. I um, mean, so just uh yeah. Who's it on, Bert? Go ahead, Bert. Bert, do you have a response for that? You said uh, that it was false. What 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 part Hold was false? I was walking in the house. I mean, you could also just say you actually have no idea how eclipses work, and you just repeated the stuff that everyone else knows, and I'll respect that, because most people don't go as deep as I have, so. Hey, Shane, why did you, um, why did you plagiarize uh, the eclipse guy's uh, web? Put, hey, hey, stay out, of your, stay out of the red herring fallacy lane. Like, no, no, I'm, I'm just gonna... asking a question. If you know so much about eclipses, why did you violate the terms of Mr. Eclipse's website when you plagiarized his website on yours? Do you see what I'm saying? This is the only kind of thing that they can do, right? No, no. Like, they can't debate no, the action. Yeah, they I'm always sure. have to interrupt, like he's doing right now. Like, he's just... Yeah, like, look, I, I, listen, on, bro. From, a, from a web designer back, uh, background, I can say that um, inspecting a website's code and copying, paste, copying and pasting lines of code, that's always fair game. I don't care who you are. All developers know that. We all know that. Hold on, hold on. Before you butt in. We all know yeah. that, right? Not talking about I, I, hold on, hold on. That's that's basically what happened here. Basically, like it's open, it's open source. If you can, if you can copy and paste code from my website that might be a parallax scrolling website, and use it in yours, you got the CSS and all that all connected. Then and you tweak it and make it yours or whatever or for a different purpose. Cool. It's not a big deal. I don't know no, why I'll keep repeating. What I'm specifically referring to. Don't make assumptions is that there is a portion of Shane's website relating to eclipses in which he makes false statements about NASA and Mr. Eclipse, which is directly copied from a page from Mr. Eclipse's website, which specifically says at the bottom of the page that no such use is allowed. So if wait, wait, he makes right, false then you should claims. sue him. You wait, should why? Sue him. What? wait, he makes false claims about the guy in a right. portion that he copied from the guy. So the guy had portions that there's, he there's portion made false claims about himself. Hold on, and, let Witsa finish, bro. So there's a portion of this guy's website where he slanders himself and then Shane no, stole not, it. <laughs> well, that's what you just said, right? You, you're very confused. There's two portions. 
One portion by Shane in which he falsely states things about Mr. Eclipse and NASA with no evidence, and a second portion in which he's copy and pasted a section of his website. Uh, again, that page that was copy and pasted specifically said no such use is allowed. Okay, I still guess no you should, go, you you should, should have a call him. with him and sue him. Oh, we can talk. Yeah, we're you should talk sue him, and then Friday. there's still no curvature. So, yeah, those yeah. two things. Sue him, <laughs> I mean, and then there's no Also, coverage. I linked excessively to all of Fred's stuff, his books, everything he's, <laughs> like everything he sells. I listed all of the actual data. I listed all the sources. Every link I could find that linked to him, I listed there. And went one on the source page. One of the sources, one of the tabs in the database is solely dedicated to Fred. So, I guess, make it that what you will, dude. Yeah. So uh, now that was just this is uh, this is a weird tactic anyway because uh, we were having a conversation and I just want to point out to both Shane and Alex I told them this a long time ago, I said you will never get a rebuttal to this, and I said at the beginning I said I've talked to many aerospace engineers I never get a rebuttal to this and I once again did not and it's a very simple question it's the first question I asked, which is how come when you put these satellites up according to the equations you account for real inertial forces. I even listed them specifically. Centrifugal, Coriolis, and Euler forces. Why do you account for real inertial forces in your satellite equations when according to relativity, there are not real inertial forces? Would there ever be a situation in which the weak field approximation of, of relativity to Newtonian gravity would not apply for a satellite? And that's what we get. We get red herring fouls. Yeah, right? no, that's a. If you knew anything about how relativity relates to Newtonian gravity, you know why that's a relevant question. Answer the question, yes or no. That is a red herring fallacy because okay, so you have no response. You're only dude, and he immediately has to. Bro, he's responding, bro. Relax. Yeah, because this is why it's a red herring fallacy. Is because you guys conflate the mathematical similarities of Newtonian and Einsteinian gravity with the conceptual differences, which is very ignorant. See, the saying things like it's just a refinement of the other or the equations can get the same output is literally stupid because in physics we explain how things work. In theories of physics, we explain the actual mechanics and causal mechanisms of phenomena. It isn't just about mathematical description. Science and math are different things. Science explains, math describes. Okay, Newton and Einstein had different explanations for the same phenomena. It doesn't matter if they have the same math. Cool, yeah, the math is describing the same phenomena. The conceptual differences is the problem. If you are conceptually correct in your theory of physics, which is that objects actually free fall on a linear path of the bending and warping of space-time, that there's no change of velocity, Seeing there's no real inertial forces, which is the relativistic claim, and it's required for heliocentrism post Michelson Morley. If that was true, then you wouldn't be able to actually engineer satellites and require the use of real inertial forces in those equations for them to work. That's the actual argument. It will never be rebutted. No, that's incorrect. So you're ignoring the argument that I made earlier. If you'd like to make that argument, uh, and I know that this is based on your your favorite invocation of the law of non-contradiction, if you invoke that. You must concede that Machian geocentrism falsifies itself due to its use of absolute and relative space within, within the same framework. I've posted a paper to that effect that refutes the work of Popov, um, which has never been shown to work for the dynamics of all the planets. So the, in, the idea of a dynamic equivalence is dead on arrival. Furthermore, when we're talking about the application of physics, uh, it's telling that you think that the mathematics isn't how we do the physics. That's just because when, when you do physics, you play with your little silly Van de Graaff generator. You never actually do anything of consequence. But at the end of the day, what, what matters is what happens on a day-to-day -day basis to make our, our life function. The GPS satellites that are up uh, in the sky right now, enabling global navigation and saving lives every day, only are able to be there because of people that have figured out ways to do the calculations uh, efficiently in the weak field approximation of the Earth. Um, we can use the Newtonian equations to approximate the Einsteinian ones. Therefore, there is no need to use the full Einstein equations. However, if we did, we would find the results to be the same. Therefore, your entire argument is predicated on something that is um, completely irrelevant. Um, you cannot answer the fact that in the weak field approximation of the Earth's gravity, the Einsteinian and Newtonian frameworks reduce to one another. Um, there is no functional difference, and as you get close to the sun, that is not the case, which is why Mercury's perihelion shift is evidence of relativity. Okay. Correct. So uh, I'm going to now break down all the fallacies this guy just used. Fallacies. So how the first, argument. the first. How about dude, a fucking if, argument? Why are you? Yo, dude, stop dude, talking over him, bro. Yeah, me actually elucidating the fallacy you used is an immediate refutation of your argument. That's literally what fallacies are. Okay? No, no. Fallacies so the first are... stop and no, no, no. Ah! Come on, Lucas. Lucas. 
for someone. It's wits. It's, hold on, hold on, Lucas. That's all they are. Listen Actually, again. Hold on. Once them. again, my man. Listen, we're all men here. I don't even have to say what I, you know, what you think I'm gonna say. Let's tighten up. Go ahead, wits it. Bro, he let you speak for a long time with no interruptions. I just want you to remember that. So. First of all, I pointed out that that was a red herring, and I explained why. You then responded with an overt red herring by talking about the Luca Popov paper and how you think that it uses relative and absolute space and or motions, and that's a contradiction, and that I can't invoke this argument based on the law of non-contradiction because of in-place red herring here. Talk about Luca Popov paper. You then skirt it over into the ad hom where you say, I don't actually do real physics. I just use my little generator and never do anything right literally, literally that's your first two responses was a red herring and then it was an ad hom right and then you went over and just did a baseless assertion fallacy a false cause fallacy and a stereotype fallacy you just started to repeat the very thing i refuted and then you conflated the actual newtonian and uh, einsteinian frameworks skating past the very specific point i made which i will now reiterate science explains things Math describes things, pointing out that the equations are similar once broken down in certain scenarios is literally non sequitur to the point. The point is one claims a specific type of physics. It's saying the cause of the orbit is this. This is how the orbits work. This is the causal mechanisms of them. Okay, they make contradictory claims. Specifically, Newton claims that an object will continue in a straight path unless an outside force acts upon it, and that gravity is a real force that's acting on that object, i.e. the satellite in this case, and pulling it in an actual curved path around the Earth. Einstein said, no, objects will can, can go in a straight path and a curved path at the same time, and that's what the satellite's doing because it's actually going around the Earth, but simultaneously it's free-falling in a linear path through the bending and warping of space-time, and that's its curved and linear path simultaneously. There's no real actual force required to pull it from a straight path, and there is no actual force coming from gravity itself. So therefore, there is no change in direction allowed, there is no variance in propagation of light allowed, and there is no real inertial force is allowed. So back to the point, right? If you have to use real inertial forces in your equations for the satellites, but relativity does not allow them, how is that not a direct refutation of one of the two? Either the claim the satellites are actually up there using that physics, or that relativity is the accurate portrayal of said physics. It literally cannot be both of them. Okay, so can you demonstrate that the Einstein field equations do not work for the orbits of those satellites? Or the okay. Einstein framework doesn't work? For, for one... Because that would be the contingent claim, right? It, for your claim to be true, it would have to be the case that, this, that these inertial forces are the only way to model these motions. And it's not just simply a convenience that we use the simpler framework and the weak field approximation of relativity, which is the, the, the actual reality of the situation. If you're claiming that you can shoot a satellite up accounting for relativistic physics, you would have the burden of proof of that because the actual claim made from the side that you're invoking as evidence of your claim, right, uses <laughs> Newtonian inertial forces. I don't have a burden of proof here. You're claiming, the guy originally claimed, that like verification of the mainstream model and of gravity are the satellites that orbit around the Earth. And I pointed out the actual equations used for those very satellites he's invoking by the very agency he works for and he's invoking uses real inertial forces, which is incompatible with relativity. So until you can actually provide evidence otherwise, I have no burden of proof. I have directly refuted your claim, though, because there are not real inertial forces in relativity. So that means that what you're claiming is happening literally can't be happening. Except for the fact that we know that Newtonian physics is a first approximation to the Einstein field equations in general relativity, as stated within the work of Einstein himself, which is the piece that you're ignoring. So your entire argument is an affirmative claim that hinges on you demonstrating that you cannot use the Einstein field equations, and therefore the Newtonian framework is the only correct one. Maybe I'll put this in really simple terms for you, okay? If I put a satellite up above the Earth, and I engineer it in such a way that I am accounting for an actual force acting on that satellite that is inertial, specifically centrifugal forces and Coriolis forces. 
if I'm actually accounting for those real inertial forces, so the only way I can put my satellite up is to treat them as though what's going to allow them to move in their orbital path is that a real set of forces are going to act on it, and I account for what those forces will do to it to then obtain that orbital path. If, I'm actually if those forces aren't actually there, and it's not actually real, I wouldn't be able to then put the satellites up with the assumption they are real, would I? Well, that's the that's the assumption that you're making. You're again making an affirmative claim that the engineering of those satellites, uh, as per your affirmative statement, relies only on the Newtonian framework and, and real inertial forces. Can you demonstrate that? Yeah, of course. I can just show you all the equations used. Show it's me. publicly available for NASA. No, no, but, but so you, this has devolved into you have no, you have no actual rebuttal to what I said, and it's obvious you have no rebuttal. And I I just put it in elementary terms, which is that no, obviously if you're accounting for now this is the major kicker here, uh, the real inertial forces are expected in a geocentric position. So now this is a dynamic exclusivity. For geocentrism, no, no, satellites have completely I, backfired on the heliocentrist no, because no. in a in a geocentric model, you would have the universe rotating around the Earth, and that would generate real inertial forces because of the with, angular with momentum fixed, of all of the masses. That would give you – stop interrupting me. That would give you centrifugal forces, which is very easy to understand in simple terms. If I tied a ball to a string and spun it around, the ball has a tendency to move out away from the circle I'm spinning it in. That centrifugal force. Then we'd also have a Coriolis force, not to be confused with the fictitious apparent deflection that the globe model claims, but Coriolis force is a real actual physical thing that's actually going to result in a radially inward accelerative force. It's twice the magnitude of the centrifugal force, which means it would be a net inward force, which would actually then press a force inward, allowing an object to perpetually move around a stationary Earth. The fact that they actually account for that very set of forces when the Einsteinian framework of the GLOBE model says that those do not exist and are not there is a win for a geocentric model. Well, okay, there's a couple things that are tied up there. You have to invoke physics, as Popov did in his paper, and has been demonstrated by the paper that I provided in the chat, and you will not be able to provide sources to the contrary. Invoke, in, invoke a framework that is self-contradictory in its very nature, relying on an invocation of both absolute and relative accelerations, and inventing physics that doesn't exist to explain something that is just based on special pleading. That's the essence of geocentric dynamics. When you have heliocentric dynamics, no such special pleading is required. You would like to believe that it is impossible to generate the equations of motion with an Einsteinian framework. You're claiming an exclusivity to the Newtonian real inertial forces framework, and you're claiming that based on equations which you have yet to provide. Can you first provide those equations and demonstrate exclusivity, and then we can talk about the geocentric framework? Uh, yeah, sure. I can go get the equations in just a second. I'm, I'm on my phone. But what's funny, though, is just to reiterate for the room, because I was actually going to come in here to talk to this guy. You owe me like two stacks. Okay. Until I get my money, I'm not going to let you just like basically conversation rate me wherever I go on the internet. Stop interrupting me. You owe me two stacks, buddy. I told you I'll take 1777 as a lump sum payment. Okay. But the point here is actually that you can't rebut it. And the, your side is the side that invokes this claim as evidence. In fact, the NASA guy who you white knighted for, and I guess has left now, I think, which is who I wanted to actually point out. I wanted to create, I wanted to destroy this illusion that when people work at NASA, they're just so smart and know all this stuff for a fact. It's never the case. I've Stop, stop, dude. I'm trying to get my thing off here. Can you chill? So I've talked to many, many NASA employees, including some in person and debated them in person on live streams at actual NASA rocket launches. They almost never can wait, answer wait, wait. these simple uh -huh. questions. Stop interrupting me. What yes, is it's, that? It's, it's, it, a couple, that? A couple years ago, it's live streamed on my channel. Okay. okay. All right, cool. Now, it's actually my backup channel because I was censored at the time. So the point that I'm making here is that it is your side that invokes this as evidence. Right? People say that the satellites prove that the Earth is a tilted, wobbling, spinning globe orbiting around the sun. 
Correct. Because and that's did. what the NASA employee just did. And then I asked him how specifically. Then he thought that he was just going to concede with a kinematic. Then he deflected, deflected over to this claim of dynamic exclusivity in deep space, right? And I was making the point that no, actually, if you actually look at it, the if, if I were to grant that rockets take satellites up and then they move around the Earth perpetually, right? The actual equations that those uh, engineers use. They use a set of real inertial forces, which is what would be expected with a stationary Earth in a rotating universe. And let me say this one last thing simply for the room, because there's people in here that maybe actually want to know the truth and what I'm saying. I don't want to lose them. It's really simple, bro. <laughs> if the Earth, is, let me say this one thing, please. If the Earth is actually stationary, right, and everything is moving around it, just think about that. Think of it like if you've ever been out and look at the sky without light pollution, it's like insane, right? How big it is, how many stars are. Imagine all of that physically spinning around the Earth. That's going to generate a ton of forces, like an actual, no, a real actual force, right? And if you put a satellite up in it, it would be affected by those forces. So from a geocentric position, we would absolutely expect, I would even say require, real inertial forces. It is very interesting that these satellite equations use the real inertial forces. All of them do. All of them do. There are no satellites around the Earth that don't use these real inertial about, forces in the equations. The what about the planets orbiting the sun? Um, wouldn't Red it be, herring. Wouldn't it, no, it's not. Wouldn't it be contingent on your point? that all orbiting bodies of the sun would have to obey rather than be orbiting the sun, they would have to be geocentric and obey this claimed exclusivity. I can show you a paper. I have it on my, on my computer and I'll actually post it. Um, that shows a full derivation of all of the orbits of all of the bodies of the solar system using the Einstein field equations, demonstrating that there is no exclusivity between the Newtonian and the Einsteinian framework as you'd like to believe, and that's purely because of the fact that what they're doing when they create the ephemeris and the ECI frame, which is I think what you're referring to, it's a mathematical convenience to make things easier for the purposes of actually making the satellite program work and simplifying the calculations. Now, what you need to demonstrate is an affirmative claim that that's not the case, and that it only works with these real inertial forces, and it will not work with the Einsteinian version. You said but I need to substantiate an affirmative claim that it will not work? Yes, you are making that's a contradiction. Claim. Affirmative claim that something will not work? Yes, you are making that's an not an affirmative claim. claim. Of exclusivity. That's not an affirmative claim. claim of exclusivity. Okay, it, what it I is. Actually, no, it's not. It what is. I actually, no, it's not. But what I actually did, right? <laughs> This is very simple, bro, is I'm pointing out that the actual equations used. So let, I'm going to recap it one more time very concisely because I'm not going to keep going in circles with you where you want to ignore it. The I'm your a, side invoked this. Correctly. Your side invoked this phenomena as exclusive evidence. I rebutted that claim. That means there was a positive claim made that we shoot satellites into space with rockets that then move around the Earth using gravity and that that can only work in the heliocentric globe model. That was the positive claim. I then corrected that claim and said, no, actually. If I grant you that that phenomena is real, the actual equations for your claim use inertial forces and relativity says that those do not exist you're now trying to shift the burden of proof you're also is cons consistently using red herring fallacies to obfuscate away from the fallacy. specific point so so if this were the case it would have to if it is a geocentric position there is no reason to accept a heliocentric version of the orbits working for any of the celestial bodies it would have to be the case of that that there would be exclusivity for all of them, whether it's a neo Tychonian or Ptolemaic model is uh, will just change the uh, the exact equations of dynamics, um, and all of those will be based on fantasy physics, which you have not been able to rebut. Um, the paper that I've provided, I'm the only one that's provided a paper so far in this discussion, and it explicitly refutes the Neomachian claims um, as being in violation of the law of non contradiction, which is the entire basis of your argument. Therefore, you can't have it both ways. If you want to argue based on the law of non-contradiction and exclusivity, you must admit that Neomachian analysis is false. The other thing that you are gonna run into here though is that you are making an exclusive claim. You're making an exclusive claim of 
you're making a, a claim of exclusivity and that it will not work with the relativistic version, that it only works with real inertial forces. I have falsified that by demonstrating, and I will post the paper to this effect, a full solution to the heliocentric model using the Einstein field equations and using the Einsteinian framework. We can apply that easily to the satellites. The reason we don't is because there's no reason to, because they will be identical in the weak field approximation of the Earth. You have not been able to rebut that either, the specific point of the weak field approximation. I literally have rebutted it three times. No, you haven't. Um, what was my rebuttal? What was my rebuttal? The, the last point is that all of the geocentric dynamics are are based on imaginary physics. You want to believe that they're created by the rotation of the universe. Um, no such forces exist. No such forces are measurable. There's no real effect that has ever been proposed that can be derived from effects in the lab and then uh, scaled up to the universe. It is purely special pleading. Um, and, then, and then in a final point, all of this requires a spherical Earth and falsifies any sort of flat geocentric model. There is no kinematic equivalence between a spherical and flat Earth model. Okay, see, and this is what now you're just scatter gunning different claims and you're just finishing off with baseless assertions. You're just baselessly nope, assert stuff. Nope, you're immediately nope. interrupting me. That one later. So. He's right that your model Yo, is a global. Mute. Oh, oh hold boys. On. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, for real. Um, yeah, so right now it's what's it? Yeah, what's it? One mic on what's it? Yeah, real right, real fast. I got a question. So, like, when he's saying he's po posting stuff and stuff, are we, can we post PDFs here? And what, what does posting stuff mean? Like, like, in the chat so button. we're talking about in the chat he dropped basically. a link in the chat he was talking about the paper oh, so like a pdf you drop a, a link to the pdf you can't drop like actual files or anything you can dm it's me on discord i i dm okay. you i'm trying to get I was, your I was just curious i was just curious in general because i actually do like this platform quite a bit all right anyway um i'm just gonna say it again right and this is the thing that we always run into okay so it's like the conflation of math and science Okay, and so people always want to say that you can use either Newton or Einstein. They're the same. It doesn't matter. At certain skills, it doesn't matter. The weak field approximation on the Earth, you can just use Newtonian physics. It's simpler. That's why we use it. They're the same. It's just simpler, blah, blah. That isn't true. Okay, we're not talking about the math. We're not talking about if you can get the same solution mathematically. That is literally a red herring, and it is non sequitur. That is not what we are discussing. And you're going to say it again because they always say it because that's all that they can say. My actual position is that the physics entailed in the two claims are fundamentally in opposition. One of them says gravity is a force. That is Newton. The other says gravity is not a force. They cannot both be true. It would violate the law of non-contradiction, one of the four base principles of logic, okay? One says space is absolute and fixed. That's Newton. Einstein says absolute, space is not absolute and fixed. There are many other contradictions between the two. The actual point, okay, let's, the last one I'll name, is the orbital difference. Newton describes an orbit <clears throat> as an object moving in absolute space in a curved path and that if i throw a baseball it will continue straight unless an outside force acts upon it so the same goes for the object that's orbiting it would have just kept going straight but because gravity is a real force acting on that planet it pulls it out of the straight path and causes it to orbit the bigger body right that is newton's claim that it's an actual absolute motion of a curved path Einstein says that the object is not actually moving in a curved path. It's free-falling in a linear path through the bending and warping of space-time, and that gravity is not a force, and that no force is needed for an object to move from a straight path because it can simultaneously move in a straight path and a curved path from different reference frames. Now, setting that aside, because there's obviously way more that goes into that, very simple conclusion here. These are fundamentally in opposition. They make opposite claims. They cannot both be accurate. So if we're trying to figure out how the world really works, and is your claim of how the world really works accurate or not, then we're going to have to look at what you're claiming the cause of the phenomena in the world is. You're claiming a specific set of physics explains what happens with orbits. 
You can't claim them both at the same time because they claim that orbits are different. They claim the cause of the orbits are different. They claim that the space the orbits happen in are different, specifically opposite. Okay, so if you then respond again for a fifth time saying, well, we can just use Newtonian because the weak field approximation of Einsteinian is the same as Newtonian on a small local scale when it doesn't approach the speed of light, so we can just use it because the math is the same, it's a non sequitur and I will disengage. Okay, well, what I will do is I will, I will, I will, because you're fundamentally misunderstanding that all we are doing. We are not saying that the Einsteinian physics are incorrect and we're using the Newtonian physics because of that. We are merely using an approximation for the purposes of making our calculations when it comes to the ephemeris and the objects local to the Earth. That approximation holds for every body except Mercury, and that's only the, the only one it doesn't hold for because the weak field approximation doesn't apply. Mercury is too close to the gravity well of the sun, which causes a difference, real difference in its orbit, which is evidence that the Einsteinian framework is the correct one. You've made a baseless assertion yourself that Einstein doesn't predict that. I'd love to see a citation for that. I cannot substantiate that. When it comes to satellites, we are in the same way that we're saying that they're, that that we can use the ECI or ECEF frame in place of the heliocentric frame, despite all of the evidence that the heliocentric frame is the correct one, merely says that we are making an approximation for the purposes of getting the calculations done more efficiently. That's all it is. And if you want to invoke the law of non-contradiction, as some absolute law of reality, then you violate your own argument of Machian geocentrism, and I've provided a link to that effect. Finally, when it comes to flat Earth, you said it was a baseless assertion. It is not. The lack of a kinematically equivalent solution to the GPS constellation over a flat model, as well as the lack of a static solution to circles of equal altitude to the GPs of stars, both invalidate any sort of kinematic equivalence. And I'll just end there. Okay, so I'm, yeah, like I said, I'll, I'll disengage. I hope that what I tried to do in the last couple of responses was to make sure it was really simple so the room would understand because when a lot of these concepts that people aren't familiar with are strung together, one may, you know, kind of be like, whoa, he must be making a good point or something. He's not, though, because I, I, I predicted what he was going to say again because he can't rebut the specific argument again. And hopefully it was simple enough for people to understand. Math, is, math, ex, math describes, science explains. If the conflation of Newton gravity and Einsteinian gravity is fallacious, they're fundamentally different. But what you'll find is that they all do this all the time. And if you're looking for the truth, you might be like, wait a minute, maybe the reason that they use these other equations for these satellites is because they have to, because there is actual real inertial forces. And so that's actually my position. I'm not like uh, vehemently opposed to the idea of satellites. For example, I've seen Starlink's lots and I've seen Starlink's in the sky. I don't believe that they're as far as they are away, but I've used Starlink internet, et cetera. There are some things in the sky, right? You, you can track them, you can track the ISS, et cetera. Now, what they are, how far away they are, and how they actually uh, move around, that's a different question. And uh, upon further investigation, I find it very interesting that the physics are exclusively geocentric, like in every scenario. And the only time they ever invoke like a heliocentric set of equations is after they they actually have to transform it over to the solar berry centric coordinate system from the geocentric. And so that's pretty wild, right? And I, so the last thing I want to say, because I'm actually much more interested in like people that aren't familiar with all this kind of hearing. I don't really care about debating this guy because uh, it's exhausting and redundant. But I just want to read the equation again because it's pretty, pretty wild. This is a PhD astronomer. And he said, again, once more for the record, it's been shown at least six different ways this century alone that the equations in physics used by NASA to launch satellites are identical to the equations derived from a geocentric universe. Thus, if the space program is proof of anything, it proves geocentricity and disproves heliocentrism. He doesn't say this flippantly. It's because of what I'm explaining to you guys right now. Um, so, yeah, just, you know, food for that. I don't want to go back and forth with, I forgot your name. 
I don't want to keep going. Like we've, we've reached a standstill or an impasse because you keep saying that um, you can use both of them and it's, they're identical and they're not. And you can't use both of them. They make opposite claims in terms of physics. So, you know, agree to disagree. Like I understand that it gets taught in the classroom in this really romantic way. And then there's like smoke and mirrors. Like you said, there's stuff up there in the sky. So it's kind of like the Plato's shadows in the cave thing. So it's enough for most people that, you know, it's airtight. But it would just like on a rigid, rigorous, like logical, honest debate. I wish they could at least be forthright and just honest about the chronology. You know what I mean? About the whole kinematics and dynamics and math versus, you know, what we can actually like induce or like do the scientific method to like confirm. But they just do this really tricky sleight of hand and just conflate it all and you know so I just wish they could be honest about it sometimes it would make for better conversation yeah it's weird because I try to tell them I actually try to tell them all the time that it hurts their side for sure um, yeah because I get emails all the time and they're like dude what made me look into flat earth because I didn't want to was that every person you debate is like disingenuous <laughs> like dude i know because like concessions that they should make that don't necessarily prove or disprove either way right they, they just don't but yeah it's interesting uh we already know how the dynamic is sometimes you get these people who come in hot with this uh axe to grind personal uh obsessive behavior yeah it's lame someone said i should start especially when they owe you money them. Yeah, I was about to say, I got a couple that owe me money. It's like, I really don't want to talk to you if you're fucking making bets and don't want to pay and shit. Hey, man, yeah. I've, I've been messaging. Check your damn DMs, homie. I've been trying to get where, a hold of DMs you. DMs where again? Discord. I told you this twice already. Oh, yeah, but I forgot. Let's work it out. Already. Let's figure it out. It's no big deal. All right, all right, cool. Yeah, cash in anyway. on your algorithm. Page. Hey, guys. Hola. Happy to be back. Uh, no, yeah, and, and to the last comment, no, I don't have any personal axe to grind, and certainly not trying to do this. What was the name that you, Bert? What was the name that you, so much. Yeah, I'm, just, Bert, I'm curious about this. Did you know about the whole, like, um, did you know about the Machian principle thing that, like, Ernst Mach came around in, like, the 1800s and was like, hey, I, good? Yes, I've schooled him on this over the years, for sure. Gotcha. Because you are, because I don't speak about it, you know, almost every day. But what I do know about is that, um, you know, like uh, when, when I'm having to deal with designing something for uh, the space environment or such, or if I'm doing an Earth observing uh, system versus uh, astrophysics, something that's going to be um, pointed away from Earth and such, the perspectives and field of view projections I have to do for my optical designs are, um, you know, based on a very specific uh, point of view, um, uh, orbital, you know, what's the orbital height going to be? Uh, what's the environment going to be? What kind of uh, thermal signals are we, can, you know, dealing with? And so uh, I'm just from what I'm saying is I'm just familiar with building things, um, not with uh, you know arguing Machiavellian. Uh, I'm not even saying it right now. My um, no. you know, perspectives, and I do know that uh, you know I, I'm not I'm not an astrophysicist at all. I work with them. Uh, we do a lot of cool stuff together in terms of, um, you, know, you know, they have requirements. I design a system to meet those requirements. Um, and, you know, some of them actually, you know, make it through the proposal phase, get built and, and fly. Um, so, Bert, check this out. I am about to be on one of the biggest platforms in the world and doing a 2v2 debate. And I'm looking for, um, preferably, someone with a PhD in astrophysics, astronomy, or physics, preferably one of the first two. And I don't know how that, I don't know how your connects go. Like, can they be public? Would they be public? Whatever. But it's like a very uh, big platform. So I'm looking for Where's PhDs. He's in China. Yeah, no, I got it. Uh, we, have, we have a Yale PhD astrophysicist who frequents the room. We haven't seen him lately, but well, speaking of our PhD, isn't he back? Isn't Bert back, or did he run away after the eclipse? That's who we're talking to right now. All right, cool. I, I didn't know he was uh, back. Oh, there, there it is. I was waiting for someone to ask if I ran away. No, I was uh, just uh, busy doing other things. So then um, you found the heliocentric attribute that I listed that was, you know, exclusive to your model. Uh, uh, 
recognized that I was busy doing other things. No, you so, guys were kind of talking uh, past to, each other. Bert, Bert, Bert took that back. Bert, Bert took the heliocentric part back. Oh, yeah, all, all right, cool. All, all I was speaking about was that bodies with mass attract each other and, and orbits exist. Well, yeah, that's not that's wrong, and it's not part of any of the the, the eclipse stuff that I just went through. You acknowledge that, but you want to believe that on the side? Is that what you're saying? Oh, uh, wait, hold on a second. So Witsit was just asking, and number one, no, no, I'm not a PhD. Uh, I, I'm just an engineer. <laughs> I'm not an astrophysicist. Well, I mean, you said that you have astrophysics buddies, right? That's why. I, I, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I work with science, with the science community very much. What so. I'm saying is I'm, I'm just throwing it out there. You're looking for someone. You. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking for someone, but obviously they would have to fly in and be on a podcast in real life and stuff, right, and have a like a two-hour – Discussion about like geocentrism and flat Earth. Fly to where? Fly to what yeah. city? Uh, should I say it's in Texas? Austin. Okay. <laughs> in Texas. All right. Um, and but they can't do it on Zoom. No. No. Okay. I'll I'll, I'll poke around. See. Cool, man. Right, or what, for what, anyone what, else in what? the room that maybe knows someone. Maybe? What topic are you thinking of? Or... Geocentrism slash flat earth. Gotcha. Um, but one more thing I want to point out to you, right? Because I'm curious what you'll think of this. So, yeah. because I genuinely uh, believe that geocentrism is a far superior model in terms of viability to heliocentrism. Here's one of the reasons why. Mm-hmm. So, if we if we go back in time a little bit... Um, we go to Edwin Hubble, right? He looked out and he saw like, oh, wait, everything that we see appears to be moving in direct relation to the Earth. This was not expected because it was expected that the Earth is tucked away in this little insignificant corner. And once we can see further out in space, we're going to see stuff moving every which way. But that's not what we saw. So that's when we get the birth of this idea that uh, there's accelerative expansion in all directions and every point of space is accelerating away from each other. Right. right, and that's where you right. get Hubble's constant and the cosmological constant, the energy that is supposedly the cause of it, which is called dark energy, is just stupid. But my point is that that, that was a geocentric prediction that no matter how far out in space you look, it's all going to be moving in relation to the Earth because the Earth is actually in the center. The heliocentric position was not that. It was that we would see things moving chaotically in all directions. We saw well, the I, geocentric I disagree position. with that statement, but I'm, maybe I'm just not understanding what you're meaning when you say geocentric versus heliocentric. Maybe we're a talking geocentric past means earth centered and heliocentric is actually a misnomer but it's that the earth is the center or the sun is the center of the solar system and now it is of course that the sun is moving through our galaxy at half a million miles per hour dragging the earth with it and the galaxy then moves 1.2 million miles per hour the point is that there's the copernican principle right that the earth does not occupy a special or unique position utilizing that philosophical assumption it was expected that we would see everything in space moving all over the place because the earth is just this like really tiny you know randomized insignificant position at the copernican principle so but that's actually not even my, my point i mean just objectively it matched the geocentric I mean, we, can, we can go we can go back to that but go on okay yeah so it matched the geocentric model right but it, they, we came up with this idea that basically uh, it's like if you had a fly on a balloon, an ant on a balloon, and it blew up, the ant would think he's in the center of the balloon. Or if you put a raisin in a loaf of bread and then it expanded in the oven, right, it's going to look like it's in the center even though it's not. Um, that's the analogy for the modern universe. But then we move a little bit more forward and we get to 1933. And Fritz Swicky made an observation of the coma cluster and saw that there was a cluster of galaxies that were all, you know, sticking together, hence the cluster, and that there was only 1% of the mass needed for those galaxies to stay in the cluster, meaning that the galaxy should have been escaping from the cluster, and you need a strong enough gravitational field to keep them all together. And, of course, to have said strength of gravitational field, you need said amount of mass, right? And there was only 1% of that mass that gravity predicted needed to be there. And so it was 99% off. So they, do, they, of course, did not accept this for what it was and say, oh, clearly our understanding of gravity is wrong. What they did was they plugged in the missing mass, and, and they actually called it missing mass. Eventually that turned into dark matter. So the reason I'm bringing all that up 
because that's still an unsolved problem, right? Almost a century later. But my point here is, isn't it very obvious that the gravitational assumption is incorrect? And here's why. It is limited to proportionate mass. And what made me think about this, you keep bringing that up and saying that. Proportionate mass, meaning that you can only have however much gravity is allowed by the amount of mass that's there. Okay, so if I have two pieces of metal and they have the same mass, they have the same gravitational field. Hard stop. Like it's non-negotiable. Now, if you have if if you had a theory that wasn't limited to proportionate mass, it would be way more viable at explaining all of this phenomena. For example, you can have two magnets that are identical in size and mass but one of them can be like a hundred times stronger than the other one. And so when we look out at stuff like the coma cluster, if we didn't assume proportionate mass gravity, then we could easily explain it and say, well, look, the actual magnetic field of that cluster is, is just significantly stronger than other ones, for example. So do you see how that's clearly a more viable direction to explain what's going on in the sky, something that isn't limited to proportionate mass? than the current model, yet the current model so, is so like religiously expense, open. Do you believe in the expanse of the universe? Because you're talking about like astronomical no, scale. No, no. So I'm confused what you're even talking about then. Because uh -huh. I mean, these measurements are talking about astronomical scales of clusters and and galaxies and such. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused how this, this relates to a flat Earth model with a Okay, this is specifically about how relativity is wrong, and it was proven wrong. I mean, it, it can be proven wrong with just like its own claims on its face, but it was proven wrong in 1933 by Fritz Zwicky. It was off by 99%. And so this has major implications because a geocentric model, for example, it like, like we'll use expansion because you brought it up. So like we, they were like, oh, it looks like we're in the center. So option A is we, the Earth is in the center. Option B is that it's an illusion that we're in the center. So obviously they went with option B. And they said that's because the universe is accelerating and expanding in all directions. And so it just creates the illusion that the Earth is in the center. And that no matter where you went in space, you would look like you're in the center. Now, to make that claim, they had to, that's called the Hubble constant, the rate at which the universe accelerates and expands. They then had to, so, uh, let me, well, I'm almost done, I'm just, I want to I let you fully talk. I just want to like, I just, I'm actually curious about your take here. You're saying you don't understand it. This is a really easy thing to understand. It's like if the universe is expanding, something has to be causing it to expand, right? So there has to be some type of energy that's causing the universe to expand. And that's called the cosmological constant. And that's why we have the cosmological constant problem or the cosmological crisis. Because no one knows what this energy is and they can't find it, right? And they now call it dark energy, which makes up like 70-something percent of the universe. And then dark energy and dark matter combined make up over 96% of the universe. 78% of all matter in the universe is quote-unquote dark matter. And so my point here is actually, I know I'm rambling, sorry, or ranting, but here's the final point here. So you have this energy that no one can find, okay? And no one can even define it. It's called dark energy, which just means it, it doesn't interact with the electromagnetic spectrum, which is just a fancy way of saying we can't see it, we can't find it, we can't define it, we don't know what it is, and we can't find it anywhere else on the Earth. And when we found vacuum energy in quantum mechanics, we then tried to apply that, assuming that was what was doing it, it was off by 10 to the 120th power. So it wasn't even remotely close. Now, if the Earth was, we go back to where we had option A and B, which is that the Earth is in the center, or that it's just an illusion that we're in the center. Option B, which is that it's an illusion, requires dark energy. Option A doesn't require that energy to create the illusion, because it's not an illusion. Simply, all observations in all of astronomy makes the Earth appear to be in the center of the universe because it's in the center of the universe which means the geocentric model doesn't even need the major band-aid of dark energy, which means objectively it's more viable than the other model. Uh, so some of your numbers are off, by the way. Um, 
uh, dark energy and dark matter account for more like 95 and a half percent or something. <laughs> wow, I said 96, not... dude, come on. Well, I something like, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I thought you said something about 99%, or was that? No, no, that was, that was, that was just the Fritz Wicke observation specifically. The coma cluster only had 1% of the mass that it needed to, according to gravity, so. Oh, okay, okay, so it's for a specific cluster, gotcha. Um, so, again, so again, I think fundamentally, I'm not sure if I'm understanding what you say, geocentric. When I hear geocentric, I simply think pre-heliocentric, geocentric still means that we have orbiting bodies um, within space. Doesn't mean flat Earth. Well, we do have orbiting. Are, are we, we, do have, we do have something orbiting around the Earth. We can all see it. I'm talking. I'm talking about like within 3D space, uh, going in in Keplerian Newtonian orbits. So, so geocentrism, pre pre Newtonian or um, you know working that out uh, with those equations. Geocentrism still had a spherical rotating uh, Earth, but no, the, it doesn't have a rotating. The sun was going around yet. It doesn't have a rotating Earth, right? Like geocentrism is that the Earth is stationary and everything moves around it. Okay, well, all right. So maybe everything is still moving around it. But point being, these are three D objects with large distances away and things like that. But you're saying geocentrism when you're using it. You're, sounds like you're referring to flat Earth. Yeah, well, this part specifically is not not exclusive to shape, and the distances don't matter at all. But like, you see, like my point is, like, bro, like I'm asking in good faith, like, what you think about the actual point, which is that a ge geocentric just means Earth center, Earth in center of universe. The observations made it look like the Earth is in the center of the universe. Option A is it's because the Earth is in the center. Option B is it's just an illusion. To claim it's an illusion, you have to invoke dark energy. But if you go with option A, you don't need dark energy, right? Which means that the geocentric model is 96% more viable than the heliocentric model when you can. Well, 95.5 actually is what it's yeah, yeah. So, like, do you see how that just means objectively the geocentric model is more viable? Uh, so, when you say that one requires dark energy, one doesn't, I mean, you're, you're speaking very broad terms, but I don't think the statement is true either. Um, you're simply saying that uh, if we live on a flat plane in, uh, with a dome over it, then we can ignore all this cosmological stuff and observations, and so just forget about it. And yeah, you're right, that does make life easier. I didn't say that at I all. Does man. Questions. That was a complete straw man. I didn't say that at all. What I'm saying is we're not going to ignore it. Your side is the one ignoring it. Your side is invoking dark energy, which doesn't even exist and isn't defined. Like, for example, let me ask I, you. I'm actually, what, I'm actually friends with Saul Perlmutter, by the way. Okay, let me ask you a very simple question. <laughs> what is the evidence for dark energy? So what we call dark energy is... Uh, merely a uh, phrase used um, to describe uh, an observed phenomenon that we're trying to figure out. We're well aware that we don't know what dark energy is. Wait, what phenomena? Uh, the accelerating expansion of the universe. Okay, there you go. So it isn't actually evidence if you reify and assume the term and phrase that's undefined. You could claim it was indirect evidence which is obviously fallacious and ridiculous because you're saying that you have indirect evidence of something you're assuming, but you're not even sure exactly what it is that you are assuming. But what I'm saying is you don't even need that if the earth is in the center because you don't need to invoke the idea that the oh, universe right. is accelerating and expanding to create the illusion that we're in the center. The reason it looks okay, like we're so in the center is because... So you're ignoring the observations. I mean, so what what observations like would I be ignoring? So where, where do redshifts come from? Why, why do galaxies that are farther away appear? Okay, there are many the different, the there are many ways to explain redshift. One of them is electromagnetic retardation can cause red and blue shift. Another one is the how, idea how of... No, that was a hand waving there, how does that work? How is that hand waving? Electromagnetic retardation. 
tell me the, yes. tell me the mechanics and physics of how that works. And why, okay, why there's some a... points on the firmament uh, experience that more than others. Okay, it's not on the firmament. It's just within whatever this massive, expensive containment is, right? But okay. my, my point is that in magnetism, we can see light shift towards the blue or red end of the spectrum relative to where it is because you have centrifugal divergence and you have centripetal convergence imposed, superimposed on each other in a magnetic field. You have a conjugate geometric expression centrifugal divergence, centripetal convergence, the hyperboloid, the toroid, right? Based on those motions, it, call, it can cause the light to actually move in either direction. A secondary idea is what's been referred to as tired light, which is the idea that light attenuates through different mediums. And so as it attenuates through that medium, right, it causes redshift because the velocity changes. A third, so a third, out. a third, a third one is because I'm not, I'm not making any of these claims definitively, but I'm showing you that there are much better ones. The third one is plasma, and this can be demonstrated in a lab that if there's plasma up there, it causes redshift, right? And you can just Google like a uh, plasma redshift, for example. And I want to make another point real fast. Um, there are major redshift anomalies. So the idea is that the, the redshift proves that the universe is accelerating and expanding, which means the further away it is, the more redshift you would have. That's actually not what we always observe. We have observations where, um, I'll say objects, quote unquote, are way, way closer, closer to, to us, but have way more redshift than the areas that are further away, right? Yeah, yeah. I can give you I would, I would, I would very a much list of Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Hubble's original theory or idea about the redshift, uh, he attributed it to a property of the universe, not distinctly to motion. That was, uh, that was changed later. So, like, clearly there are ideas, especially from the conception of this, that um, can, you know, explain what we see. We just need to not believe in an expanding universe. Well, shit. Welcome, Riggs. Quite an entrance. Oh, what's no, up? He, no, he didn't make a definitive uh, claim. Are you sure about that? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And actually, oh, no. you want to know I what he just – he, he leaned – he I did lean. Right no, he – talking about an expanding universe. Of course you can find him talking about it. I said he didn't make a definitive claim. In fact, what he explains is – this is so funny. It's one of my favorite quotes ever. He actually explains that um, without making that assumption, despite the fact that we have no actual evidence for it, it would imply um, the horrific nature of a special position of Earth. He literally called it horrific. So I can read some well, quotes from him, yeah. but just to, just to edify the room real fast. Redshifts, Cosmology, and Academic Science by Halton Arp. It's called uh, Seeing Red. Halton Arp, and he really, he has two books, this is the second one, it's called Seeing Red, as a play on the fact that he was um, very frustrated because he was back, basically being blacklisted from academia, although he was incredibly revered astronomer up to that point. In fact, we have like actual uh, clusters, I think, or specific constellations, constellations named after him. Named after him. So, uh, by the way, I will be talking to someone next week who might be a candidate for your uh, discussion on uh, heliocentrism. Uh, very, very cool. By the way, the, the, it's, uh, he's remembered for his 1966 book, Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies, which cataloged unusual looking galaxies and presented their images. And many of them ended up being named after him because he was, he was the one that discovered them. So he so was well respected, and then he came out pointing out that we have major redshift problems. You asked for an example, for example, like supernova. The amount of redshift in supernova are way, 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 way too high. Same with quasars. Quasars have a redshift that's no, that's, really... that's that's disputable. Um, like I said, I'm friends with Paul Perlmutter. Do you know who I'm talking about? Okay, and then there are just areas in space. For, that are closer than others that have uh, more redshift. Also, the redshift itself isn't even evenly distributed in all directions. 
And in fact, they make up all kinds of crazy nonsense claims to try to explain it. Like there's a theory called dark flow where there's, there's some type of energy outside the universe in a, in a little corner that's pulling part of the universe and all this weird stuff. But there are many redshift anomalies. So you're asking me to replace the explanation that has been falsified. So, Even um, though the phenomena is not what you're assuming it to be to make the assumption in the first place. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you heard my question. I said, do you know, so I'll tell my words. Your microphone is kind of not great. I don't know if you shifted or uh, something. Uh, you know, when I moved away from my phone, is that better? Any better? Yeah, a little better, yeah. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I, was, I moved physically away from my phone when I'm on, on my earbuds. I said, I, I was asking if you know who uh, Saul Perlmutter was. I can't hear the name. You're getting really low when you say the name. Saul Perlmutter? Nope. Can you okay, spell so it? So he's uh, P E A R L M U T T E R. So he's the one who uh, started it uh, using supernova data, uh, correlating it with redshift to realize that there was a uh, acceleration in the universe over over time. So he is he is to this day still you know the preeminent uh, supernova redshift guy. Okay, so when cool. You, when so uh, you, when you when you made the statement about well, there's problems with the supernovas and redshifts. I'm like this this guy like plots these out every every bit of data that there is about that. Then he would definitely uh, know that there are problems with it, just like there are problems with quasars. So, but when you when you hand wave and say, oh, there's problems with it, it sounds like you're being very dismissive and like there's no science there, there's no scientific process, and it's incredibly uh, well studied and, and such. Um, but I did want to ask. That like, makes my point stronger. Uh, that you as an optical scientist myself, as an optical scientist myself, when you say there's tired light, I, I mean I'm giggling when you say that. And and that's why there could be redshift. When you look out to space with a telescope, and you look at uh, a bunch of galaxies uh, within your you know same field of view, some closer, some farther, some with more redshift, some with less. You know how how is it that you know there could be uh, electromagnetic uh, retardation? I forget exactly what the phrase was you used, or some light gets tired and other doesn't because within that field there's a whole scattering of some are more redshifted than others. So you can't just say, well, there's something there blocking them causing the redshift. Wait, what? No, no. Actually, it being attributed to magnetism uh, makes the most sense. To give an example, you can, um, I guess I can start dropping the stuff in the chat, but does it like just disappear after this space? You know, I don't know how that works, but. Um, uh, I think it stays if, is this room recorded? If the room's recorded. Oh yeah, no, no, you're definitely being recorded. So yeah, it's and recorded and people can go back and listen to it and then all the chat stays there? Yes. Yeah, you're also being live streamed a couple of places. Yeah. Okay, very cool. Um, so let me give you an example. You can Google this. Uh, I can't remember the exact title because it's been a while, but it's even the mainstream pop sci articles that they, they being like astron astronomers, previously thought there was a star headed towards Earth because it was blue shifted. Right. And then later they came out and said, turns out that the astronomers were tricked into thinking that this star was barreling towards the Earth due to its blue shift. And actually what it turned out to be was just uh, it had a really strong magnetic field that causes the blue shift. So mainstream astronomy has now been forced to concede that the phenomena of magnetism is directly related to redshift and blue shift observations. Okay, you drop that link. Yeah, yeah, I got you. That'd be cool. Well, Bert, so yeah, just also look up Halton Arp. Like, if I stick you in a dark room, okay, is it is it likely that you are shooting through space so fast that light has just not lit your room yet, or is it just likely I turn the light off before I put you in there? Okay, I don't get the question. <laughs> well, I just. Like this idea of that we're shooting through space, it, it, it has no, like, there's no realistic explanation for that. But we have realistic explanations that we need to entertain. Well, I mean, there are realistic explanations. I, I get that you choose not to believe them and reject them, but 
Your mic is going out again. I don't know what's going on. Sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. I was just saying there are realistic explanations. Um, you know, whether or not you choose to uh, subscribe to them, that's you know, your choice. I understand. <laughs> I don't know, man. I think we've all been primed to just believe really absurd things like there's little Scotty's beaming up to a little tin can moving at 10 times the speed of a fucking nine millimeter bullet out of a gun. Like, that's Did absurd he, on his face. We shouldn't just he, believe that. Again, again, he just said, pick your lore. He said, lore is great. You should all just believe. That was his argument in case you all missed it. <laughs> well, well, I mean, right. So, so, okay, where is the flat earth then? And how far does it extend? And why is the dome there what's it made of wait let's, wait wait wait, 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 wait. downwards because it's not this electric uh, it's not, not this magnetic. again Bert. wait Bert, real fast because because we were Bert, because like right. you're kind of just breezing past these like major death flows to your paradigm and it's kind of sus so i just dropped the link you requested it's the title of the paper, of the article is dead stars magnetic field tricked astronomers into thinking it was heading our way the remnant of a dead star predicted to cannonball through the outskirts of the solar system is going to do no such thing after all. On re-examination, a white dwarf star just 36 light years from Earth named WD08110-353 has turned out to be pretty normal. Its only claim to strangeness is its powerful magnetic fields. It's it's this it's magnetic this field the research it's, 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 it's this magnetic field, the researchers say, that led scientists to misinterpret the trajectory of the stars of the Milky Way galaxy. So they thought that because it was blue shifted, which is explained in here, right, that it was coming towards the Earth. But it turns out it was just that it had a really strong magnetic field. All right, so you believe in the science of stars and solar? And no, no, my point is that. I'm invoking a hostile witness to show that when someone hand waves dismisses the idea that magnetism can be the cause of red and or blue shifts, I can show that even this hostile witness within your own paradigm, right, has been now forced to concede that that is in fact the case. So much so that they, they needed it to get them out of the fact that they thought that a star that was pretty close was coming towards the earth. And they're like, oh, no, never mind. Turns out it's – so you get it, right? I'm invoking a hostile witness to point out that even within your own paradigm, it has been conceded that the magnetic field can actually cause blue shift. So All right, question. there's right. a difference between blue shift and uh, stars uh, dynamics. So, so here, this is a really good point. I can talk this for a minute. So with the things that um, astronomers – Study hey, bro, you, you got that two, 240p no. microphone, man. Hey, bro, your mic is terrible right now. It's, it's pretty much the worst. We, we got to fix it. Or, or are there any other people okay. to talk to? Or that's just me. Oh, all right, all right. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, way better. better bro. Yeah, way better than that. Much better. Okay, I apologize for that. All right, so anyways, uh, just give me a minute here. So this is a very interesting point. So within... Uh, scientists who study stellar evolution, you know, how stars develop, you know, different kinds of stars. Um, you know, they're really pretty darn good at predicting um, and, you know, based on observations, various types of stars, how they evolve, how they grow, uh, what kind of um, uh, elements are within them. Uh, of course, you know, from the Fraunhofer lines, which they emit, things like that. So this is a great example of Within a white dwarf, with, which has a very, very strong magnetic field, incredibly strong, that there is a blueness to it, quote unquote, um, which is not necessarily a blue shift. So now I can see why. Okay, this is very interesting. I'm going to dig into it, by the way. Um, so, and and it is an example where science admits, hey, we're still figuring stuff out. Yes, we never admitted, never said we know everything. Um, but we're continuing to do observations. We're continuing to understand this amazing universe that we live in, uh, God's creation. And, and, you know, uh, believe it or not, there's, you know, there, we're not all atheists. Um, yeah, and just, we want to, of you. and we want to, um, be at a place where, where we are doing with integrity, um, studying to understand. So it, it's not a. It's not a uh, let's see what we can do to fool everyone. 
It's what can we do to understand, to continue to understand new things. Well, Bert, and, if you were going to be intellectually I love this honest, example. If you were going to be intellectually honest in this scenario, you wouldn't just say, oh, turns out we were wrong about the star. You'd be like, oh, wait, shouldn't we reexamine our assumption about the cause of redshift in the first place? Right, but uh, a, a white dwarf has an incredibly, 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 I'm not sure how many times I have to say it, to actually get to the order of magnitude of how incredibly strong the magnetic force is around it, uh, as opposed to most stars, which do not have that. And so the fact that they identified that and now understand that, that's one more piece of the puzzle of understanding. That doesn't negate redshift. That doesn't negate the fact that entire galaxies are redshifted, the Lyman alpha uh, emission lines, um, which we understand exactly why that happens, what those chemicals well, some galaxies processes are. Blue are. Some, some, but very few. Why are they blue shifting once, once if they're once, all going once you away get, from us? Well, within, with our, within our own cluster, there are some that are blue shifted towards us because within our cluster, that cluster is, uh, there, things are moving around. Like Andromeda galaxy is moving towards us, right? We, we know this. this is not, but this it's not also moving, moving away from us. No, it's only moving towards us How? because it's because it's uh, actually the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy are gravitationally locked. But no, um, everything has to be moving away from. According no, to no, no. Model, see that? I'll say, to... Well, this is a, this is great. Let, let, let me just explain that misconception. Within astronomical scales, between large galaxy clusters, yes, everything is moving away. Within our local galaxy cluster, things can be moving towards each other faster than the expansion because the expansion is only 70 kilometers per so per now second, you've said it like correctly that. which is that the, the the locality of it it means that the velocity basically causes a net effect that's stronger than the expansion away but everything right. is moving away yeah okay well right right so with you know it's, it's like if if we are um on a train and there's another train ahead of us, and that train is pulling away ahead of us. Well, everyone on that other train is pulling away, but within the train that we're on, we could like walk freely towards each other, even though the people on the other train would say, "Well, you guys are moving away from us because you're, you know, falling black back from their perspective." So the local galaxy clusters, yes, the galaxies do move and interact with each other um, locally, even though the other galaxy clusters that are farther away. Cluster, entire cluster is moving away. Okay, so let me read a couple things here. So Edwin Hubble, quote, such a condition would imply, this is when he's talking about uh, redshift, right? Like it's specifically recession velocity. Okay, such a condition would imply that we occupy, this is when he's discussing what the actual observations show. And this is in the context of him saying, uh, here's an explanation, right? And like recessional velocity creating an illusion. He says, basically, because if that's not the case, you know, then we would be special. So here's how here's what he says. Quote, such a condition would imply that we occupy a unique position in the universe, analogous, in a sense, to the ancient conception of a central Earth. This hypothesis cannot be disproven, but it is unwelcome and would only be accepted as a last resort in order to save the phenomena. Therefore, we disregard this possibility. The unwelcome position of a favored location must be avoided at all costs. Such a favored position is intolerable. Therefore, in order to restore homogeneity and to escape the horror of a unique position, the observations must be compensated by spatial curvature. There seems to be no other escape. That is not yeah. science, my friend. Yeah, that, yeah, is, that, that is so dogmatic. Real quick, right. I, just, so, I, so, I always imagine these people in their dormitory always... sitting down, just writing down the most literal language possible to like describe what is observed, and then just knocking it off into the trash. They're just not satisfied with that. They need something more fancy and something more exotic. <laughs> it's just like, where's the ones? Like, wait, wait, keep that stuff. That's like the empirical. That's what we actually observe in the most literal language possible. But that just yeah, so Austin, uh, Austin, that's, is, uh, it's, it's a great quote. I, I appreciate you, you bringing it up. Um, within, um, as we understand, you know, expansion, you know, there's an observable universe. You know, like if we look out in all directions, it's, you know, the same 
in terms of you know the red shifts getting farther and farther all the way to the cosmic microwave background that's as far as we can see um you know it's like a z of you know red shift of like 1100 um the the that edge that observable edge um in an expanding uniform uh, universe cosmology we are at the center of that that doesn't mean that if you're somewhere else then so like you, if you're six feet from, standing six feet from me your observable universe is shifted to the left six feet of my observable universe yeah um, but this so is a conflate, it, it, this is a this is a misconception that's often conflated people think that sorry they think that we only look like we're in the center because you can only see so far in each direction Meaning, like, if you can see 10 miles, well, it's going to look like you're in the center because every direction you look, you're going to see 10 miles. That isn't what's going on here. The reason that it appears that we're in the center is because even distant galaxies, they move in relation to the Earth. Everything does. It isn't just about – it, it, if that was the case, we wouldn't even need the accelerative expansion model, right? We would just say, well, Well, of no, course, that's not true. That doesn't follow. It does follow because the reason is because of the actual movement of the distant galaxies, for example. It isn't just that we can see the same distance in all directions. That well, isn't – that, that, I mean I, I don't know if you really have a good understanding of cosmology then to make that statement. <laughs> okay. That's not a rebuttal, man. Like – well, you're you're, you're just – I'm saying what it is, and you're saying, no, it's not. And, but that well, is, let, let me explain this Okay, moment. let me ask you a question. Say the universe wasn't accelerating and expanding, but we had telescopes that could see 46 billion light years in all directions. Would it look like we're in the center? So a telescope can see as far as the photon traveled to 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 the telescope. The reason we have a limit is because uh, as things expand faster and faster away, they get more and more redshifted until they're not visible. Uh, longer wavelength uh, light has less energy. Uh, I don't know if you know that. So like every time you double the wavelength, uh, the energy gets cut in half. And so the cosmic microwave background is very faint, and it's also um, you know, very cold down to 2.7 degrees Kelvin above absolute zero. And the reason we can't see anything beyond that is because you can't really detect anything else through that. It's it's completely um, uh, opaque. Uh, you know, there's no signals. It's it's you know <laughs> it's gone, man. Um, you know uh, the. You're not answering my question though. My question is: if the universe was not accelerating and expanding, and we looked out in all directions, yeah. would it appear that we're in the center? Because you're literally conflating. Well, you things. you would see you would it would look the same in all directions. You you would be able you would have the same visual limit in all directions from your position, but that isn't so, why it wouldn't be a visual limit. But but basically, you know, you'd see things as small as you could detect if you have a big enough telescope and collect enough photons and have a good enough detector, you can detect it. That has nothing to do with how distant they are. It does though. There's something called the inverse um, square law of light, which I'm sure you're aware yeah, of. Course. Which, which yeah, is why okay. I said if you have a big enough telescope, at some point you can detect okay. – you can collect enough this photons is like, to detect. This is an appeal to the future of technology fallacy is that what we're doing now because I'm just no, making – it's no. a, a simple it's a simple question, man. There is a no, difference I, between I, the I understand fact radiometry. We, <laughs> okay. There's a difference between the fact we can only see so far in each direction and the fact that the galaxies from a distant extension appear to complete a circular rotation annually along with – our annual procession. There's a difference in the fact that all of the distant galaxies are moving in direct relation to the Earth. It isn't just because we can only see so far in each direction. It's that you actually have to invoke recessional velocity, accelerative expansion, to explain why everything in the universe appears to be moving in relation to mm. our position. And here's another quote from Hubble. He said, the observations as they stand lead to the anomaly of a closed universe, curiously small and dense, and may it be added, suspiciously young. And that's Edwin Hubble in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, 1937. You, this you is him saying that, that 
you, you understand what he's saying? Trouble. He's saying if you yeah, don't I mean, invoke recessional velocity and accelerative expansion, the observations as they stand actually imply the Earth is in the center, a central position, which is special and unique. He refers to it as horrific and intolerable and unacceptable, and it can't be disproven, but we don't want to believe it. And what those yeah, observations um, – what those observations like, suggest, I just want to make sure the room gets to hear this, what those observations would suggest as they stand, right, what they actually show us before we try to explain them away, is that the universe with the Earth in the center is closed, it's really small, everything is very local, it's dense, and very young, okay? Okay, so That's I'm what, curious. Do you realize that before uh, Hubble and the Palmer Observatory – um, people didn't realize that the Andromeda galaxy was an entire separate galaxy apart from the Milky Way. What is the, how is that relevant do, to what I just said? Do you, do you realize how young in cosmology it was? So you're ripping his statement screamingly out of context and then trying to make a point that the universe is small, young, and, and tiny. And Edwin Hull, Hubble, um, I'm sure by the time uh, end of his life, not because he changed his mind, but because he continued to grow in his understanding, uh, did not you know, think that in your characterization of, of, of him. Well, this is 12 um, years actually, after actually, his initial observation. Yeah. Every well, presentation just, Hubble gave at the Royal Society and others, and especially the last one that he gave before he died, he always said that he could be wrong about redshift and he doesn't actually know. So the heads up. Well, okay. that that's fine. But I mean, we've continued to do m much more uh, refined observations. And they make it worse because now we see things like quasars not matching the redshift prediction at all, or that redshift isn't evenly distributed in all directions throughout the universe, or that objects that are much closer have less redshift. So there, there's a couple of things I've, I've picked up with it um, about about you. Number one, you don't seem to understand the actual cosmological model of the universe and redshift. And number two, you don't understand how science works to continue to understand things based on new observations. People get excited when they say, hey, wait, that doesn't match what we thought. Let's let's investigate that more. It's not a problem. It's not, it's not like, not oh, true. Now, now, we're, now we're broken. Oops, we were wrong. You know, for just trash the whole thing. They say, okay, this is something new to understand, and they get really excited about that. Trust no, me. No, no, no. You can, you can say that, but actually there's a set of presuppositions that are – uh, unchallenged, and they're not allowed to be challenged. And one of them is the Copernican principle. It's a fundamental staple and presupposition of all of astronomy and cosmology. I just read Edwin Hubble himself explaining that the idea of the Earth's in the center can't be disproven, but it's just we won't accept it unless we have no other choice. We must avoid it at all costs because it's horrific and says that we're unique. Stephen Hawking said that the Earth could definitely be in the center of the universe, but I reject that possibility on grounds of modesty. Okay. Yeah. These which, people which, have simply, a philosophical which simply bias. means we, we can't see what the the edge is. We we don't see an edge of the universe. We only see an edge of. of an well, you just tried to universe. present the idea that these people are super open minded to whatever the evidence says, and they get I, excited. I 100 percent guarantee you they are. I, They're I, not though. I, I talk I, to a lot they, of these people. They really, no. really, really are. They they get really excited about trying to, about new discoveries. They're, no. So, no. So the, the the problem you brought up about quasars, well, that doesn't match redshifts and stuff. Um, I mean, again, if you want to give me the reference for that, that's great. Um, but again, we're, they're constantly looking for new understandings, and that's the community I work with. Um, as you know, it's really not, you know, like a bunch of they're not. Like, oh, yeah, you know, we, we're just brainwashing everything. So. I mean, yeah. I, and and it's getting late. I I I I don't want to leave like I'm just like stepping out or anything. But you know, I I, I am gonna have to cut out here. Um, and okay. I, well, like I said, know, you're, what you're saying is not true, but it's okay. I I don't assume malevolent intent, but I do know for a fact. For example, if uh, where all the funding is going right now is to look into dark matter. Right. Even though there are many physicists who now know for sure it's been almost a century. We can't figure it out. We have no evidence for it. There are certain physicists that will tell you that it's actually been falsified with sigma phi confidence, which means over 99 percent confidence. Because when we see, for example, the merging of certain galaxies, that dark matter should be present. They don't actually slow down when they merge, and though, even though there should be resistance according to dark matter, et cetera. And so there are many people that propose, for example, modify Newtonian dynamics or alternatives. Yes, but the, yeah, fun, the funding funding doesn't really go there, though. The funding goes to dark matter. So one of the major your proponents here, and and for example, the physicist, the astrophysicist I just invoked, who's a professor in Australia, he explains that that's the problem: is that all the funding is being funneled into dark matter, 
and dark energy. So when you step outside of that and you acknowledge, okay, look, it isn't adding up. We've tried for a century. Like, let's entertain other possibilities. You don't get funding. Another major problem is if you step outside of some of the core tenets and staples of modern cosmology, you get blacklisted and called a quack. And I just gave you an example, Halton Arp, who was literally like well-respected to the point of almost being revered in astronomy, right? Because he made such exceptional observations of peculiar galaxies <laughs> that many of them were named after him. But then when he came, so he was he was top notch. As soon as he came out and pointed out, okay, look, clearly redshift, is, our redshift interpretation is wrong. It doesn't work, and here's why. And then list an abundance of, of evidence to show why. He immediately got blacklisted from everything. Right. Same thing happened to Fred Hoyle, who's the person who coined the term Big Bang. So it's not that these people are malevolent or sitting in a room rubbing their hands like, let's trick the world. It's just that there are core beliefs that have been ingrained in them in the way that they were taught the very field when they got their credentials in the first place. And they're not taught as being subject to being questioned. And one of those is the Copernican principle. The idea that the earth well, may not be moving is you're not allowed to say that or think that or talk about that. It doesn't matter how many observations show that that's the case. They will never do it. It's not questionable. And relativity has been that way for almost a century. These are what's actually going on. Redshift is another thing that's just like that. So, so Austin, again, I think you're mischaracterizing it. There are, there are things that which are, are, I would say, not unquestionable but things which are incredibly well established and you're saying they're not established um other you know 100,000 physicists would disagree with you but you know we can agree to disagree okay well i have them come on my show and then they just it's just two and a half three hours of them conceding the whole time yeah then they turn around and pretend that all those things are well established yeah, like isn't it crazy i remember yeah, you, that dude. all you, every single one you've ever talked to they immediately can see only people on the internet don't and then argue for hours on this ridiculous point it's weird you know what's yeah, interesting like when they show about their face our, and their real name is he also found oh, oh, that the galaxies and quasars are connected by a filament when you look at it from a certain spectrum and they, there's no explanation for that that's part of why they kicked him out um i think lisbeth put uh or maybe it was Prod Flurf who put a tweet that I that I uh, made in the uh, chat log or whatever. You can go back and find it, but it's a link to all. It's it's a it's a zip file that has all of Arp's books and publications in it. So you could check that Seeing Redshift book out and just like read it. It's a pretty easy read. It's not very complicated, but just like read the story of what happened to him and why why he was kicked out of um, or banned from using telescopes here because he has the authority and credentials to, uh, you know, refute the heliocentric model and the interpretation of big bang cosmology and the, and the support uh, redshift and all that. Um, and they literally had to make it so that he couldn't use the telescopes here. He had to go to a different country, you know? So it, it's crazy. How insane it's, is that? Dude. Well, I, I don't know who, who is they and where is here. Like he could not use the United States and Halton Arp and the and yeah. the people that are in charge of the telescopes or the observatories that he had access to yeah. for decades. Yep. Okay. Um, I mean, again, it's, there's uh, I, I, we already said everything. I'm not going to repeat it. Um, you don't I, think that's I, weird? I if what Alan just said is true. Do you do you disavow that? I don't know the history of it. I'll have to read it before I say you know what I vow or disavow. But just in general, on um, a meta, do you disavow like coercion uh, by way of you know uh, again I don't, people's funding I or professional? Don't, I don't know what he proposed. I haven't read. No, it. I said pull so out the specifics. I'm asking you in general. In general, do you disavow the if, idea of there being coercion and pressure to comply to certain interpretations so that if someone comes out and says, look, the evidence shows that our interpretation of redshift is wrong. Look, someone shows, look, relativity is wrong. If they start being not, not having access to funding and they're being kicked out of universities, they're being blacklisted, they're being, they're no longer allowed to have their papers published, anything like that. Do you disavow that environment that exists in modern science? Well, I think there's a lot of politics in, in anything. Um, but if someone says the moon is made of cheese, um, yeah, you're not going to get telescope time. So I don't know what he said specifically. So, you know. Dude, we're talking about Halton Arp, bro. Do you know who that is? No, I haven't studied him. He's a very yeah. respected astronomer. This so is I've someone that said the moon things. was made out of cheese. Okay, but my point is I don't know what he said. I don't know what the controversy was. And once I read that, then I can tell you my opinion on it.
Well, here's basically what he said right here. If the cause of these redshifts is misunderstood, then the distances can be wrong by factors of 10 to 100. And luminosities okay. and masses will be wrong by factors up to 10,000. We would have a totally erroneous picture of extragalactic space and be faced with one of the most embarrassing boondoggles of our intellectual history. And then he was completely blacklisted and kicked out of all of right. his but 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 I don't know if he I, sure. So if he said that, and he, I could even say, okay, well that's a true statement. If you're wrong, then everything else is wrong. I don't know what else he said and what the whole controversy was. So I will look into him, and then I will be able to tell you what I think of him. But I again, I will tell you, uh, people are extremely extremely interested in that exact question. Uh, one of the projects I'm working on with the National Institute of uh, Standards NIST is. Um, flux calibration sources uh, for both ground and space-based telescopes to improve the accuracy of um, of uh, the radiometric calibration uh, you know measurements of different stars in different wave bands and that that's something that people have been trying to tackle because um, to get your absolute uh, flux calibration down under say three percent you need uh, we need better reference sources and so right now, you know, you know, a telescope observes one star where observes another. They can super accurately say relatively this star is brighter in this band versus this band for that telescope. But uh, so so people are extremely interested in doing correctly what you just said. Well, let me just recap for the room before you leave so everyone knows where this conversation started and how it got here. I pointed out that the observations were unexpectedly uh, consistent with geocentric model. When we looked out in deep space, we developed better telescopes that could see further than ever. And what we saw was that everything in the universe moves in relation to the Earth that was unexpected. It was expected that the Earth was a tiny speck of dust in an in insignificant corner of the universe and that everything would be moving in every which direction. So then we had two options. Option A is that everything, all astronomical observations make the Earth look like it's in the center because it is in the center. Option B is that it's just an illusion. They, of course, went with option B because they adhered to the Copernican principle. And so they said that the universe was accelerating and expanding in all directions. Of course, if that's the case, then that call, requires an energy to do that. That is what is now referred to as dark energy, okay? And my point to you was that there's no evidence of dark energy. It's never been uh, adequately even defined. Yet a geocentric mm -hmm. model, I, I, I'm almost done, I'm just recapping. Yet a geocentric model wouldn't need that uh, baseless assertion, affirming the consequent reification fallacy of dark energy, right, where you just fill it in with the Band-Aid. The geocentric model doesn't need that because it appears that we're in the center because we're in the center in a geocentric model, which means that it's significantly more viable. You then respond with, oh, well, yeah, I guess if you just ignore all the, all the observations, then yeah. So you're saying if you just – I said, what? What am I ignoring? And you said, well, what causes the redshift? And so that's what started the redshift. I pointed out that actually there are multiple different viable explanations. Electromagnetic retardation. There's a tired light theory. Also, plasma causes that very effect. I'm, yeah, I'm almost done, good. but I'm recapping very well, and you know it. And then I said, but even further than that, the actual redshift observations are not consistent with the assumption that it's recessional velocity. And then I started uh, going through some of the specific problems with it. That is what has gotten us here. And what has happened is a long way of avoiding the point I'm making, right, which is that the geocentric model is superior in viability because it doesn't require the assumption of dark energy, which makes a, a major portion of your cosmological model. The geocentric model doesn't need that, which means just on paper, on its face, objectively, it's more viable of an explanation. It doesn't require that. It doesn't have that major flaw right can you acknowledge that please because it's pretty important and it's always ignored and i just find it weird well i'd, I'd like to give my closing statement recap Good is guy. that okay send it yeah, sure. okay. I don't care. So, so so basically i started off by talking about how masses attract each other and can orbit each other and that when you put that into a calculator uh, with the ephemeris of of uh, the masses of the planets, orbits, uh, moons, etc., that that correctly predicts the movements of every celestial body that we observe uh, within our solar system, uh, outside of our solar system, with parallax of stars, um, uh, solar eclipses down to the second for any point on Earth, 
Uh, you didn't have an answer for that. Uh, I acknowledge that dark energy and dark um, uh, matter are merely um, names we give placeholders for things that we observe but don't understand and we're trying to figure out. Um, and so it's not a matter of one model then makes it more obvious that this is the right model versus you know, that is especially flat earth versus uh, um, uh, universal cosmological models. Uh, I pointed out that the uh, dwarf stars um, that have incredibly strong magnetic fields affects the chemistry and the the emissions of that star, and that's not a normal thing within space. There's certainly no such thing as tired light or uh, electromagnetic retardation uh, that would affect uh, one star field, uh, one galaxy versus another one right beside it versus another one differently right beside it, etc., uh, to give differing differing red uh, red shifts. And uh, so, uh, ultimately, uh, I don't think you understand the actual cosmological model of uh, red shift all the way out to the um, uh, cosmic microwave background uh, or how uh, radiometry uh, actually works in terms of how you uh, detect these things um, and such. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, it was, it was a good conversation, but uh, uh, here we are. Hey, can I, can and, I get and, back to I, I just also wanted to say hi to Jaren. Hey, Jaren. Yo, Rich, real quick, let me just sum it up the last, like, hour. Like, if I make a prediction to how many jelly beans are in, are in this transparent <laughs> case, right, and I say that there's 96 jelly beans, and then there's actually four jelly beans, and I'm like, well, no, 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 actually, there's actually dark jelly beans that are in there the whole time that I definitely predicted that's going to constitute the other thing. But one theory actually predicted there were four jelly beans, right? But one of them says, actually, no, no, no there is four, but there's actually dark jelly beans. Which one of those two theories would you side with? That's pretty much what we're breaking down, all right? Your, your intellect is dizzying, Shane. Thank you. Yeah, but, I like, mean, you know, I want to point out again, though, like, obviously there was, like, a ton wrong with what you said, and there were mischaracterizations and tactical omissions and stuff like that. But even with that long-winded, you know, list of tactical omissions, you still didn't address the point. And like I said, it's never addressed, which is that if one model doesn't require dark energy, but one model does, then the model that doesn't require it is more viable. Yeah, that's a non sequitur. How is it a non <laughs> That's a non sequitur. <laughs> it's a non it's a non <laughs> Dude, next. Can anybody else step up, please? Yeah, it's, it's a red herring. It's a red herring. I'm just throwing nah. out all the words. Nah. Hey, Bert, Bert, can I ask you a quick question, Bert? When you said 100,000 physicists, is that an appeal to consensus, appeal to authority, or a... Uh... Appeal to credentials. What do you think? No, no I, well, I just I just did that because he had, he had said, well, a PhD physicist says, and then I'm like, okay, so that's a geocentric. You know what a hostile witness is? happens to be? Dude, that's like a fallacy yeah. squared. He just reified yeah. it and it squared it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so is it consensus, credentials, or authority? What do you think? I, I, I'm, I'm saying just because one person thinks one thing, that doesn't make it. Right. What you and said was literally just repeat words. That's what you just said. Hey, hey Shane, real quick. <laughs> literally, that's literally not what I hey. just said, but okay, fine. Yo, Shane, real quick. What happens when you put the mass back in the equations, like they're saying for the ephemeris? How, how much does that change the accuracy? Oh, you mean like with Kepler's law and the prediction, and then you say you incorporate yep. like another body like Jupiter's moon, and you're like, oh, man, you need like, the mass to put it back in because we take it out because we when we – equate gravity to centrifugal force it drops right out but no but we need to put it back because of the mass well it comes back no no, no it's like a 0.01 percent difference when you don't include it so like the fact that you need it in itself is retarded of course you don't need it you get the same exact prediction without it and then we're back to it's all evidence it's all i mean ob observable right so it's empirical so it's you know either. and how about for the eclipse tables specifically <laughs> the specifically the heliocentric eclipse uh, ephemeris what was the situation with that in regards to the dynamics that they introduced Oh, well, with that one, what do you mean? <laughs> the, the JPL, where they just modeled out ellipticity forever or whatever? The one that they modeled out was a, you know, heliocentric prediction or whatever, but it doesn't change anything. Like, it changes it by, like, 0. 0.0000. It's oh, just... right, right, right. Yeah, the actual ephemeris where they go and they model it out for, yeah, like, unlimited Keplerian ellipticity, where, you know, they pretend that things are perfect circles. They run this model in perfectly. They do it like 1,000 cycles. Then they do 10,000 cycles. Then they look back and they look at the size of the lunar disk and the solar disk and the actual spot and the altitude and the azimuth. And they go, oh, we've improved it 
we've improved it by after all those iterations like 0 0.001 so much so that the lunation between periods of each eclipse actually wipes out this difference by a large margin and fred hesbonak himself is quoted as saying less than negligible didn't have any effect on any of my studies or any of the predictions so like he put it on his website maybe that's the spot that i that i copied and then like i highlighted how he just said this is negligible and like essentially retarded right because people are like nah they use this ephemeris and it's like well no they tried to they modeled it out it was dumb and they threw it out literally that's what happened anyway hey, uh, nice. Bert, I, wanted to say one, I wanted to say one thing before you bail uh i've been listening to the conversation back and forth for two and a half years i am a flat earther but i wanted to thank you for uh not interrupting with it and and going back and forth like it was very pleasurable to hear what you had to say what he had to say for the whole room and i really hope you have a, a friend that you can recommend for this uh, debate that what's going to do so thanks for being you because you're obviously a genuine guy and i appreciate it and I appreciate it. Anyone, uh, I've, I've said this for, for a few years, uh, anyone who's going to be in the D.C. Baltimore area, I would be glad to give a tour of uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center uh, here in Maryland, in Greenbelt, Maryland, where I work. Oh, that's awesome, man. Well, hope you have a blessed evening if you dip out. Uh, it was a pleasure hearing this whole back and forth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, you know, I've, uh, I've got friends in these rooms. Um and uh, I'm, I'm not in it to like, you know, oh, I'm going to win an argument or, or uh, you know, trying to, you know, put someone down or anything like that. No, I hear you. It's uh, my first time on the app and I think it's great. I, I, I did the three dots at the top and went to high quality because I have fast Internet and it's like super clear. The audio is way better than I think Flat Earth Fridays, you know, the X spaces and it's better than Discord even. But uh, I'll close with this. So you don't know me from Adam, but uh, I'm just a stay at home dad with three small kids and one on the way. And I just want to know what the truth is. So I listen into a lot of different places because I think there's quite a bit of deceptions in the medical industry. My wife is a physician and I'm trying to find out what should we actually be putting in our body for health, uh, not just big pharma, trust the science type of stuff. And then cosmology for sure. Where do we live? Are we really moving? and all that and this is a fascinating uh journey of awakening i think a lot of people are waking up and uh i don't know if you saw the posts that i put uh dr young and mark gober those are a couple people to check out dr young wrote a book called a fool's wisdom and he has a phd in nuclear physics and actually he has a master's in uh nuclear physics as well and he woke up and so did Mark Gober, a Princeton graduate. He wrote Upside Down Cosmos. So those two books are just fascinating if you care about what really is the truth. I know that you think you have the truth now, but it could be that we're not actually moving, which is kind of epic if you care about that. Very cool. Yeah, I, I, I saw them in the uh, chat here. I grabbed, grabbed those links. I appreciate awesome. that. Yeah, I'm going to drop the mic. Yeah, Bert, Bert, please come back. Bert, please come back oh, and the uh, debate and the with our with our um with our illustrious illustrious teachers. That's what I call them, because um, I think that you'll find it very interesting. They will expand your understanding of our universe. That's what I enjoy. Aren't we all smiling? I love it. Dude, JT set up this whole thing up. I'm are are sure. we going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya? That'd be awesome. Well, let's just hey. celebrate JT's achievement. At, at, at the other Kumbaya I community. Sent, I sent a us lot all of together. texts. Yeah, I sent a lot of texts and messages, and I was like, get in here. It's the Ether Boys. Um, but you know what? What this really is about to me is connecting. Everyone is tired of the division and the fight. That, that's why I, uh, I shouted you out, Bert, is because... You held a conversation, you held your own, you believed the truth that you have, and you allowed Witsit as a man to believe the truth that he has. You didn't call him an idiot. You didn't say you stupid flat earther or whatever. All these, you didn't use like a ton of ad homs and personal attacks and stuff. Uh, and that's great. It was very good. So uh, yeah, keep seeking and come on back and we'll hang out here. This is a fun place. Yeah, I pre appreciate it. No, I, I, I don't call people stupid. That's cool. You must not been on Twitter ever or whatever, which I respect. Hey, uh, <laughs> do you have an X account? Because you should you should check us out on Flutter Fridays. It's usually like a eighteen to thirty six hour stream, and yeah. he did go by. He did go. Oh, cool. He he went when uh, when Shane released his uh, his model, and uh, he asked a few questions. You guys uh, brought him up on stage, and yeah. oh, I remember. I remember. Yeah.
I don't yeah, that, that, that was a while ago. And there's a geocentric model that doesn't require dark energy, and so it's significantly more. <laughs> Dude, I heard you say that. So many. Did nobody like the dark jelly bean analogy? I really I thought that. So you were just talking fast. <laughs> like you know, you make a prediction, and then all of a sudden you're like, "Well, I'm wrong by like ninety. I'm sorry, ninety-five point five percent wrong." But actually, I'm right because ninety-five point five percent of the stuff I was predicting is actually there, but we can't see it detect it, feel it, account for it, notice it, or do anything, but just know that it's there because the math says that it is, right? That's the exact equivalent <laughs> analogy for the situation where people are getting on board with, well, no, dark matter explains it because dark matter. All we're saying is we don't need dark matter, and that's by default better. That's it. Hey, uh, Shane, the one I like better, honestly, is the one which it did on School and Globers when he did the pennies in the drawer and the desk in the other room. That one really stood. <laughs> yep, that's another really good one. Why do I have to do analogies, though, man? This is, it's just all weird. It's like, oh, yeah. do the penny, yeah, you, do the pennies in wait, the drawer. Nah, let, Dude, me, like, let me just think about this. It's a really simple question. We should probably ask this before we let the cat out of the bag of what they know we're going to. It's like, okay, hey, just so we, we kind of get how science works and we're on the same page, a little Socratic method, you know. So uh, let's say I have a theory, and it makes a prediction that I'm going to see something when I open the door. Then we walk down the hall. We're all excited. You got your GoPro. Good times. We open the door, and we see something. We see exactly what the theory said we would see. And then we have another theory that says that we're not going to see that. Which theory is better? You know, like, I don't know how else to, like, how, how much simpler can we make? Like, one theory predicted exactly what we saw. The other theory specifically didn't predict that observation. Yet, By a wide, all huge, of large science, market. Yeah, all of science went with the one that didn't predict it and match the observation at all. And then they just started adding all kinds of made up stuff that still can't even be defined a century later just to imitate the other theory that actually matched what we saw. Look, that's weird. It's a crazy level of douchebaggery going on, and I don't know people who defend it. Yeah, like if there's a model that doesn't, okay, and this is why, what I normally, how I normally have always said it is like, if there is a kinematic and dynamic equivalence between a geocentric and heliocentric model, but the geocentric model does not require dark matter or dark energy, and that makes up 96% of mainstream cosmology, would you agree that the geocentric model is at the least 96% more viable? How about both models make accurate predictions, but in order for one model to make accurate predictions, it needs to be a 90% fake dark matter that can't be refined. Like, which one of those is accurate, too? Like, yo, and, like, this is pretty cool. You guys should definitely check out Halton Arbor if you never have, but did you hear what he said? Like, if the cause of these redshifts is misunderstood, then distances can be wrong by factors of 10 to 100, and luminosities and masses will be wrong by factors up to 10,000 factors up to 10,000 we would have well, a we would have a totally erroneous picture of extra galactic space and be faced with one of the most embarrassing boondoggles of our intellectual intellectual history because objects in motion in the laboratory or orbiting double stars or rotating galaxies all show Doppler redshifts to longer wavelengths when they are receding, it has been assumed that throughout astronomy that redshifts always and only mean recession velocity. No direct verification of this assumption is possible, and through the years, many contradictions have arisen and been ignored. The evidence presented here is, I hope, convincing because it offers many different proofs of intrinsic non-velocity redshifts in every category of celestial object. It is interesting to note that at first, Einstein felt the solution was incorrect. Later, he said it was correct, but of no consequence. Finally, he accepted the validity of the solution, but was so unhappy with the fact that it was not a stable solution, i.e. it either collapsed or expanded, that he retained the cosmological constant he had earlier introduced in order to keep the universe static. This constant was later referred to as the cosmological fudge factor. In 1924, Hubble persuaded the world that the White Nebula were really extragalactic, and a few years later announced that the redshifts of their spectral lines increased as they became fainter. This redshift apparent magnitude relation for galaxies became known as the Hubble Law, through lack of rigor often referred to as the redshift distant relation. At this point, Einstein dropped his cosmological constant as a great mistake, and adopted the view that his equations had been telling him all along that the universe was expanding. Thus was born the Big Bang Theory. 
according to the entire universe, was created instantaneously out of nothing 15 billion years ago. And it goes on and on. So it's like he pretty succinctly summarizes like the historical sequence of events, and then he goes on to tell you all the glaring and obvious uh, contradictions with the assumption that redshift is recessional velocity, right? And like like. I don't know, bro. To me, it's like if you're actually in pursuit of truth, like either you have like uh, a dog in the fight or a horse in the race or whatever they say, right? You have too much bias. And for example, I don't know, like you're an astro or you're an aerospace engineer at NASA, maybe, right? Um, but like if you don't have that big of a bias, you're just trying to like find the truth. How is it not like very obvious, right? Where like one side has like egregiously just reified undefined concept that like made up anything in the world and said look yeah sure i don't know what this means sure it's contradictory sure it doesn't match any observations sure i'm just begging the question sure it's unfalsifiable sure i keep changing it sure i I still can't even figure out what these band-aids are but the other position that actually matches the observations a central earth um although it can't be disproven we just really don't like it it has philosophical implications like the earth is special and unique and that's horrific and intolerable so on grounds of modesty we just completely reject it outright we don't even take it seriously we don't even consider it and we just reject it entirely and we look over here and come up with anything we possibly can to explain explain it not being that like whoa that's literally a, an accurate depiction of what has happened. And then people thunderously applaud that, and then people get on board with what really happened. It's weird. It's like, why are you so scared of being special, bro? Like, what are you doing in the dark? You know what I'm saying? What are you doing that you're so scared uh, that maybe if this place was created, it'll be known? You know what I'm saying? Are you scared of accountability? Is that why? Yeah, dude, the scared? whole thing, personal responsibility is gone. That's why people on the internet take shots at you and come up and puff their chest out and say dumb things that are retarded and have no sense. Like, even the smartest people who argue dumb things, their position renders them retarded anyway. It's tough to see in real time. But you did mention, or somebody mentioned, like, how it's off by a factor of, like, 10,000. And that's directly because you do dumb stuff, like, do direct inverse to, to distance relationships to parallax angles, which are themselves tiny, obs- like tiny, tiny, tiny angles. I think Alan will give you the number. It's like point zero nine or something, I think. Yeah, it's, 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 if, if you do like Beetlejuice, 0.0051 in arc seconds, <laughs> because D is like one equals one over P when P would be the parallax angle of parsec. So that's literally how you get it. And when you're off by a factor of the fifth digit and you're just dicking around taking measurements, you're like, whoops, off by a factor of 10,000. That's how it happens mathematically. Anyway. I noticed you guys tactically avoided the salient question of why would they lie? <laughs> you're such <laughs> a good <laughs> deal, Hey, I was going to jump back uh, one one sentence before Shane. Well, well, Shane said it, but then he went on. Um Sometimes people, they don't want to be accountable. They don't want there to be a creator above or creator at all. They want to believe in the materialistic, you know, outer, everything's material. There is no uh, meta or spiritual. But, you know, I'm not saying people, but some people believe in God, believe in a creator, are very faithful and passionate. Like I was very faithful and passionate to a creator, but, uh, you know, the God of the Bible and Jesus, like that's my that's my journey, that's my choice, that's my walk. And honestly, when I had to peel my brain off of the ball earth, it was difficult because I thought that it signified that my God was powerful and mighty and and grand and expansive. Like when I was a little boy, I was told that the universe goes on for trillions of light years. And so I had woven my personal faith and belief in the Messiah in with the heliocentric story. And, but the thing is, I wanted truth more than I wanted to be comfortable, more than I wanted just to stay with what I thought I knew about space and the spinning water ball that they showed us, you know, forever. I said, I want to know the truth. And uh, when I found out we're not moving, uh, I started to find that to be more comfortable when I started to vibe with y'all. And uh, I feel like truth has a resonance and a frequency, and it's very uncomfortable comfortable for people who haven't really dove in and looked into a lot of things, but there are so many lies and so many deceptions and so many things that are inverted and flipped already. I think that we're 
a, there's a massive group of people where the veil has been lifted and maybe they're not looking into flat earth yet, but they're looking into other truths and it's all going to lead to people awakening from the darkness. And uh, that's just what I'm standing on. So thanks for being in the space. I think you're doing the same thing. A lot of people. Hell yeah, JT. Dude, and that's why you're the best president ever. And I love that when we made you president through our fake election, that you immediately started acting more presidential and started writing in and connecting communities. And that's the power of uh, brainwashing, I guess, or whatever. Well, I don't know, dude. What, what's funny is I can't debate Positive. like what's it. My brain doesn't work like, you know, I can't do what you guys do with the knowledge and like the retention. But I can love people that are, have been traumatized and lied to. And I can tell people I might be wrong, but I don't think so. It's flat, bro. It measures flat, extended topographical plane is what it is. And I mean, people will get it. They'll, they'll get it. Yeah, let's unpack that, JT, the, the part about the lying. So it did, why? <laughs> speaking, <laughs> of, speaking of Globers, we were having a good time. I think this started by me commenting we're having a good time and how Wichita had a good time magnet. And then Wichita showed up, I think. But then, like, I noticed that when we had a good time, another magnet went out. And then we had a filing of Globers. That we all knew and hated and have already debated and dismissed, yet they showed up one at a time in order, in sequence, to continuously interrupt and, like, defecate all of what we were doing. Did anyone else no notice that? Yeah, dude, I get a text message yeah, from Boston talking about, the Ether Boys are partying, come check it out. And then I dude. came over here, and then, like, Mordo, Wando, or whatever. Dude, conversation rape. I was walking my dog when he said that. But now, literally, whenever someone comes and does that to me, I'm going to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I reject to be conversation rape right now. I don't need to talk to this person. I've already debated and debunked everything they've ever said. And then, like, if they continue to talk to me, somebody should stop them or whatever. <laughs> I don't want to be conversation yeah, I'll put it rape. In chat. It's like a, like a freaking parallel world just crashed in here because it's the same fucking dynamic. They got these obsessed people who... You know, it was just funny to see it, like, be able to witness it <laughs> from the audience sort of this stuff. So I love how both Alan and me had dismissed them by name. We're like, shut up, Omnivore. No, nobody cares that you're, like, nobody, we, nobody cares about you, dude, honestly. Stop interjecting yourself into conversations you weren't a part of. Nobody cares about your opinion. Anyway, <laughs> like, two people that follow, follow you around. Like, all right, which has the best haters, dude, all the same people. Like, they're way more dedicated than his fans, which... Would be us, probably, right? Like, they're way, way more dedicated than us to follow him around to tell them how much they hate him. It's ridiculous. Oh, it's cool in a way, though, because you basically get, like, employees for free. So it's, like, whatever argument, they all just, like, f frantically work on trying to prove why it's wrong. And so then you you immediately are fed, like, all of the best, like, excuses they can come up with. And it just helps you to further strengthen your argument and then gives you ability to completely still man the other side, ironically, thus removing the need for them to be interacted with at all. Yeah, I think the fact that you steel man it so accurately before and after. Also, I noticed the synopsis really gets to them when you just accurately recall what has happened. Oh, if I, yeah, the whole yeah. conversation. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I have, but I noticed that if you happen to have good recall and you can just do that at the drop of a hat whenever you mention, then if you happen to use that in conversation with a Glober, it's massively effective, right? Just yeah, rattle dude, it off. That's actually kind of that's so kinda, good. Dude, let's hone in on that for a second. Why, right? Like, why, when you recap the conversation, from beginning to where you currently are, why do they universally get super triggered and have to interrupt, interrupt it? Yeah. The reason is because the entire conversation, they've been deploying tactics to obfuscate. So whenever you lay it out from beginning to end, it basically pulls the curtain back, right? Like this entire dance that they've been doing the whole conversation to make sure that the audience doesn't ever get to hear the conclusions or to overwhelm them with scattergunned misdirection and confusions and obfuscation and stuff like that. Ooh, like yeah. all of a sudden that goes out the window because now someone gets like a coherent recap to see how the conversation progressed and yeah. those tactics become elucidated. So they have to stop that, right? That's why the recap is so awesome. Dude, because they freak you know, out. you know what I noticed? That Mordwan immediately developed his final saying and what he did, I was walking my dog, I couldn't say anything, but he just listed a whole bunch of nonsense shit. He literally words out, he was like, ECEI, ECF is a reference frame, plus we have the celestial, and it all means the heliocentric from the heliocentric frame. And I was like, that's all, all of that's nonsense. He just, none of that, what he said, has any, he has no idea the little impact of ECI or ECEF or when the corrections apply or how, why they need it, or what it was invented for, which one directly hides the speed of light by sinking it with sidereal time. Like, it, he has none of that. He just says stuff. And the end of it, he was so threatened by the summary at the end that he just rattle rattle listed a whole bunch of things that I knew 
was all inter like nonsense, but then you immediately said, "Oh, what he's gonna do <laughs> is not address the thing, uh, re- re- restate the same stupid two points, and then rattle off to try to obfuscate and try to distract as much as possible." And wouldn't you know, that's exactly what he did, and then skedaddled. So whatever. Yo, I did that to both of them. I said, like, yep. <laughs> "Yeah, this is what's gonna happen. They're gonna avoid this point again." And then boom. I also noticed that the dude talking hard about eclipses. As soon as we brought up data and how we're gonna, like, which one of these is heliocentric. He immediately noticed his oven had to, was burning or whatever and had to go. But then when he yo, came back, yo, it makes sure the room understands what you were saying. Like they're basically invoking, they're basically claiming that the gravity from within the heliocentric paradigm makes exclusive, makes the uh, eclipse predictions exclusive to the heliocentric model. And then you pointed out that like the actual addition of mass is inconsequential. It's like less than it may, it, what is it 0.0001 percent difference yeah, it's like 0.001 but it, it does yeah, so it's not required and the, the actual data doesn't use mass attracting mass newton's laws or any of sort of any sort of prediction like that to do so would violate the three-body problem to be like oh actually we can predict more than three bodies in, pro- in, in motion right technically so they don't do that all they it's all based on observations of the sun and the moon so like altitude and azimuth literally the same things that drive the model which is what we started with in the first place, right? It's just observations of the sun and the moon. And the only the only other thing, which I always say is your best point, is I need long lat to graph it out, to map it out to where it is on the earth, right? So if you want to say which part is heliocentric when I'm listing them, someone should say that. But for some reason, for, for some reason, when I've listed these before, nobody has said that to me. <laughs> You're like, to me specifically. Stop, stop me when I list something that's heliocentric exclusive. <laughs> you just list everything and nobody says anything. <laughs> I've done it a couple times. Like this is all the data. I have all of the data. So when when I can do it, and I I know what each one of these data points is going to represent when you go to make a prediction, and I know that none of it requires anything that you just said, like nonsense. The nonsense you just said. Newton's law, absolutely not. Sun altitude, sun altitude, like elevation, time, like literally. That's it. No no gravity. No no math. But the the only reference to mass was an obscure reference to a vaguely heliocentric ephemeris to which Fred himself had dismissed its effect as less than negligible. What happens is the amount that it was better after running all their simulations was overrun by the amount of lunation between periods. That means the the moon itself changed enough where these 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 differences to the lunar disk to where it would be meant fuck all. Right. The, the moon itself changed more than that in a month, so literally what they did meant nothing. And Fred, with the part that's quoting, is him saying, we dismissed it all. It had no impact on our work. Hey, uh, I got to make two. Main... Go ahead. Real fast, real fast. And that's the main guy that did the eclipse predictions for years for NASA, for those who don't know. Yeah, yeah, I should have said that, Fred. The reason why Fred Espinak has his own page is because he is the only guy that has all the eclipse data. NASA has nothing to do with it. If you're going to talk about eclipses, you have to involve Fred or you, you can't do anything. So. Okay, so my two comments, because I got to go. I have to finish this edit. Uh, Wits it, I'm so close to having this. It's going to be like eight hours and totally worth it. You don't have to watch the whole thing. I'm going to timestamp the important parts to jump to. But anyway, my two funny comments. One, I love that I shot Dave a message too, and he's down there chilling. I don't know if he's sleeping, absorbing everything we've said while he sleeps, because he can do that, or if he's engaging, you know, that's fun and funny to me to think about that. Number two, when I flew out and visited you for the Truth and Freedom Conference and I saw your stream room, the setup, I did I never told you this, but I'm gonna say it here. I was expecting like notes and stuff all over the place. And I'm like, there is nothing. There is nothing for you to like look at to recall any of this stuff. It's all in your head. And it's funny because Mordwan or really anybody, McToon, anybody might have like a team of goons behind him sending messages and like they could even have a piece in their ear to try to de- defend you or beat you in a in a debate but they can't because you've worked so hard to to actually understand the entirety of the heliocentric like paradigm so well that you can teach it to them. And then you also have just dove dove into all the greats in the past. And it's like, you know, you're just sitting there like Neo with one hand, like fighting the all the bosses. But anyway, you know what I'm saying? That's all Do I got. Do you guys though. remember when Mordwan showed his stack of like Alex Jones papers during the debate? <laughs> he like hovered it down. He had like 50 papers out. <laughs> Dude, I remember yeah. on Twitter, he was like, wow, I write books. I was like, cool, here's all my sources, my published database, and all the papers that I reference. There's a reference bibliography directed by subject on everything I just spoke about. Where, where's yours? And he's like, well, it's on my computer. So 
And I'm like, oh, it's, that's that's a good one. And like, yeah, I, I get it. But dude, that dude is terrible. I love when he showed up and you got sick of him. You were like, dude, where's my seventeen seventy seven dollars? <laughs> Immediately, <Yeah. laughs> I started laughing too. <laughs> I, pre- oh, I appreciate it too, bro. You're welcome, dude. It's true. Everybody appreciates how hard you've worked because you're you're the best at debating for sure. And then, uh, Dave, if you're listening, if you're awake, change your name, your first name to Flat Earth and your last name to Dave. That'll let us know if you're listening. Yo, I will say um, to demystify all that a bit, it's really much more about, and this one I'm going to try to make a course on like debating and stuff like that. There are a few little tricks, right? Um, the heliocentric model is so flooded in presuppositions and reification fallacies that even if you're unfamiliar with the topic, now at this point I've done this part so many times that I have become familiar with most of it, right? But this wasn't always the case, but I would still win the debates, and the reason why is because it's all just gay presuppositions. So if you just listen (laughs) to the claim, you may not know anything about the claim, and then you can just think about it, you know, lifetime for a second, and be like, okay, wait, so how do you know that? So wait, wait, okay, so what exactly are, are you saying happens? Like, okay, how does that work? Well, okay, and how do we know that? If you just ask very simple questions, you will, they'll literally tell on themselves within a couple of questions. Like, they'll deliver you their fallacy on a silver platter. And so you can quickly find out and piece together what they did because it's almost always the same thing. You know, it's just like, you know, a bunch of presuppositions. So it's like, for example, they start talking about stuff in space, right? You should be like, oh, well, how do you know the mass of that? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, so it's like, that's kind of, that's the benefit of just being on the side of truth and not just making all kinds of unfounded assumptions you have a huge logical advantage, right? So you literally are basically Neo. It's just unfair because, like, you can... Obviously, the next step is that you retain all their pseudoscientific nonsense over time and over the years where then you can interject, correct them, teach them their own position, then elucidate why it's wrong. But anyway, I mean, I'm telling you, people that are brand new to Flat Earth can absolutely destroy in the debate you know, within a couple weeks just by really familiarizing themselves with logic. Yeah, that, yeah, that but... mass thing, that was... Oh, sorry. No, you're good. I was going to say, that's why they can't let you speak. So many tactics to interrupt you and mute you. Uh, when I... You'll, you'll see the video. I uh, It's like I have B-roll where... I recorded my screen on my on my Discord so that you could see when QE was hitting it exactly, like the timing of when he hit it and how long he was leaving it on and when he would release the hold. I mean, it, uh, the way that the video is going to come out just completely exposes how super gay a little mute button is. <laughs> yeah, well, props to you, man, because you said you don't have to watch all of it, like. Of course, I can't. There's no way I could relive that. So no, Dude, it was no a way. 63 gigabyte Gerther or whatever. I think. No, it so wasn't. I think it was so 13. Know. It was 13. So you know how much effort he put into helping the community and wading through all that nonsense horseshit. Just oh, he to, had to get on the phone the to make sure that he didn't lose the screen recording. Oh yeah, I know. he probably did like a juggle with two hands and did like on one phone or whatever. No, like last night when whenever it was all said and done, um, and I even I, I learned. Whenever you hear the very last closing thing that I say, um, I had to record that on my iPhone. Like I turned on voice recorder so it would record me because the uni, whatever the uni program is that screen records, which I know I should be using OBS anyway. um, When I speak, it doesn't record me. So I knew that I had to record my voice to have it on there. And I have to, you know, I've been seeming stuff together, like taping it together to make it legit. Um, but anyway, when I went to close it out, I knew I knew it had a potential to mess up because Sacred had me record like a, I don't know, a two hour debate that he did before. And when I went to close it, it wouldn't close and I lost it. But then I got on tech support, you know, it was freaking one or two in the morning. Um, and they were like, well, try command three. Oh, that didn't work. OK, try command two. And it did. It, saw, it stopped it and saved it. So I'm going to go now and I'm going to finish. <laughs> and uh, I'll see y'all around the next uh, next go round. Wait, Run Boston, before you go, this is completely anecdotal. 
I've never been in this space before. I've never had a clubhouse, but this is a testament. <laughs> we don't, we don't the, know him at all or whatever. Yeah. This is a testament to the fact of how important like truth has become in my life and listening to people like Shane and Austin and Alan and stone and, just you know all these people mr xavier like i'll follow them around i'm a grown-ass man contemplating do i need tiktok like that, <laughs> that, <laughs> like that's that's i just got deleted dude i gotta get back on there again <laughs> like that is it's i don't like how i like it kind of thing you know but um it's great to hear these conversations because the more I listen to it, the more I can apply it to my own life and my own, you know. So, yeah, I just wanted to share that anecdotal little piece of information and kind of like a, it was kind of a dick move, JT, but I get why you did it. Thanks. <laughs> I send you the text. Yeah, yeah, because I got the text and I'm in a meeting and I'm like, shit, I know I'm missing gold here i was listening in on shane's stuff but on twitter but yeah. uh, i think alan recorded the whole thing from the beginning yeah like, either way I, i'm just kind of mad that like i have a new app and i'm thinking about getting another app just so i can <laughs> yeah, this keep up with good. all the shit you guys do so yeah, i feel the same way because i'm like dude clubhouse is actually pretty good so did yeah. you up the audio quality with it with the three dots at the top because that it gets really clear if you do three dots and then high quality Yo, and then when we want to, oh my bad, Nomad. Yeah, no, I just wanted to uh, extend a welcome and um, just, you know, a piece. What's up? Hey, I see we do see some pink tickets. Um, yo, you can follow the room and this can be like a, you know, if you imagine a Venn diagram, this can be the uh, overlapping point or not clubhouse, but this moment in time we've officially like kind of solidified. Much of what you guys were saying, much of what went on tonight, like Bert, uh, we know Bert, uh, we've known him for years, many of us. Um, is very familiar. I just wanted to echo what Jamal was saying. A lot of it is uh, very familiar. Um, you guys' responses and, the, and even the, uh, the you know the talk amongst yourselves. Yeah, it's it's kind of it's strange how they um, not they but how this conversation has very well worn paths. No matter where you go, but yeah, shout out to y'all, man. Shout out to this collab. I see. You know, you know, I was gonna say real quick. Is, you know how you get good at debating is you just hang out with Witsit, and inevitably people come and like challenge the king. Like they just like we're having fun playing poker, talking, do whatever, and people will come and like throw a glass, drop a glove, demand a thing, and, like, and Witsit being Witsit always just takes on all challenges. So it's like, oh, we gotta stop and watch them demolish somebody who thinks they know something about whatever expert they think and come along. And if you do that a number of times and you hang out for like a month, you just naturally pick up all the tricks, all the arguments, all the things not to step into, how to lay a trap, how to lay multiple traps, you know? It just, oh, yeah. It just, you know, I will say... It's crazy, man. The uh, the the creator of the space, OG, he's he's not, you know, he probably had to crash out. He wakes up pretty early, but yeah, OG, OG Meatball. So he's he's... He come. He goes into you guys' space. He has been for a while now, and he he reports back. Like he's told us, you know, what goes on in the X space. Who gets their, you know, their asses handed to him. And uh, yeah, I'm just saying, like this is this is like another corner of, you know, Globers getting their asses kicked. They get their asses kicked in this room all the time. So yeah. Yeah, that's why we're here. We heard they got brave or something, which is on ironically the same reason why we're on Twitter and why we encourage other dudes to go to Twitter, because after we demolish them on the platforms, Twitter is where they currently feel safe. And we love to show up where people feel safe. <laughs> As you guys noticed tonight, right? Just yesterday, you were like, hey, we had this guy who's acting real brave, but it would be cool if you guys came through. And we were like, OK, OK. And then yeah, I think I think that was fun. Hey, I well, well that's, what, that's what happened, that the, these guys here, our resident Globers, feel safe in in this space, even though they get their asses fucking kicked all the time. Yeah, but they, they feel safe here. Us. Yeah, so then that's why I was like, hey, John, like, for example, like, John, hey, why, why don't you go over to X, man, since you're always, uh, you know, claiming these dubs and how... And how you fucking got a, a, a dub off of fucking Shane. I'm like, why don't you go over there to X, bro? Because he was talking a lot of shit, bro. And I'm like, yeah, just go over there. And obviously, he's been backpedaling. It was very meek all of a sudden. I was like, he was like, I agree loudly. But <laughs> I was like, what? Oh, okay. So we're on the same side? Like, okay. <laughs> so loudly, yeah. But awkwardly, yeah. <laughs>
Hey, uh, it would be cool if I could get Los, if I could get you Los to come in here one day. Yeah, we've Los. actually uh, through Brandon. Uh, Brandon, he's another uh, heavy hitter in this space too. He's not here right now, but yeah, Brandon, he kind of uh, set that up. It was, it was during the summer. It was a few months ago, but yeah, it was. Uh, it got kind of rowdy in that in that space too. But yeah, um, we did have, we did, we were able to build with Los on you know the flat Earth. It, it did get right. wild though. It was, it yeah, was cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like every time I've been in one of his rooms, for example, it it, it always gets that way. So I was gonna yeah, say no, the it's... nomad because I, I I could barely see like the ring around who was talking. I'm trying to get used to voices. Um, you know, you mentioned OG Meatball started this space for this room, and I was like, oh, he came into Flat Earth Friday, I think last week, and Shaker was shouting out OG Meatball, and I was like, that's a unique name, that's a cool name, but it is cool how people are going cross platform, you know, like I think, I think I started on Discord, that was like the very first thing, and then I found Telegram, and then I followed Witsit to X because like the globe, the globe anti Flat Earthers were like hating on him. And you know, Clubhouse is they last. They safe on X, right? And then they, Bro, <laughs> no, they don't. But everybody is just kind of like spreading out, and it, we're all family. I mean, it's beautiful. So uh, thanks for all the people who usually just run this place and like have a have a normalcy to it. And you know, there's like probably what 15 people new and different up in here tonight. Well, yeah, dude. Yeah, OG, OG Meatball is the only reason that I think I'm here. And then I've been, as soon as I got here, I've been trying to join the communities and bring people from all the other communities I'm in, whatever you could call it, Friday, whoever, to try and max it up. So I'm glad that he he's the link who pushed it all together because he's been doing it. He was the most gracious the very first time I came over here to make it super cool. So shout out to yeah. that, dude. I, I also, yeah, I also told the guys, I mean, I'd be in the X Spaces too, man. I said, hey. Let's go over there, show them some love. But but the thing is that uh, there, there's um one of our main guys here, Linnell from the house. He also does like uh he has a show, a conspiracy show. It's called Conspiracy Cookout, and um, he normally has a show when the X Space is on Flatter Fridays. Like I think he starts the show like around ten. So a lot of a lot of people from here go there. So I said, you know, we should go over there, you know, Flat Earth Fridays and show some love. But it's kind of, you know, it's a conflict, you know what I'm saying? But I mean, I'd be over there, you know what I'm saying? So, but and obviously, like OG, some of us go in there. But I said we should all go, you know, show some love, and then you guys, you know, will return the favor and show some love here. Yeah, facts. Yo, credit to where it's due. Yeah, that's facts. Jose and um and and OG and and of course Liz too. But yeah, like um, yeah, that, y'all three kind of yeah. like, and Jamal too. Jamal's been going into other spaces, and really all of us, we support each other. But yeah, Shout yeah. What to happened was OG OG got me here, and then there was like seven people who immediately were like eloquent and able to articulate arguments, and we're just arguing. Some of you arguing my thing like perfectly, and I was like, whoa. This is not what I expected when I came outside my zone to see what yeah, other that's, people that's, do. And that's what I was saying. Like, Globers on this app or new to this app underestimate us in this room. You know, it's a thing. You know, but they do end up getting, um, you know, they got to get the gauze and the neosporin, get wrapped up. Get bandaged, yep. I remember my first know. impression was nobody needed help, dude, here. I was like, oh, I'm here to help, right? And then it was like, nah, everything I'm looking around, everything's fine. You guys got this. <laughs> yeah, that's actually another huge advantage in terms of debate is like being underestimated. Um, and like, so Flat Earth does have that advantage. Like, you know, Flat Earth has quite a few advantages. It's like, uh, it doesn't make a bunch of like erroneous, fallacious assumptions. It's based on the default empirical position. Falsification is independent of replacement. We're saying, look, what you're claiming is true isn't true. All these beliefs aren't true. Here's what's wrong with it. Here's how it's falsified. It, you, you don't have a huge burden of proof. Your burden of proof is substantiated with just like everyday experience and observations and like all empirical evidence that exists. And then you're almost always underestimated. They think that you believe something insane, like when people are new to the subject or just kind of familiar with it. And so, yeah, like really it's an advantageous position in many ways, like to slice people up, you know, it's uh, that's, yeah, that's why they really can't cool. really let this get on too big of a stage, you know. Dude, I do predict that whenever all of us get together, all the globies disappear, though. Whenever there's, like, a big a big enough gathering of enough flat earthers get together, there's, like, this aura that gets put off that rejects and repels all the uh, the actual globers who are usually talking rough and tough and, you know, they know everything. They largely disappear when enough of us gather. Has anyone else noticed that? 
Yo, you're not lying. Yeah, it's just way easier to, you know, to text Yo, what something. It, Immediately what go into the about, shadows. Uh, you trying to throw dirt to the punch bowl from afar. What do y'all think about the Joe Rogan um, fighter thing months ago? What do y'all think about that? What's it? Oh, where he brought it up to that one dude that talks about like ancient civilizations a lot. Very dumb. Nah, didn't. Uh, no, my bad. I'm not. My bad. I'm thinking of Alex Jones. I'm tripping. Alex Jones. There's actually like multiple episodes of Joe Rogan. We had Billy Carson was one, and Matt Walsh was another, and I can't remember another name, but it's been constantly being brought up. And then Joe's yeah. kind of like flip flopping on like, oh, NASA's a hoax again. I was actually uh con- I I mixed it up with uh, Infowars. I was talking about I, I met Alex Jones, you know, earlier. Yeah, you mean the one where Eddie Bravo showed up with Dave Weiss? That one? Yeah, hello. <laughs> yo, anybody hey, want, yo, anybody hey. want to speak on it? <laughs> wow, we should give Dave back the mic. He's still here, isn't he? Yeah. Is he down there? Yeah, I mean, I've been inviting him up, but I don't know if yeah, he's Yeah, he's down there. He listening. could speak on it. <laughs> Oh, I thought that Alex Jones interrupted way too much. Yeah, it, and I only brought that up because of, uh, dang, I, I wasn't really looking at my phone. Someone just said, um, you know, how, hold on. That was, uh, yeah, that was you, Shane. Yeah, you know, enough of us gather, and especially if it's being broadcast in any way, you know, shape or form, definitely lean lean towards, the you know, the default. No, definitely. Yes, <laughs> That's what Alex Jones was doing. I, I peeped that too. Yeah, Alex was the same on Alex Stein the other night, because um, he was talking. To, Alex Stein was talking to Jones about the flat Earth and you know, same sort of tactics, just talking over the top of him, and then you know, just a bunch of observations Jones has made, uh, just saying that he's seen spheres in the sky with telescopes, whatnot. And then he was on Jimmy Dore. No, sorry, Alex Stein was on Jimmy Dore. And, uh, well, sorry, Jimmy Dore was on Alex Stein. And they talked about the final experiment on there. That was pretty interesting as well. Yeah, I think Alex may go. Yeah, he's shitting his pants, though. He's scared. He's legitimately scared. I mean, he asked Jimmy Dore. I think he said, oh, do you think the govern- government will kill me if I <laughs> if I don't see what they want me to see? But yeah. No, yeah, no, he called he called me, we talked about it. I'm like, nah, you're good, bro. Yeah. Wait, because I don't think so. I think that is. would be super sus and backfire on them. Oh, so you, you told him you're good as in nah don't don't even consider it or... No, I like I I I think you should go. And I said you're good. Okay. I don't think they're gonna try to take us out or anything. Okay, FOMO out. I gotta go edit. I'll see y'all next time. Yeah, catch you. Thanks man. so much, JT. Later, El Presidente. My pleasure, y'all. Much love. See you, JT. What's up, everybody? Hey, yeah, uh, that's interesting. If it, if you do see the sunset, then what what it, what are the options at that point? That, that's an interesting thing to speculate about because you know, I mean, not that it'll take you out, but like, what what will be done at that point <laughs> if, if it's obvious that it sets? On the outer ponders. The outer ponders, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what you're really going down there to see. That's my theory. You guys are really going down there to have an outer ponder sighting, and then that'll start that whole psyop. up. Anyway, hello everybody. Dude, this is that new, Dave? Hold on. Is, new, that, is, yeah, that, yeah, oh, is that Dave? Is that Dave? <laughs> of course. Because you sound like well, a completely a... different person on this app. And I was like, he says everything Dave says. Right. <laughs> he, can't, he can't not be Dave. <laughs> Who's this new outer powder guy? <laughs> I was talking to my mute button, and when you didn't respond, I was like, shit, maybe it's not Dave. Could be my headset I'm using right now. You sound on this app. I don't know, dude. As well as the app, I'm not sure. You sound like a completely different person. That's all I'm saying. Better or worse, I don't know. Anyway, yeah. Clearer or uh, better? But yeah, definitely. Better. Clearer, probably clearer and better. Uh, yeah, that's the audio on this app I heard is great. That's one of the it's advantages, fantastic. right? It's but fantastic. For, but for you, it's like 700% better. And for everyone else, it's like 200% better. 
I'm wearing these uh, headphones with an actual like headset mic and um, it's weird because you get like the, it feels like you're in a room because it you you hear people in different places. Do, does anybody know if this is centralized? What is that, is that young know. Piazza? Yo, I love uh, how we roll, we roll twenty deep everywhere. You guys are awesome. <laughs> hey, does anybody know if it's a centralized hosting or if it's hosted like by whoever like starts the room or what? Is it like Discord? Is it centralized? Yes. Uh, no, I don't think it is. I don't. I mean, well, yeah, it, how it works is that, you know, there's admins of the house. Like you see a lot of people with the green beams, they're moderators, but some of us are just like admins of the house. So basically whoever starts the room, it could be me on a given day, Nomad, Nicola, Lord, Jamal, um, Madison, et cetera. Um, and yeah, we just like mod, obviously our, our resident um, flat earth homies, because we kind of like to keep the space open for most of the day, all day, every day. So it just gives the opportunity that if some of us have to dip out for, you know, matrix obligations, as I like to call it, then we can keep it open. Word, word. Also, like more to the question I was asking, like when I say centralized hosting, I mean, is it on a server that's run by Club Deck yes, yes. or Clubhouse or Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's yeah. that was what I was. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm I'm one of those internet wary people, you know. So, so what what would be the implications of either or server or not? Well, we, centralized we hosting. Security wise, we would have another data point on Piezo and the file that we build on his identity, <laughs> so, that, so that we can find him and plug plug him personally. <laughs> Dude, I asked him what he, uh, what his favorite football team was the other day, and he was like, "I can't tell you that." Like, dude, we, <laughs> we, we, can't, we can't even get his fucking team, bro. <laughs> we'll get you, bro. I'm gonna guess about the teams until I'm right. So you look out, yo. So I, I missed out like the bulk of that uh, convo earlier. That you invited me to. I was a busy, man. But there was like a PhD in here. Is anybody else in here is still like here to talk about science and stuff? No, or is it they all ran away. away? They got summarily destroyed one by one, argument by argument, and then recalled verbatim to get recapped on the destruction, and then they fled in fear and disgrace. Well, you guys are always welcome to beat up on coffee if you want. Yo, nah. oh, no. <laughs> Are you a resident Globy coffee? Coffee's a flat earther, bro. He just pretends yeah, to yeah, be a Globy. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm the, I'm the resident Glover here. But it, technically, I'm the resident Glover everywhere, so you know how it goes. It's so hard, bro, to find Glovers that will actually come to these spaces because they what they do is they show up for like 10 minutes, they say their words, and then they rage quit like 90% of the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but for coffee, right? If you like all the people that you're hanging out with, and you actually like what actually happened was all your friends are flat earthers and all the Glovers kind of suck. And then if you kind of realize that and you hang out with all the flat earthers, you know what happens though, eventually, Coffee? You become a flat earther. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> you become a flat earther. No, I, 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 like to, I like to think that I'm standing on my own uh, too here and uh, sticking strong in my beliefs. But, you know, I do, you know, I, you know I, I do think that you guys are fucking awesome. So, you know, I don't mind the company. Admit it, coffee. We're better than life in real science. You already know this. Yeah, coffee's running for office. He's a permanent politician. That's just how he. We well, have to fight Mordwan, who wants to be King Glover, because you can tell he turned up immediately when we were having a good time to be the good time ruiner or whatever. I equate yeah, it to like diplomat. when you're hanging out in a house and like a homeless person just comes along and defecates all over this thing. Like you were having, you were like, oh no. What would happen was we just deterred that homeless guy. We were like, you no. Shut up and sit down, or whatever you know. We're trying to save everyone from what we know is happening. That's that's how I view what happened. So what's the go? Is Morty paying that two thousand dollars? I mean, he didn't concede that night. He I said heard, he'd rather heard, pay the two grand. I heard with it offer him a lump sum settlement option, which is smart. I wish I had done that. Right? That's a good. That's a good smart thing to do. And then he immediately didn't do and do anything. I think what he said was, "I don't want to make any more bets," which you know considering the circumstances is a responsible thing to do because he keeps losing him. Yeah. Coffee. I mean, how have you been hanging around for however long you've been around and not yet come to the acceptation of the completely incontrovertible physical evidence? 
Well, as interesting as the topic is, I don't think there's enough uh, physical proof to prove either. I think the nail in the coffin is going to be seeing the body uh, that we stand on in totality, right? So until then, until the common person has the ability to travel outside the system and see, you know, this this body that we stand on in its totality, the conversation is going to be fun, you feel me? So, you know, that's that's what I'm here for, the back and forth, the convo. Yeah, I find, I find it interesting. Word. Well, I mean, via inference, right, you can you can eliminate certain options from possibility, and that only leaves you with certain other ones. And if there's a limited number of options by process of elimination, you're left with what's correct, you know. So that's kind of the way I handle it. I can't go up 2,000 miles in the sky and look down, but I can definitely – play with magnets and you know electrical theory is a uh, is a heck of a thing especially when it uh actually disproves the model they try to teach us our whole lives well i, I believe here on earth within the macro scale i think everything's pretty explainable uh Within the globe model, I think uh, until there's better explanations provided, I think the globe model is going to win with the explanations here on Earth. And uh, I think it's a little ambiguous when you start to reach out into the galaxy and, you know, the universe and explain the speed of light. All of that shit is ambiguous to me. But uh, as far as the proponents that we observe every day here in our everyday reality, yeah, I think the globe uh, wins in that perspective. Okay, okay. Um, what about our observation of being completely stationary and uh, everything looking pretty much level? But that's, that's, that's relative. You feel me? For me, we're going to need to collect a lot more data or you're going to have to show me a lot more data that uh, actually proves that we're uh, motionless. Well, how would you measure motionless? That's the thing. You can't. You know, you can only correlate characteristics, you know, in your surrounding environment uh, that give you an idea of, you know, which frame of reference is in motion. But without those, you ain't, you ain't going to really tell. Well, would it be fair to say we're motionless unless proven otherwise? Uh, that, 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 that was good. Uh, that, 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 that was good. You, you tried to get me. Let's say it together. Uh, let's say it together, Carl. Yes. Yes. Answers, well, yes. Uh, I think the way that you would disprove, mo like, how would you measure motionless? It would be by attempting to measure motion and failing to do so, right? Like that would be a, uh, like a negative result, right? Right. So I mean, I think if someone asked me, measure how fast this car is moving, and you know, I measure the car and I measure no movement, I would probably say like zero meters per second. But when we apply that logic to the Earth people get butt hurt, I'll say. Yeah, I mean, for me, motion has to be relative to something, you know, so unless you have data about the other reference frame, you're, you know, you're just shooting, shooting the shits. Why does well, it have it, to be relative? And don't y'all, isn't the sun a reference point in the heliocentric model for most yeah, we're motionless compared to, you know, relative to everything moving around us. I mean, you can flip it and say that we're the ones moving, but there's no motion detected. So it's not fair to do that. Yeah, you could either do two two things, right? Because the data we've collected shows that there's a, uh, a shift in the luminaries that we view within the, uh, our celestial dome, right? Now, you could either conceive that the, the matter in which or whatever a uh, medium which in uh, which those luminaries are in or is moving causing those luminaries to move in this similar pattern or the earth is motionless you feel me? i don't i don't give a fuck which one we conclude you know that that's that's the beauty in it you know to going back and forth about it yeah but wouldn't the idea that we don't detect it or sense it or have any kind of um a, i mean there's actually a, uh, tests that show that we're motionless. I mean, the interferometry can show that. There's all kinds of things that, that show that we're motionless regardless. Wouldn't that win out if it's just a flip of the coin? It could be this or that. Well, your direct experience should 
tip the scales a little bit, don't you think? Not necessarily. Um, you have to have the understanding that maybe your observation observational point is not the best uh, frame of reference. All right, all right, coffee. I got you. I got you. So check it out. Let's use uh, like Socratic method for a second. Uh, you said that like any motion or any measurements we make have to be relative to something else, right? Correct. Okay, just before we go down that road, why? Why do you believe that? Because without any uh, without any relative property to compare your emotion to, then it's in it's it's null. You know, it it has no bearing. Therefore, says, it doesn't exist. Okay, says I right. You, so, but why? Right, saying it it is because it is is a tautology. Like, do you have a reason for? You know, holding that belief. Uh, my understanding of it is that you need uh, you need another property to uh, quantify your uh, acceleration with. If you have nothing near you to quantify your acceleration with, then there's no motion to quantify. So there has to be like an external object, basically, for you to compare yourself as an object to, to tell how fast you're moving? Object, medium, yeah, something. Something that shows a bearing of motion. Okay, okay. And if you did not compare to something external from you, and would you expect to measure motion? No. So if you did measure motion without comparing to something external from you, what do you think that would show? That your second frame of reference is in motion. Okay. So like your measurement without referencing anything external, it would be with respect to what? It has to be an absolute space or some absolute medium. Okay. So if there's an absolute space that we can measure motion against, doesn't that mean that we could measure our own motion with respect to nothing else except space itself? Yeah, but we know there's no absolute, well, this hasn't been a proven absolute space. Okay, well, there's motion measurements referencing no external frame. Yeah, but it's ambiguous because usually those uh, measurements are skewed with other characteristics that correspond with uh, the body that you're uh, taking a measurement on. For instance, right, when you use a linear interferometer, you have to correspond with... Uh, it's not going to get the rotational uh, motion, right? It's just going to get the angular, uh, so to speak. So there's different characteristics of the body that you stand on that's going to skew your measurement. Well, I mean, r rotational speed is angular speed. I mean, it's in terms of angles per time, but... Um... A linear interferometer, right, is is meant to measure, you know, linear motion, so they say. But, I mean, we can just take the two arms and double them around each other into a closed circuit, and it, it'll measure rotation. Um, in fact, you know, Ru Yong Wang, 2004, showed that rotational interferometry and linear interferometry produce the same fringe uh, result. And just you just have to use the uh, proper equation to, uh, based on uh, your measurement device, whether you're using a rotational setup or a linear setup. Yeah, but the, with the whole Ruyong Wang experiment, you could actually use the rotation of the device uh, as a uh, reference frame in itself, as far uh, against the pulse of light. So it it, it kind of you know. It kind of supports the idea of relative motion without an absolute space. If you're measuring against yourself without respect to something external, that is absolute space, my guy. If I am 
measuring my motion with respect to myself only, it that's absolute space. Yeah, it and an important thing to remember too from the Wang experiment is what what Pizio was saying when he said, you know, you have to use the correct equation. The circular and the linear equations are both equivalent, but what he meant by the proper equation was using the proper length of the apparatus at the time you're making the measurement, right? So when Wang did his linear experiment, he only used the effective length, which is what was the the part that's moving, like just that length. If it was in reference to the rest of the gyro or whatever, you would have to use the the full length because then you could then you could argue, okay, it's relative to the uh, to the full loop or whatever. But it's just that effective length that that produced the fringe when you plug in the uh, the numbers for it. So that's a super important distinction there because that makes it that takes the idea that it's relative to some other external point off the table and it makes it relative to itself, which implies absolute space. And to piggyback on what Alan said, right, there's only one fringe reading that's produced. I mean, there's one measurement device and there's one, you know, light loop going, which produces one fringe shift. You can take that fringe shift and, you know, you can use uh, either the uh, rotational equation or the linear equation and plug in the, you know, the commensurate variables and both will predict the same fringe shift. So that's the point is that using two different uh, two different equations, they both will predict the measured fringe, me meaning that the rotational and the linear are equivalent to each other. Because the way you'd prove that they're not equivalent is if they got different predictions. But because they make the same prediction and it matches what's measured, thereby therefore they must be equivalent. And if they are equivalent, then when you go back and look at Mickelson Morley, it didn't measure any motion of Earth. There was no translational fringe produced according to them. Now they lied about it, but even still, if you take them at their word, if there was no fringe produced, knowing that we can measure it, then there must be no motion. Yeah, but in Ru Yong Wang's experiment, right? It's the path of light that's relative to the motion of the loop that makes it a relative motion. So it, you get this privileged idea of this absolute space, but in all reality, you know, it's the path of light relative to the motion of the loop. There's no uh, separate absolute space or absolute medium to reference to. If it were relative to the loop, though, you would have to use the full length of the of the gyro, but you you only use the effective length, so it's it's not relative to the whole loop. Yeah, this one sentence at the very beginning, first page, right hand column, second paragraph, it says this. He says, um, in our experiments, as in the fiber optic gyroscope, there is no relative motion between the light path and the medium, which is glass fiber or air core fiber. So the medium is the, is the fiber cable and the path of the light is through the fiber cable. So since the fiber cable and the path of the light takes through the fiber cable are in identical positions in space, there's no relative motion between them. Therefore, there should not be a fringe produced relativistically speaking, but since there is a fringe produced and it's directly proportional to the velocity, it must therefore mean that the measurement is taken with respect to, you could say either absolute space or you could say uh, ether, right? That's like being dragged against within the fiber, but you can't have ether and have a heliocentric model. It's not, the two aren't really compatible like that. Right, because the light's traveling inside the cable. It's not traveling like in the cable some of the time and then outside the cable and back in the cable so that when the cable is rotating, 
that the light's taking a different path other than the cable. The light's in the cable the whole time. So there can't be relative motion, but like there can't be a um, a relative motion between the light path and the cable. You know what's interesting about the Sagnac equation and then Wang's derivation is that the Sagnac equation, uh, when it's talking about omega, you know, it's talking about a rotation. So you could invoke an absolute space at the midpoint, you know, naturally, because everything outward from that midpoint radially will be in regards to that rotational speed. So, you know, it's obviously coming from that center point. So, you know, absolute. But when you when you just swap out the omega for V, which is just velocity, <laughs> there's no there's no implicit midpoint, you know, or anything like that to be referenced. So it's literally just with respect to absolute space, like, you know, just without saying it, though. I just thought that was interesting. I've not even thought about the midpoint argument, actually, till you say that just now. Huh. Yeah, they make the same prediction, right, in the same measurement. But one equation implies that, you know, there's a midpoint reference for the rotation. But the other one's just like, where's your midpoint, bro, if you can't invoke absolute space to assign properties and vectors to electromagnetic propagation? Dang, that's a good one. There's there's also coffee. Um, there's also the Faraday paradox. Is if you've ever heard of it, it, it proves the exact same thing. Um, except instead of using light, it uses a magnetic field, and it shows that you know you can basically pin or anchor uh, electromagnetic processes into a fixed coordinate system in three D space. Do you know about it? Have you ever heard of the Faraday induction paradox? No, that's uh, news to me. So if you take a disc magnet and a copper disc and put one on top of the other, right? Put the you know, say you put the magnet on bottom and the and the copper disc on top of it. Um, the law of induction states that if you like move uh, a conductor and a magnet with respect to each other, that a a current will be induced. Okay. So, and you can test this You can put a magnet on the table and drag a piece of metal, pa copper past it, or put a piece of copper on the table and drag a, a magnet past it. Either way, you'll produce current. But when he uses the, the disc magnet and the copper disc, the reason that that's significant is because you can spin them, right? Which is still relative motion, but the axis of symmetry, which is going through the center, there's, it creates like a little toroidal shaped uh, magnetic field. If you spin the copper disc and leave the magnet stationary, it produces a current just like you'd expect. But if you leave the copper disc stationary and you spin the magnet, it doesn't produce a current at all. You expect it has to, but it doesn't. And then if you spin both of them simultaneously, you would expect no current to be produced since there's no relative motion, but it actually produces the same current as if it was just the copper spinning. So in two different cases, it fails the predictions of relativity and creates an apparent paradox because the case of the spinning magnet against the copper or the case of the spinning copper against the magnet do not produce the same result and they should and then the rela and then both of them spinning together shouldn't produce a result but they do now the only way that you can satisfactorily explain it as well as just factually what it actually shows physically speaking is that when you spin the copper disc but not the magnet well obviously you're spinning a copper with respect to the magnetic field so it'll cut the magnetic flux lines and it'll produce current but when you spin the magnet the reason it doesn't do the same exact thing is because the magnetic field that is being produced by the magnet is not actually attached to the magnet it's not fixed to the magnet like that's the way we think of it that's the way it's taught but it can't be so because if it was it would spin with the magnet and when it spun with the magnet it would cut across the disc and produce current what's happening is the magnet's presence is creating a magnetic field but the magnetic field instead of being fixed and attached to the magnet it's fixed and attached to a fixed coordinate system in absolute space 
so that when you spin the magnet, the magnetic field is in the same fixed location, but it's not rotating with the magnet. And that's why when the magnet rotates, it doesn't uh, cut any flux lines across the copper because the magnetic field is staying stationary. So you can spin the magnet all day, it'll never produce a current because there's no change in the field. And then of course, that also perfectly explains why when you spin both of them together, it still produces a current because basically the rotation of the magnet doesn't matter. The only thing that's mattering is the rotation of the copper. So when you spin them both together, even though there's zero relative motion between them, the magnetic field itself is stationary. So the copper is just spinning through it and producing current as, as normal. But you can't, like that explanation requires absolute space. Can I just point something out real fast about this entire conversation? So Piezo, the whole foundation of this thing is based on like a delusive foundation because in the beginning you asked Coffee why he believed what he believed about the relative motion. But the if you and not to be rude or anything, but if you would have been honest, the reason why you believe that is because someone else told you that when you were younger or someone else gave you this idea. If you would have woken up today with all of your memory erased, you would have looked up in the sky and saw that it was moving and at no point would have thought, oh, I must be moving because that's like against your experience and logic. I just wanted to kind of point that out because all of these things go off really far into the weeds and though these are all great conversations and, you know, theoretical kind of sciences and stuff, but like the whole conversation was based on a delusive foundation, meaning that it's not because you, you weren't exactly honest because none of us would have come to that conclusion on our own. We would have looked up in the sky, saw the sun moving, saw the moon moving, saw the sky moving, the stars moving. We would have felt the wind on our skin and been like, whoa, dude, this thing is crazy, right? At no point would, would he have looked at the ground and been like, oh, we definitely got to be spinning. Like, it, it's a concept that I think was utilized to kind of get you to go against the wisdom of your eyes, ears, and experience. I just wanted to put point that out about this whole entire conversation. That's all. No, thanks for bringing it back. Yeah, I, I appreciate your opinion, but um, I think it's a little skewed being that, yeah, if you woke up today, you would think the world is flat, it's motionless because of your observational views, but you have the choice to collect data and interpret the, the, interpret the data the way you choose fit. So it doesn't rely on uh, exactly someone telling you. You have the choice to believe what someone tells you, but you have the choice to ask questions based on your observation and collect data and form interpretations based on the data you collected. So, yeah, you feel me? It goes either way. I think you was uh, making a lot of assumptions. Yeah, yeah, well, well I, but you I did. You just you, you just acknowledged that it, your default position was that you wake up and you would assume you're stationary, and then if you found out something else, you know, then you could choose to believe that. But like I said, you know, we're stationary until proven otherwise. Now, if that data really does prove it to you, that's one thing. But the default position is that you're stationary. And you, you just kind of stated that yourself. Well, and not to mention, we're taught these ideas at a very young age when we're not in the realm to be asking, like we will ask questions. Kids will always ask why, but you know, I remember asking how people could be upside down in Australia. Like that made no sense to me, but it was, you know, as a child and in, in a student as in a classroom, you're just told, well, that is gravity. It just works. Other people have figured it out. Trust me. I'm the authority. Right. When, and you talk, you said something there um, earlier about where our reference frame is too small of a view to be able to be able to see it. But the, the issue with that is, is that it's everyone's experience. It's not just mine. So when you're talking about data, I'm getting the data from all of humanity's experience shows that I'm not moving and that the sky is spinning. We all experience this, right? So 
I, I, I would like to point that out. It's not until later in life that I started to really be able to ask these questions. And then once I did, I saw kind of the logical fallacies in all of it. So that I'll, yeah, I'll end it there. I, I don't want to cut off what Piezo is saying because he knows a lot more than I do when it comes to the realm of science, but I'm just speaking in terms of communication on that. So. Keeping it real, Galatrax. Keeping it real. Uh, yeah, Coffee, what you think about those magnets, though? I put a video in the sidebar over there. It's like the fourth most recent comment in the room chat. It's a three-minute video. You should check it out. Yeah, I got you. I'm going to definitely check it out. I got you. I'm going to do some more research on it. I recommend you, like, the video is probably the easiest way to learn it. Like, seriously, there's not a simpler way. But, yeah, for sure. Hey, Piezo, I think that was Mr., not not Galtrax. Oh, my bad. You're right. It was Mr. <laughs> okay, just be sure, man. Yeah. <laughs> my bad. You're right. Oh, yeah. he's got, I see his picture now. Oh, he's got, you got your actual name in here. Yeah, it told me that I had to use my actual name. So that's where Mr. comes from is Michael you Ryan. Believed him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really care. It was pretty ominous. <laughs> Look, I'm the pretentious asshole that has two first names, and that's why I just go by Mr. Because Michael Ryan's a mouthful. And though I like that idea, um I I can't represent myself publicly like that. So Mr.'s just easier. I tried to change it after and it wouldn't let me. Thanks for being a good sport, Coffee Dude. Uh, I know it's like, even if we don't get anywhere, it's nice that you're like a good sport about it. Just just so you know, like this exact conversation we're having, minus a few behaviors, was had like last Friday with a gal that works at CERN. And he, uh, I mean, he like straight disconnected from the room. Uh because it's very obvious what this implies. I highly encourage you to, to seriously just look at it with an open mind and not try to force uh, like a presumption on it. Yo, didn't... No, didn't definitely. Come, it's, oh, it's, it's right. like, my bad. Go ahead, go ahead, bro. No, I was just going to say, didn't he come back to you and then say there was no contradiction? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was before he dipped out. Like he came back and said oh, there was, was no it? contradiction. Yeah, he was like trying to say something about it, like cutting the circuit or whatever. And I was like, well, why wouldn't it do it in both cases? Plus, you homie Plenum here did it on a put a everything in the entire setup on a rotating device, and all of it, literally the detector, the wires, the circuitry, the power source, the recording device, the transmitter, the magnet, and the disc were all rotating uniformly together, still produce the same current. How dare you? Hey, Coffee, you uh, you mentioned in interferometry, bro. I just want to ask you if, uh, I mean, just using your own brain, do you really think the apparatus shrunk? Or is that some bullshit? I mean... <laughs> I mean for yeah. real, dude. Like, <laughs> I mean, I could see some guy just making up some kind of excuse, right? Or like, oh, man, I can't say this, so I got to say something else. You know, or, or at gunpoint, he just gave them the answer that they wanted, you know, like, really? Yeah, I mean, personally, to me, it doesn't make sense, right? But um, my understanding of it is vague, so uh, I have to concede to that. Um, but does it sound funny as shit to me? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I could tell, you know, a new girlfriend that, oh, yeah, I just, you know, I was going so fast, it's drunk, you know. Sorry. I was in the pool. <laughs> this doesn't make any sense, man. Like it's a weird, it's a weird excuse. And uh it, it doesn't make any sense. And no one on earth experiences that. You know, like Mr. was talking about and uh, you know, we have everyone's existence to verify that, like, you know, we feel still and we reference all of the motion in regard to the earth and our stillness, you know. These are the frames we work with. The lab frame is literally the earth to measure all of the motion. You know, we can detect earthquakes on the other side of the earth from where we're at. 
because there's no motion. Uh, like everything. So anyways, man, I just want to ask, see if you're honest. I appreciate that. What's crazy about that too, is that's only half of it is that the, the, the contraption shrank, but then also time slowed down, right? Like, Oh, check out your boy. (laughs) (laughs) That's, that's what's nuts. And now I've experienced that, but only on heavy, heavy drugs. So not recommended, (laughs) but you know, like it can happen. It's just, whether it's real or not, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's still yeah, it's debatable. Just like, relative to your frame, bro. It's God tear gas lighting. <laughs> Around here, that's what we call best in slot. It's this. It was the old switcheroo times the constant. Light lights the variable. They they switch those around. That was a big trick, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Yo, uh, what's it? I just realized you're you're in here just hanging out, listening to people talk. Uh, what's going down with uh, like Bennett and Parks and stuff? Is that is that like still happening? Yep. Are you gonna have some oh, involvement? I don't know. In that? I, just, I just heard about that word of mouth. I, I don't know anything about it. Yeah, he's going to be uh, moderating it. So seven p.m. Thursday. Make sure you guys tune in. Discord link was pinned up earlier so you guys can join. There is a verification process. If you just highlight um, me, Riggs, or Galatrax, there's a little welcoming message. We'll get you verified so you don't have to deal with anything. And yeah, it'll it'll be awesome. So tomorrow, Robert Bennett and Parks are going to talk about geocentrism and heliocentrism and which one's true. What? Super looking forward to that. Super looking forward to that. What's it? You're going to mod it? Oh, I don't know. I, I missed what was just said. Just I'm talking to my wife. Just I'll, I'll just a second. Oh, okay, bro. He, he's moderating, Ella? Yeah. I mean, I doubt they're going to get into like a situation where they're going to need a moderator, but, you know, yeah, he'll be there. Well, I, I, I feel like they would try to use that, like, the just the fact if Wits is moderating it, a bunch more people are going to watch it. And then, yep, that's why we're, if that's it's why it, it's moderating it. That's exactly why. Oh, okay. Okay. That makes sense. And then, like, well, like, if he does, though, and then at any point he has to open his mouth to actually moderate, they're going to be crying, saying, oh, they're ganging up on parks or, you know, whatever. Yeah, but they cry over anything. So, cares who? Dude, does parks know what he's getting into? Like, does he know who? Bro. Yeah, bro, he's like totally toast. It's going to be embarrassing. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't understand why all these people are sleeping on Bennett, dog. Like, yeah, they have... oh, he's a, he's a monster. I love him. <laughs> like, do they have any idea that he's like one of the foundational reasons any of us even know about a lot of stuff? Guess uh... not. <laughs> <laughs> Like all these like PhDs and science guys and like even the NASA people that come in here and like other places, like they just um I think they just want to be recognized for all of their dedication. Like, you know, they see the science guy on TV and they're like, Oh, well, maybe I could be something like that, or like I could get some recognition because they live their life like off in an office, like getting fake data from NASA and shit. Like, you know, so they're they're just trying to get some recognition for all the work they put in. And like regardless of whether they're going to win or not, like if they can get some clout just by like showing up to a thing that everyone's going to be, you know, caring about, um, why not? Yeah. I, I mean, dude, think about it. Like we, there's stuff that we just heard of. We didn't even hear about it until a few months ago. And Bennett's been like giving presentations on it for years already. Like he's been like writing books and doing all this stuff for you. Just like no one, there's not that many people that's been in this space, right? Like this section of the FE slash geocentrism space, right? It was like entirely filled up by, you know, academics that didn't have any type of online presence. And I, I, I'm pretty sure it was just that documentary that it was the reason I think Alan even found him in the first place. And then 
come to find out, this dude was already like like teaching people about stuff that like we didn't even know was a thing at all. So, yeah, for the past 185 years, too. Yeah, man's like 80 something years old. 84. Yeah, sorry, I'm I'm back. But um yeah, I never even checked that Telegram message about that idea. But what do you think about me uh, modding and streaming it? Oh, absolutely, oh, dude. Just... More people watching it, the better. Please. I feel yeah. like you don't really have to moderate that conversation that much. They're both going to be very respectful and professional, probably. Yeah, it's just your presence, though, will draw in more people to watch it, though. So feel free to do no, that. It makes... Okay, cool. Yeah, Because it makes more sense for me to stream it if I'm like, quote unquote modding it that's why i suggested it i didn't want to like hijack anything right right no i totally get it but yeah it makes makes sense and if for he, the record piso um no he's not 80 something he's 93 94 i think well, that was his birthday that just went by yeah i was wrong he yeah. corrected me the other day in discord he said he's 84 oh really yeah yeah i thought he said that number that's no, weird. I could have sworn yeah. he said 93 huh. or something or whatever, you know. Yeah, uh, I thought I was, he did. I was wrong. He must have been messing with us. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a great idea with it, but if you open your mouth, I mean, you don't care that people are going to cry, but I'm just saying, like, if you even in, involve yourself whatsoever in actually having to moderate, they're going to automatically be trying to, like, say that you're ganging up on parks or et cetera, et cetera. Nah, I'm a super good moderator, bro. Well, I, I trust you would be, but it doesn't matter. Like, the facts don't matter, obviously. Oh, I don't... Oh, I'm off now. I don't care what gay people... I think Witsit would moderate fairly. Yeah, like, I will. And I, I don't foresee there being any real issue there, you know? I mean, actually, is it, you know... Good moderation is so rare nowadays that I don't think people even know what a good moderator is actually supposed to do. Um, I don't foresee me having to do much of it, but moderators are actually supposed to be pretty involved, like, by by definition. Like, did you guys know that? Like, moderators can go as far as to point out fallacious reasoning. They can go as far as... Uh, facilitating evidence requests they can go as far as um pointing out uh like obfuscations or circular reasoning because they're the job description is to keep the conversation coherent and productive and on a uh, point that's actually what a moderator does it just also like, you, you almost never see it anymore also remember to bring your ad homo horn Going to need one of those, maybe. You never know. Oh, I need to add hum a horn. I don't see any ad horns oh, happening. But... Watch me be totally wrong, and they, in like 20 minutes in, they start just going at each other's just throat. Just savage kiss <laughs> to the wind. <laughs> ben ben is just knows. like slicing this dude up with, with yeah. insult or something. Bennett knows a lot about debate, though. Like, he came in and he, what did he, he was doing a debate review, and he discussed it very well so i don't think you'll get any any guff from bennett but well uh, yeah i don't think you will with parks either right like when parks comes on my show um he doesn't really interrupt much i mean there were a couple moments that he was getting uncomfortable and, and fidgety and started interrupting like i think like halfway through but it's just sort of you know and then then he just melted and he held up a book and told me that was space but <laughs> What? Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah, dude. I, I, that sounds I, crazy, dude. I said, Your well, you know, on his, face, on his face, oh, relativity goodness. is inadmissible because it's a reification fallacy and it attributes physical properties to concepts, and one of them being space, which is actually a privation. And he's like, no, space isn't just a concept. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is, though. And then I asked, I asked him what it was. And he said, like, length, width, or breadth, or whatever. I'm like, so math. So it's a description. of It's a concept. He so ends funny. up holding up a book. He's like, no, 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 you don't get it. He held up a book, and he said, this book is space. And I'm like, what? I'm like, no, that's that book is in space, right? 
and he, he was like, I was like embarrassed for him. So it was pretty bad. To your point about the debate platform stuff as well, like modern day debates and that, like they bank on people, you know, that's how they're hoping that people are fallacious and that it gets uh, dramatic because then, you know, they're thinking that it's more entertaining for the watchers to, you know, for the viewers, for people to have meltdowns and do that kind of stuff, which they may not be wrong, but when it comes to, truth you know that doesn't really work well i thought about starting a debate show called clash of wits and then i just thought about what all that would entail for a second and do it i decided not to do it yeah maybe yeah it's a major workload for sure yeah you do it like once a month or something Like, what was that I think, young I think guy Jaren's like weeks in the right direction, but you know, and then I try to think of a creative way of like run it like a court and like I'm the judge, there's the prosecution and the defense. Whoever's taking the affirmative is the prosecution, basically. You can make objections and as opposed to like the typical objections, you know, which are like hearsay, it's like fallacies. And you know how the judge has to rule on whether or not the objection is sufficient. It's like sustained or not sustained or whatever it's the same thing but you're ruling on whether or not the accusation of the fallacy was correct and just like in court if the state does something wrong but the defense doesn't object they get away with it and i think that that's a that's actually what court is it's just it's efficient and professional debate literally you know so you know, I think um, I think Galatrax actually has uh, a lot of potential to be a moderator, uh, moderator of a debate. Um, if he like studies up on his uh, his fallacies, I think he's got like that forward kind of style that he could manage like a constructive debate. Well, that's another thing that would be super cool is if I did do it, I would want to like build it. I'd feel bad because it would be like competition to to other places that have been pretty loyal to me, like even MDD, despite how bad stuff has gone there. But I think it would be cool to create like an all-star team of moderators. So you know how like James has his moderators? And, uh, yeah, I wouldn't call them all-stars, but like to just have like an all-star team of, of moderators. Like Mindshock would be on there. And like for it just to be like an exceptional debate platform would be cool um, i put one vote in for galatrax no I'm, i i think he also w w has the potential to be very good at it and then if you could get we're losing you there man uh my audio yeah it sounds like you're drifting away yeah you're mic. roboting for a sec oh uh, am i back yep i can hear you yeah um I think it has potential, like, if it grew, to turn into, like, in-person debates. I think that would be super cool. So, I'm considering it. I just know it's a lot, you know. So, it would actually have to make money for me to be able to do that. Yeah, Wits, you made, like, a Brody's. <laughs> Time is precious, bro. I feel you, man. Well, yeah, I literally have to... I literally have to make money with anything that's taking a lot of time nowadays. I got babies and expenses just popping up everywhere. You know? Oh, yeah, you're breaking up some more. It's coming up. It's you, Stone. I heard, I heard all, of, all of it, yeah. I heard everything you said. Uh, okay, it's me then. Fair enough. Oh, and I was just so happy Clubhouse doesn't have glitches. Does Clubhouse ever glitch like that? No, don't speak too soon with it. It definitely does. Sometimes the app gets super glitchy and you have to like close out. So don't jinx yourself. Oh, man. It is still much smoother you know than though. You can tell that space Dude, is just hijacked. Dude, the spatial audio this. is so nice. Yep. It's literally so nice. It's just hijacked Clubhouse. Like that's literally what it did. I would say this, this crashes, I would say... Um, depending on how much RAM your device has. I think when it starts to pop and glitch, and like as far as audio, just 
reset your RAM or just close programs and come back. It doesn't yeah, have a whole lot fix. of like, yeah, it doesn't have a whole lot of background running uh, code. It's light, L-I-T-E. Uh, well, X just glitches because uh, it's Wednesday or whatever, you know. The day that ends in Y. Yeah. Yo, uh, how much does it cost these days to get, um, like, uh, reach boosted through through Google for your, you know, like, Google actually sells, like, reach for your content, right? Like, yeah, SEO you packages? Yeah, you soul. You're talking about, no, like, SEO yeah, packages? Kind of like SEO, but not, not really SEO, like, um, I mean, I mean, some of it is, yeah, because they'll put ads and stuff, but you know how you always get, like, uh like random yet somehow targeted ads, like if they fingerprint your browser or your device or yeah, you're logged into an account or whatever, anywhere you go on a, on a site, because everybody uses Google ads, like Google is the number one ad platform. You can get your content boosted if you just like, it's like basically paying for advertising. But I've always wondered if that would have, be like, I don't know, because I don't know how much it costs. I've always wondered if that would be like a net positive return it's like giving money to the devil to promote your content. Well, yeah, you asked how much it costs, like your soul. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. One soul, please, at the checkout. Yeah. Conveniently, it's not yours to sell, so you can always get it back. You're and just it's a self-checkout, too. Ooh, you could take a loan out on it and foreclose. <laughs> nice yeah like you like you can lease your soul but it's actually not yours like well you're leasing it so then you sublease it but then the trick <laughs> is to tell everyone that you can really sell it so i think they can't get it back you know like people think that like famous people irreparably sold their soul i totally don't think that's a thing i think you can get it back well i mean I, we don't have control. We don't have power over our own spirits, right? I mean, that's what uh, the word of Yahweh says. Yep, it says he just gave us a. He just let us use it for a bit. Which is actually a trip because, like, that's that has to be the case, like, in terms of physics. So, dun dun dun. Yeah, did you guys hear how I had the entire FED panel melt down because uh, I asked them what's in between air molecules? Is it something or nothing? Math is in between yeah, molecules, said, actually. I said, what's in between the air molecules? And he said, space. I said, what is space? He said, link, width, breadth. I said, but those are just those are just mathematical descriptions. Like what what's between the molecules? Space. I'm like, oh, so math is in between the air molecules. And then I got muted. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait till uh JT's done with the edit. Boston been coming in hot with those lately. I think Dang. that's the best one, man. I think the the best part of that whole entire interaction was the first like fifteen seconds. All downhill from there. Well, yeah, just funny like that quickly with literally within fifteen seconds, QB realized I had already checkmated him, and so he muted. All me. right, you're done. You're done. Yeah. Here's the mute. And then they all went on this big monologue about how I'm such a liar that I straw man them. And it's like, no, length, width, and breadth are mathematical descriptions. That's not a straw man. You know what I'm saying? You're just retarded. Yeah, where do you put the length? What can I pour it into? Can I, can I hold it? How big does my bag need to be? Yeah, and dude, so it's so funny because the very group that loves to dismiss and bottleneck conversations by saying, there's no vacuum in nature are now trying to invoke an idealized vacuum of emptiness and nothing. How hilarious. <laughs> and that's why I crafted that argument. It's such a layered trap, but they're so gay and disingenuous that the brilliance of the trap never gets to be seen 
because they stop it so fast, you know. They stop it in its tracks, but you get what I'm saying? Like, if you bring up anything, you try to bring up, you like, okay, look, so we're going to create a vacuum chamber. Where's a vacuum in nature? It's like, okay, buddy, will you put your helmet on and sit aside, please? You can never have the conversation because they always say stuff like that. And it's, it's like, ironic because that's one of their number one things they say. But when I start asking this question, they all want to invoke an idealized vacuum, which actually doesn't exist. And emptiness doesn't exist, just like space doesn't exist because... Their conceptual privations, like the very idea of them depend upon the existence of something else. They're defined as the absence of something else. I, mean, I think we all get this. This is basic stuff, but it's wild. I got flat earthers making the relativistic reification fallacy by reifying space. It's like you're so desperate or you're so committed to making it's like to being opposed to wits it that you're turning into globers. <laughs> Well, that's not the only time, too. Yeah. If you ask them what light is, they won't acknowledge it as a real wave. They'll say it's a probability wave that collapses upon knowing it. So yep. they use that mainstream view, too. So it's interesting. Yeah, they say it's just, it's just a wave function, and it's just a mathematical description. And then I offer them a $20,000 bet that that isn't true and that we can actually prove that light moves in a transverse movement and is waving because we actually have highly sensitive sensors. And in fact, depending on what type of laser you use to cut into metal, you can actually microscopically examine the cut into the metal and you can see the actual wave function even in the uh, imprint the of pattern, the laser. Right? Yeah. It's a sinusoidal pattern? Yeah, man. Like, and, and there are like different... Um, observations that have been set up where literally there are little like super precise sensors that detect the motion of the light and so it's like if you envisioned two parallel rows of sensors and the light goes through it it like hits the top row and then the bottom row then the top row then the bottom row it's not just a mathematical description it's like what light does buddy are these the same people who like if you go in there and try to reference uh like an experiment um, they'll ask you like, oh, well, how did you measure it? And you'll say, well, with the measure, oh, you used a device? Oh, what was the, I need a natural phenomenon. I don't need an artificial, I need a natural phenomenon. Is this, are they the ones that do that? Yeah, but I also trap them with that as well. So, because <laughs> um, they tried to dismiss the Van de Graaff generator one because I, just to trigger them, I pointed out that was a scientific experiment. And so they're like, oh, you triggered my trap card. But ironically, I'm trapping them. And so they're like, oh, that's a, where do we see Van de Graaff generators in nature? I'm like, no, the naturally occurring observable <laughs> phenomenon is that objects go up and or down. We're going to manipulate the independent variable, which is the presumed cause, which is specifically the electric field, the interaction with the electric field. And you can use a man-made instrument to do the manipulation, in fact, Please try to name for me any experiment in the world where you manipulate the independent variable without a man-made uh, instrument. And then they just start double speaking, say, well, no, you can use man-made instruments in the experiment, but you have to have a naturally occurring observable phenomenon. I'm like, okay, cool. So thank you for conceding that this is a scientific experiment. You know, and they just call me a bunch of names and I don't know. It's just funny. Like it's actually kind of a wasted waste of time and energy it, it, it just elucidating for some people may be right to hear it kind of broken down and i don't know i go back and forth i brought up i brought up uh Fizeau and light moving through water and having a proportional velocity uh, some component one day and they were like what's the natural phenomenon and i was like light passing through water like well how do you measure it like with a I mean, I don't know, just a measuring, a measuring device. Like to, to say that it's not an asking for a natural phenomenon, sounding that dumb when being told light and water and then trying to invalidate it because a measurement device was used to quantify it. I mean, that has got to be the dumbest argument. Like that's got to be on like the yeah. top 10 dumbest arguments of all time. Yeah, and I don't know why I'm giving um, you guys these tips because these people are retards that will never let you speak. But the other the other trap is, um, like you're saying, where they're like, anytime you bring anything up, they'll say, what's the naturally occurring observable phenomenon? That's not a real scientific experiment. That's not science. And they'll dismiss it. 
And then I point out, they'll say, we only discuss real science here. And I'm like, oh, I thought this was called flat earth debate because flat earth is a measurement question and measurement isn't science. So you can't even claim to verify or prove that the earth is flat or falsify the globe unless you invoke something outside of science, specifically measurement. And that's why you guys redundantly talk about horizontal baselines all day, every day. So what do you mean you can you just get to pick and choose what measurements we're allowed to talk about? And that's specifically why I said, okay, I'm not going to call Mickelson Morley experiment a scientific experiment. It's a measurement. A measurement isn't science, but measurement is still important and can falsify different claims, such as the Earth is moving. And so you can't really dismiss it because it's allegedly pseudoscience, because that's which. I know I'm talking fast, but I'm kind of tired. But that's pseudoscience is when something falsely claims to be science. And of course, I'm not claiming that this is science. I'm claiming it's a measurement. So, and like they just literally don't know what to do because that's un like, how do you rebut that? You know what I'm saying? Like you can't rebut that. It's just it's just like objective stuff. And they're like, damn, I've been calling this a parlor trick in pseudoscience for five years. Our only option is to mute him. Pretend he didn't pretend he didn't say that and then come up with a new version of what he said and then just lie Isn't about that it. kind of psychotic when people do stuff like that? Yeah, literally, yeah. Yeah, it definitely is, and it definitely deters people like me from listening to what they have to say after that. A lot of people actually. But Dude. shit, dude, I'm I'm glad I experienced it. I'm s i am could not believe that that's where you <laughs> came from, basically when I learned that the other day. Like you came from there, like what? I know, that's why I do it sometimes. Cause, Listen, cause the first server I... Soul. Yeah, the first server I found was 24-7 because it was basically like a silent flat earther for like three years just looking at Eric Dubay videos and Dave Murphy videos. And Eric Dubay had like this podcast interview format recently and he had uh, Flat Lloyd Wright, uh, Chris V on, who's like... Uh, uh, one of the moderators at 24-7 and they basically were like talking like a disc and I was like Fuck. You're, rob- you're both robot bro yeah you're in the matrix right hey, now it's not me it's just him good fuck dude alright <laughs> nah he's in the belly of the beast man dude they they did that stuff to Alan the other night yes, because it wasn't those people it was uh it was a uh, gosh, I can science that was doing it, bro. Like, took like it was so disgusting. I and mean, I'm sure Wits has been dealing with this for a long time, so I was, he's probably like, yes, it's part of the course, dude. Alan made a video explaining why like relative simultaneity was wrong. Goes through the logic, and he's like, oh, just so you know, I'm not just making this up as if I have my own interpretation of your theory. Let me pull up on the screen. A highlighted copy straight out of the book that Einstein was quoting or was quoted in. Oh, look, Einstein says it right here, bro. They literally took his video, like play his audio of that clip. And then right when he brings up the uh, the Einstein book to quote Einstein, pa- quickly, like super hastily pauses it right there. And you can literally see the picture of, Einstein, of like Einstein, like uh, his quote in the background. Like the the frame got captured because they weren't fast enough, and then go like straw man's Allen, and then never and then skips over that portion and then like re- continues playing uh, Allen's audio like after the Einstein clips over. So they literally knew like because they watched it first, went to record a video about it, and when it got to the part where he's literally quoting Einstein and it directly disproves everything they're saying straight from the mouth of the wizard that invented it all, they cut it out and won't let the audience hear it. It's like, why yeah, would you do so that? Gross. Yeah, why would you do that unless you know that you're wrong? And if you do know that you're wrong and you're pretending that you're right and everyone else is stupid and lying, what do you seek to gain from doing that? They think unless they justify the means because they believe that their conclusion is correct. And so anything that they do to defeat the other side is justifiable. Yo, that's exactly true, man. Totally forgot about that. I was asking him about that one time, you know, back in the day about the philosophy on that for lying. And he was like, well, you know, the ends justify the means. I was like, what? Because they they think they're correct. And it's just like, whatever they have to do is, you know, it's okay. 
Totally forgot about that until yeah, you just said they, it. I think they have such a twisted view of it that they think it's like virtuous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, who cares about bombing a hundred thousand plus civilians and destroying Dresden completely and wiping it off the map, even though it wasn't involved in the war at all? Just all innocent civilians completely massacred for no reason. Oh, but it just—it's completely justified and even virtuous because nobody else will want to have to go to war with us. So, well, by the way, I don't think this actually applies to all of them. This is just like a a good faith yield right like i think some of them are just disgusting and not that they necessarily think that they're wrong but they just like know they can get away with being egregiously dishonest because as long as the straw man is saying flat earthers are stupid and wrong about something that there's a huge group of people that will applaud it and never fact check it and so they intentionally use that just to pretend they're right about stuff because even if it's like illusory if it's like fake being right <laughs> they still get to experience you know all these people pretending that they're right and amping them up and so there's like this darker sadistic narcissistic uh aspect of it which i think is probably like more oftentimes the case or it, it may kind of be like a combination of the two things but Anyway. Well, the sad thing is that's the best they can do. I mean, what, what do they have to work with? They can't actually be right. You know, <laughs> it sucks. Well, you could be a glober and you could say, but yeah, relativity does seem paradoxical and has seemingly been falsified. And um, look, there are some other theories over here that may cut it. I don't know. But uh, for me, the preponderance of evidence makes me think that the earth is still a tilted, wobbling, spinning cartoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the globy friends will just be loving that <laughs> hey real quick a couple minutes ago i just noticed that a couple people in here have the most incredible ether cosmology avatars i've ever seen <laughs> the galaxy yeah, and the afro again. is on point dude <laughs> that is shout awesome shout out to Corey. He's Bro, our, um, shout out to Corey olis right there he's one of our mods and admins aka val um he literally makes these awesome PTRs, but yeah, that's why we were like repping it, like for sure. You know what I gotta do? I gotta pay. Can I? Can I pay for one? Can I get? Oh one? no! I'm yeah. sure if you just like at him in the chat, he'll be more than happy to make you one. Yeah, I'm gonna need one of those for a bear, a penguin, and a turtle <laughs> for the boys. And a, and, a, and, a, and a crystal wizard. <laughs> and I an think Witsit missed it earlier, but he he made one. He added up for a little bit. It was like when you and Bert were going back and forth. He made a you and Bert like uh, PTR. It was quite funny. Yeah, I totally missed it. But the ether, the ether ones are fire. We also have a studio album. We created our own songs with AI, so everybody up in here has their own song, including Coffee, our resident Clover. Nice. We really got to get some marks going, guys. Hats, t-shirts. Um, hats and t-shirts down. <laughs> hey, there. I, I'll create the print files, bro. I used to do printing. I don't know if you can hear me, guys, or hear me now. It, cat, cat, cat boss said she had a hookup on some quality um shirts that she can get for some kind of discount right cat are you still here yeah beasticles we can hear you but you sound like you're like abandoned in some like desert of depravity or something dude i will move out of vegas one day okay i promise <laughs> <laughs> oh, Beasticles, um, Flat Earth Gang is um, planning to do um, its first in-person meetup actually in Las Vegas, spring of Las Vegas. So, um, yeah, probably around April or so. Um, you know, most of us haven't met each other in person, especially as a group. So we're like planning to do a little meetup there. So if you're still there by spring 2025, we'll definitely hit you up. Yeah, I'm down. Oh, yeah. I'll show you guys what's what. Didn't you say someone else was actually from Vegas, too? Flat so Earth that's King. one of our resident Globers. Um, and we actually found out a few months ago he used to work for BlackRock. Ding, dun, dun. Um, but, yeah, he hasn't he didn't come through tonight. I was trying to ping him in, but um, he doesn't want the smoke. That's funny. You know, BlackRock owns my apartments. It's also funny. 
<laughs> they own a hell of shit. Of, of course they do. They own like 70 something per, well, them in conjunction with the other two big ones own like 70 something percent of all the wealth in the world, bro. Yeah, it's like, yeah, stay street. Anyway, I gotta go back to work in like five minutes, but it's been a pleasure listening in. Fucking Mordwan, dude. That dude needs a reality <laughs> check, dude. He needs to pay you his, his what's due. He's yeah, got one more. 1777. He, he's legit like, uh, uh, like bipolar and all that other stuff though like you just gotta remember like he's actually like so you know well, he came in here trying to still pretend that he doesn't owe me money basically that was the implication so I'm like okay you want a 5 exit like shut up you know you lost so did he really like follow you in here just to like you know say what he needed to say or felt like he needed to say yes and Omni yeah, I don't even that know how he do. knew I was in here well, if it was being streamed. Uh, I'm live, and uh, I don't think we're still live anymore, right, guys? Correct. All right, as you will. Dude, oh, that reminds me. So y'all know how they have the freaking, like, they have those stupid sayings like, oh, the second law of flurf, the third law, like, they, they have all these, like, things that they try to say about, like. You yeah, know, those are tunes laws. Okay, okay. Well, any, I didn't know that, but. <laughs> That makes it even more ironic, I guess. Um, we've recently discovered a, a law of, actually, a law of anti-FE, and I have yet, like, I didn't realize it until the trend line became just, like, one solid line with with not a single data point missing. Uh, every single, like, anti-flat earther, like, any of anybody that's actually an anti-FE person, they are always, it as it turns out, either uh they're r- riddled either with psychopathy or degeneracy or maybe both but it's always at least one of the two well coffee is still here so maybe we could put this back onto the rails a bit um he was mentioning uh, a while back about that he's he's reliant upon data about empirical data about earth and i wanted to give him some if you're still here coffee if you got time for that Son, my man, I'm always here for it, my brother. Rockin'. Okay, well, let me uh, introduce you to um, a video I produced on BitChute. I'm just throwing the, the tag right into the chat right there. And is there any way for me to post an image on this platform? You could post a link to it, but not the image like you would on Twitter where, you, uh, where other people could see it. They'd have to follow the okay, link. Okay, well, in, in lieu of that, uh, go ahead and load that bit you tag there. And don't bother watching the whole video. It's 2 minutes and 20 seconds, so it's it's a real quick point. But instead, go right near the end of the video, like to 2 minutes and 14 seconds. It's sort of like the punchline of the video coffee. Let me Let me know when you're looking at that graph right there, and I'll explain it to you. Stone, what we normally do, we just change our PTR if you want to show an image. What does that mean? Um, So you see, like, uh, everybody's, like, I guess, profile picture. If yeah. you click on it, if you click on it, you could... Uh, oh, I just then... update my own profile picture and you can look at that, you mean? Yes. Okay, this is less arduous. Just, by all means, just load up that video right there. Let me know when you're looking at 214 in the, in the video. Yeah, and just to add, um, um, Man of Stone or the yeah. or whatever. Um, sometimes we do the PTR, like the profile pictures, but if it is something a little bit more detailed, it won't. Like we can't. There's no way to like zoom it, so it's probably yeah, it's better that you drop the link. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Good. All right. So, are you there, Coffee? Are you are you looking at that image there? Yeah, and after that, let me know if you watched that video earlier. I'm going to bounce out of here, Coffee. But next time I pass through, maybe you can talk to me about it. Yeah, son, I just uh, I got the uh, video on it now. And uh, Pizzo, definitely, I'm going to check out that video, uh, and I'm going to get back to you because I was uh, briefly doing some research on it. I definitely got some pushback. But next time you pull uh, through, I got you. All right, bro. Peace, everybody. Y'all have a good night. Hey, you too, man. Later, Pizzo. Bye. Later, yes, bro. sir. Thanks for stopping by, bro. God bless you guys. Follow Jesus.
Oh, uh, he's on a monograph. All right. Okay, so you can see that it says Noam and Murambio. Those are the maximum and minimum temperatures for two locations on Earth. And they are at the same degree of latitude north and south. And what I did with the brown curve is that I offset it six months because it's summer on one side and the winter on the other side and vice versa, the other side of the, of the year. You know what I mean? So that we're looking at the same summertime curve, so to speak, in the center of the graph for each. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, perfect. Okay, cool. So what we're actually seeing here are the maximum and minimum daily temperatures all the way through those summer months. And with Nome, Alaska, you're looking at minimums of, you know, about seven or eight degrees through the July point, but it gets up to 14 degrees Celsius in the day in July in Nome, Alaska. And at the same latitude to the south, it it doesn't get anywhere near that warm ever. You know what I mean? That I mean, with the anomalies accepted, when we're looking at the daily averages for, you know, for 11 to 15 years worth of data, these are the averages for the climate for those two locations at the same latitude north and south. So this is something where there is absolute non-symmetrical empirical data about the climate that is supposed to be symmetrical according to the heliocentric model. This is the kind of thing that I like to point out to people like yourself who claim to want to rely solely on empirical data, but don't see any. And this is this is one where I would just quickly point my finger and say, okay, what do you think of that? That's uh that's actually good. Uh that that's some good evidence on your side, bro, bro, I'm not gonna lie, because Thank it you. should be symmetrical. But um what I would think uh, just off the top is that there's some type of conditions, uh, preferably in the south, that are keeping it from uh, getting that warm. Um, I would have to do some further research, but um, yeah, off the top, that's that'll be my idea. Okay, so you know that when it comes to the ruling influence over over like the environment. What does the land look like? What grows there? What lives there? It's purely dependent on how much sunlight it gets, right? Right. Okay. So when you think up north, near the North Pole, that there's all these insects, all of this flora, there's green growing up there all over the place. There's fauna. There are birds, polar bears, you know what I mean? Sea lions turtles, everything else, you see it up there. You know what I mean? But when you look down south, all you see is a sheet of fucking ice and some penguins. I'm, I, I'm just wondering how in touch you are with that fact. Yeah, that's why I said it's, a, <laughs> it's some good fucking evidence on your side. But uh, I will have to do some research to see the conditions around it. Right to to know to to at least know a, a few more variables to uh, check it off because you know all I know is what I you know the vague information that I know off the top uh, right now. Okay, well then I would invite you to do that for sure. <clears throat> Take a really good look <clears throat> at the climatology, <clears throat> excuse me, and the things that contribute to an environment and what shapes it. You know what I mean? Why do things look the way they look? Why do things live where they do and they don't where they don't? Why do trees grow where they do and they don't where they don't? What are those influences? I'd be If you want to PM me sometime, I'd be glad to list them off for you because I've taken a fair bit of climatology, hydrology, geophysics, and all that stuff long ago. And for me, this one is a no-brainer, which is why the video is only two minutes and 20 seconds. <laughs> And uh, yes, by all means, take a really good look and uh, let us know what you find. Yeah, I'm about to take a second now and watch the video in totality, so I'll probably be back up in like two minutes.
sounds good to me. And Mana Stone, did I capture it um, directly, like in my PTR? If you just like swipe down to refresh the page, I changed my profile picture so that people that maybe didn't want to click in the link or whatever could just kind of have like a quick, um, a quick snapshot of it. Oh, you want me to upload that? I suppose. No, I could. no, no. I did. No, I did it. I just wanted to make. Oh, sure you did. Yeah, you did. Okay. Excellent. Okay, Thank awesome. you. Thank you. No, that's great. By all means. But yes, I know what you mean about how it's very low res. I think that's far easier, or I guess more effective to just load the bit shoot length. But if anybody's listening to this and can't see the chat or see the link, the way to find this is to just head over to bit shoot and in the search field, enter something as simple as man of stone, all one word, and climate. And it's the only video that comes up in the result. Okay, that's the fastest way to find it. And it's just about coming up on three years old as a video. It's got a pretty good ratio too. I will say that about Bitchu that it's very precise. So like you can't even like mess up a title or else, you know, your search results will yield like kind of like indifferent. So like how you worded it, like just man of steel, one word, and it's going to be the one video that's exactly, you're going to get that exact result. That's stone, by the way. But yes, you're quite right. They are very non-fuzzy. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Yeah, it's pretty late here too. Almost three. So yeah, guys, I I figured I'd lay that down just before I head out because it's you know like a Wednesday night. I think I better call it here. I'm almost hitting three a.m. my time here. Nice. I'm sure a lot of us will be over there tomorrow um, for um, I guess the debate discussion um, that Wits is going to be moderating. Oh, yeah, that should be very hot. Right on, gang. Good first trip through. Good to, to meet y'all. And, uh, yeah, maybe we'll, uh, we'll be back soon. Maybe even Saturday night. Who knows? For Flatterday Night Live. <laughs> Live from not New York. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, you betcha. My pleasure. We'll catch you all later, guys. Later, Later Stone. Later, Stone. Have a good night, my guy. <laughs>